month episode of Basic Black. Then, a conversation on the future of civil rights, hosted by me, Soraya Wintersmith. Join us at 11 for NAACP convention coverage, live streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include the Rockefeller Foundation, making opportunity universal and sustainable for over 100 years. And the Public Welfare Foundation, committed to advancing transformative youth and criminal justice reforms. Eastern Brady, I am Marjorie Egan. You are listening to Boston Public Radio. We are broadcasting live from the 114th NAACP National Convention at the Boston Convention and Exhibit Center inside the Hub. We are also streaming on youtube.com slash GBH News and broadcasting on 89.7 GBH FM. Good morning, Jim. Hi there, Marjorie. We've been talking a long time about being here, have we I know. Not? I am very, very excited about this, and I'm very excited to have the NAACP Convention back in Boston after all these years. 40 years. I feel the same way. You know, the last time the National NAACP Convention was here in Boston was 1982. One editorial board in the city advised attendees to avoid visiting Charlestown, the North End, and South Boston. Today, we are broadcasting from South Boston. The country and the city are changed in some ways, but many of the same perceptions and issues sadly and strikingly remain the same. All throughout the show today, you'll hear from local and national leaders, the current mayor and a former mayor who worked to bring the historic convention back to Boston after more than 40 years with our first guest in a minute, to the enterprising leaders in business, government, working to build the next generation of civil rights advocates and journalists with decades of experience reporting on the city, race, and its complex and complicated history, comparing what Boston was like during that convention in 82 and what it's like today. GBH News will also bring you a little bit later two special broadcasts from our booth right here, right after we go off the air, Basic Black and a special discussion on reparations. For the full show today, we want you as part of the conversation. Here and there, we will take your calls. We will always be looking for your texts at 877-301. 8970. In a couple of minutes, we're going to be joined by the guy who's on the National Board of Directors, a weekly guest on our show, who is pretty instrumental, I should say. That's a bit of an understatement in bringing the convention here. You he's know, about, once it, he's about 30 feet away from us. Are right you seeing him right now? He's here he comes. In on the, on the WGBH uh, booth. Let me here. tell you, you were out of town last night, Marjorie. I was lucky enough because I begged him for an invitation to go to his <laughs> VIP welcoming party. And it was a wild affair, I should say. Congratulations on the party, on the convention, and it's great to see you, Michael Curry. Thank you. I was glad to have you there. It was an amazing uh, opening uh, reception, and uh, glad to be here this morning. We're thrilled to have you. Jim was talking an awful lot about the food. I thought it was very embarrassing <laughs> that he was making such a big deal about the food. That's but who that's I am, who he is. Marjorie. That's who he is. So, Michael Carr, we taught you quite a bit and learned that you are a, a student of, of history uh, and certainly know a, a lot about the history of Boston. 1982 was the last time the NAACP convention uh, was here. And as Jim just said, and as everybody has said, it was a different time in Boston then. Yeah, so uh, different time um, issues are very similar, right? If we got together in 1982 and you were talking about mass incarceration or criminal justice issues or housing or education equity or affirmative action uh, or, uh, you know, uh, opportunity gaps, um, that was true in the, then and is true now. Um, the gaps are still the same. Women, uh, black women still die at higher rates in, in giving birth uh, then and now. Uh, so I, while I think the city's different, right, we've progressed uh, from that time period, the data speaks for itself. We still have a lot of the same challenges. And I always tell people we, we tend to be the best of the worst in Massachusetts. Um, we suck, but there are a whole bunch of places that suck more. Um, Beautifully put, Michael. But we shouldn't celebrate that because that's, that's about life and death. That's about uh, uh, lack of wealth. That's about lack of opportunity. So, uh, yeah, we celebrate that we're better than we were in 1982, but we're not where we need to be. Well, you know, you grew up in Boston, and I was reading in preparation for coming here today some of the where we were in 1982, and I remembered um, I was a young reporter at the Herald uh, when William Atkinson was a young black Tom, man, Tom 30-year-old black man, chased down the Savin Hill. Oh, William, yep. 
tracks by a group of white kids and basically beaten to death. And I remember going to his home and talking to his mother, and it was almost beyond belief. And that kind of thing was not that unusual in Boston then. Yeah. And there's many stories, right? You know, I used to look at this history around police use of force, and there were these stories uh, in history, 70s, 80s, where officers would say, because they didn't feel like chasing you, they'd shoot you. Uh, But you can only do that in Roxbury. (laughs) You couldn't do that in West Roxbury, and you couldn't do that in Newton. But in in Roxbury, because there wasn't a respect for black lives in most of this country's history, and I would argue uh, today, um, you could have law enforcement say, hey, you know, I, I, I shot him because I didn't think he would stop. Um, and that's history. That's documented history. Yep. Boston Globe yep. article from, um, I think, the 1970s. Um, and then there's Levi Hart, uh, Joe Feaster, Attorney Feaster uh, was around, and I think president during that time, that Levi Hart case. So there's a lot of stories in history. We like to, we like to be uh, forgetful in, in Boston. We don't like to think about the past because it makes us not feel good. But the, the problem with that is if you don't understand the past and you have no understanding of where we are and why we're where we are. We're talking to Michael Curry on the national board of the NAACP, and I think he's too modest to say we're not for, I guess, a text between him and a guest we're going to have in about 30 minutes, uh, former Mayor Walsh. This convention would not be in Boston. He's smiling, so I think it's true. You know, you've made clear to us on our show, uh, Michael, in the last few months, while this is a gathering of thousands of local and national advocates who care about uh, racial justice, civil rights, that sort of thing, it's also a business meeting, and you're sort of in charge of the business of the meeting as head of the policy committee what kinds of decisions is this convention going to make in the next few days i don't know what kinds of issues well one is uh, we are constitutionally mandated so it's article 9 i believe that requires us to meet annually and to take up policy issues at this annual convention so receptions the gatherings the parties are great um, but the main purpose is, is for us to elect delegates on a local level cities and towns 22 units across this country, college chapters, uh, youth units, to elect voting delegates, have them come to one major city uh, each year, and they come and they present resolutions throughout the year. They're vetted by one of the committees that I serve on resolutions, or they come to my committee, which I chair advocacy and policy. If uh, if they pass the test, meaning that they are constitutionally uh, appropriate, then they're uh, debated, discussed, and presented at this meeting. So it's affirmative action, it's health care, it's housing, it's education, it's criminal justice issues. So a wide range of issues that we'll take up. And you'll see folks as you witness this process, uh, they'll put the amendment up on the screen. Folks will uh, debate it like you would in a legislative body and they'll put their cards up if they want to vote for it. It's a beautiful process to watch. It's a democratic process to watch. And it is moms and pops and young people from across the country um, advancing that policy. It's one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen in all my years doing this. Now, uh, this convention, if it's successful, will not only change the city in some ways, but change perception of Boston by your colleagues from across the country. We've discussed with you uh, so many times the poll from 2017 that was in the Globe among African Americans across the country. How welcoming are these eight major American cities, the people of color? Unfortunately, number one least welcoming by a long shot was the city we're sitting in, in Boston. What do you hope that your colleagues from across the country will be exposed to in the next week that will cause them to go home and hopefully say, the Boston of today is not the Boston of 1982 and thereabouts. So, so I'm going to be a little pr- provocative when I say this, but it's true. Right? Boston is a racist city. <laughs> so like New York, like Chicago, like Miami, like L.A., it's a racist city. The racism here looks different. It feels different. But I tell people all the time, you have to, if you want to see racism and you know what it looks like, you'll see it everywhere. You'll see it in the gaps, the disparities, the inequities, the treatment. It's the restaurant when you walk in, you're an African-American patron and that person doesn't come to greet you or they think you're the wait staff at the hotel, right? It, it still happens to this day and I'm a black Bostonian born and raised um, and I can tell you it happens to me to this day in this city. So one is we got to get dispel this notion that we're so much better that we're not that city anymore. Um, so that's one. Two, 
but we're not what we were. So I, I talked to an African-American gentleman last night. He spoke at the, uh, well, I introduced him, uh, Jim, so you remember. He's one of the, the hotel managers uh, in great. Boston. I think he may be the first black hotel manager, mm -hmm. at least he thinks he might be, at the Hyatt Regency. And he said, Michael, I came here a few years ago and I had a lower level position and somebody called me a racist term in the hotel lobby. It was uh, a, a, a person staying at the hotel. He said, I left here and I promised I would never come back. He said, and then I got recruited to come back uh, to run this hotel. And he said, I'm pleasantly surprised it's not the same place. That that kind of overt racism I haven't experienced since I came back. And that's why I'm staying here. So I say that to say um, he had a great story to tell. But racism still lives. It breathes. Uh, walk around our neighborhoods. Walk at the disparities with Roxbury. Walk in Newton. I mean, uh, Cleveland Circle, Copley Square, and see why there's so many black folks who do not come out of Roxbury, Dorchester, Matt Mattapan into our uh, downtown areas. There's a reason for that, is that we don't feel welcomed, uh, we don't feel respected, and we got to find a way. So that our, we hope, I hope, Jim, to get to your question, I hope that when they walk into a restaurant here in the seaport or anywhere around town, they're greeted with a smile. And I hope someone says, hey, I'm glad you're here. Um, and I'm nervous about that. Because it takes one, well, was it one time to make a bad impression, right? and I'm hoping that the city's ready to receive us that way. When you say you're nervous about that, you're nervous about that in terms of this convention happening this weekend. Or you're nervous about that in general going forward, or both. I mean, one is just the weekend because I feel like you know it's my house, you know. So yeah. I feel like I invited people over my house. I want to make sure the bathroom's clean. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure that you know they're greeted well. Um, but I also want to make sure that the, the house look good, feels good after they leave as well. But right now, I'm worried about making sure that people are receiving uh, folks that are coming to the city. And, you know, I feel good. I feel like the city's aware. Thanks to Michelle Wu, Mayor Wu. Phenomenal job. Meet Boston, the Mass Convention Center uh, Authority have done a phenomenal job of getting the city ready for us. So I feel good about that. You, know, you talked a lot about, uh, to us and to other people as well, about wanting everybody to come here, not just think this is not just about black Boston, uh, national black uh, groups, the NAACP all around the country. Why does that matter? Well, one is, uh, and I get to talk about the end, history of the NAACP all the time, folks don't realize that this was a multiracial effort that started the NAACP. So, uh, and I'll say this really quickly, Niagara Movement, Black men organized, William Monroe Trotter, Bostonian, W.B. Du Bois were organizing 1905, started that agro movement. Black women were eventually allowed here in Boston, third meeting to let black women participate. Uh, you had a, a, a Springfield race riot in 1908, two black men. The history of this country, black men being accused of attacks on white women, false attacks, two black men in, in Springfield, Illinois. When the town found out that those two black men had been jailed for the accused uh, attacks on white women, thousands of citizens marched on that jail to, to lynch those two black men. Lynching was a culture of this country for most of this country's history. So lynching on 1908 and the white sheriff and a white businessman and others moved those two men out of town. And when the town found out that they'd been moved, they started killing, lynching uh, other black citizens. So I say that to say white people across this country joined with black leaders, Mary White Ovington, William English Walling, wrote an article uh, in 1908, Race War in the North. And folks started to come together and start what is now the NAACP. We got to tell those stories because where are our allies at in this moment we're talking about maternal health? Where are our allies at when a little kid gets shot uh, on a street corner? And we got to understand that we have this work to do together and that this is a product of systemic racism in this country, how can we do the work together like Mary White Ovington and William English Walling uh, and Kivy Kaplan, a uh, prominent Jewish citizen who served on the national board before me? How do we come together like that again? Michael Curry, congratulations on bringing the convention here. Wish you a lot of luck in the next week. And thank, thank you. you for getting us here, I should say. No. Yeah. Yeah. Boston Public Radio and GBH would not be in this building were not for your advocacy. We really appreciate it. Well, I got a lot of love for you all, so I'm glad oh, you're here. Oh, good. Me. Feel pretty good <laughs> well, about you, you too, Michael. thank you very much, and good be luck well. with everything luck. This, this, this weekend and the coming week. We've been speaking with Michael Curry, President and CEO of the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers. He's also a member of the National NAACP Board of Directors, where he chairs the board's Advocacy and Policy Committee. After a quick break, we're going to be joined by our next two guests. President of the NAACP Miami-Dade County, Daniela Pierre and LaSella Hall. 
They are next. You're listening to 89.7 GBH, Boston Public Radio. We are broadcasting live from the NAACP National Convention at the Boston Convention and Exhibit Center in South Boston. And we are streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. Everyday people. I watch decorating sets. Personal stories. Two designers went into a home and they redecorated a room in a day using the furniture, art, and accessories that were already there. And I thought, wow, that's a blast. I'd love to do that. I told some friends and relatives, and some of them were like, you think you can get on TV? I said, well, why not? Stories from the stage, Sunday night at 7 on GBH 87. Our programs are made possible thanks to you. And Rockland Trust Bank, dedicated to providing advice and support to the community for over 115 years. More at rocklandtrust.com. Rockland Trust Bank, where each relationship matters. Member FDIC. And Morningside Music Bridge, returning to Boston. The summer program shines a spotlight on young classical musicians from around the world. With concerts now through August 4th at the New England Conservatory. MMB.international. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan thrilled to be broadcasting live from the NAACP National Convention at the Boston Convention Center, streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. And obviously we're broadcasting on 89.7 GBH. We're joined now by two leaders from the NAACP Next Gen program. Lasella Hall is the former president of the NAACP New Bedford branch. He's now head of NAACP Next Gen. Daniela Pierre is president of the NAACP Miami-Dade County branch. I think that's in Florida, from what I understand, Daniela. We talk about Florida a bit. And a graduate of the Next Gen program. We'll talk more about what that means in a minute. Lasella, Daniela, we really appreciate your presence. Thanks so much for being here. New Bedford Bedford branch. I'm a Fall River girl. You beat up... (laughs) Beat us in football, we beat you in basketball. That's how I remember it, LaSalle. Is that right? I think we're all friends here. (laughs) (laughs) That's what he thinks. Okay. So let's let's talk about building the next generation. I mean, we were talking about this a little bit before, Danielle. Sometimes when you're 18, 20, 25, you're not thinking about uh, the the NAACP. You're not thinking about these issues. So how how do you build that branch? Yeah. So I, I think you you are thinking about these issues uh, maybe a little differently. Maybe the language is a little different, right? So when we talk, we know that um, college students, uh, young students in middle school and high school, they are concerned about environmental justice. They are concerned about housing. They remember uh, the 2008 crash where many of them have lost their homes and they saw their parents doing that. And so when we talk about the different movements that have occurred, right, they may not necessarily say the name of the NAC people. When they think about movements, whether it's Black Lives Matter movement, the Me Too movement, whether it's an indigenous movement or pride community movements, the idea of fighting for justice for young people just makes sense. And so I think it is the same conversation, maybe some different language, but they're certainly interested in these issues. Daniela, my understanding, Michael Curry's talked to us a lot about Next Gen. He was one of the co-founders with the D.C. Uh, chapter a president, sort of building the bench kind of thing. We were talking on the air yesterday about how unwelcoming most leaders of Congress are to younger members taking leadership roles. How open is the NAACP leadership to this next generation having a real seat at the table? So the NAACP has always been open to young people. Going back to the 1980s, we established the National Youth Council, a youth and college division where we can bring and train up our next generation of leaders. That actually started with our youth and college division. So we've always had youth a part of social justice and the civil rights movement within the NAACP. After the youth and college division, then came Next Gen. For those who may have aged out of the youth and college division, here we come to actually train up those working professionals who want to give back and to lead and serve in the NAACP. You're both graduates of the yes, program, right? Absolutely. Lacella, what explain what is what happens to a person in next gen? What does get them ready for leadership? Yeah, absolutely. The next gen is a is a one year cohort. And so what that cohort does is that you are in monthly training through webinars 
and through uh, Zoom communication, but then you are also given three trainings that are in person. One of those trainings is typically at the upcoming convention, mm -hmm. and the other two trainings will be at different locations to reach different members across uh, the country. Next Gen is a makeup of citizens in over 38 different states of young people who have applied to the program, and in that program they're learning, but while they're learning in the program, they're also members of their respective units, whether that is the brand or working at the state level and so what you have is a training you're training young people while they're in leadership positions or aspiring to leadership positions you know before we went on air Danielle we we're talking about you being from Miami Dade County and of course that's in Florida and the governor of Florida is Ron DeSantis and the NAACP issued a travel advisory about Florida so I'm wondering about what it's like to be organizing in Miami Dade in 2023 with this guy running the state it's advocacy like never before. I can tell you serving as a young professional, as a leader, uh, as one of the oldest branches within the NAACP um, is something that I don't take lightly. I was actually a part of the vote that was led by at the Florida State Conference for the NAACP to vote unanimously for the Florida Travel Advisory um, to say, hey, don't come to Florida because you may experience some hostility based on some of the regressive policies that are coming out by Governor Ron DeSantis. So to be a part of that whole movement, to see other young people being awakened by that advocacy, I'm proud to be a part of that. And I'm proud to be able to mobilize others to be a part of that effort. You know, we're talking to two graduates of the Next Gen program and leaders of the Next Gen program, LaSella Hall and Daniela Pierre. We only have minutes. Starting with you, LaSella, what do you hope comes out of the next week in this convention? Yeah, I, I would say energy. I, I think that young people are energized. Yeah. I think they will leave here with energy, and I think they will leave here with a plan and a strategy to mobilize. The purpose of the convention, in my opinion, is to come and receive the marching orders, to pass resolutions and to go back to our respective communities. And I know that our next year members will do that. They are ready to go back to their communities and work over the next year. Certainly as we head into an election season, yeah. we need to make sure that voters are mobilized, they're educated, and they're informed so we can pass the proper legislation to move our communities forward. In a couple of seconds, Danielle, how about you? What are your hopes for the next week? Policy that we can take back to our local areas and make things happen. Fair enough. Pleasure to meet you both. Yes, Congratulations you on your work. In. We really I hope appreciate it's a great, it. A great time here in, in Boston. We've been speaking with LaSalle Hall and Danielle Pierre. Danielle is the president of the NAACP Miami Dade County branch. LaSalle Hall, the former president of the NAACP New Bedford branch. He's now head of the NAACP Next Gen. Thank you both again for being with us. Up next, the CEO of the New England Patriots, Robert Kraft, is going to join us on the line. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. In fact, uh, the chair of the Kraft Group and founder of the Foundation to Combat Anti-Semitism is with us now, Robert Kraft. He'll be in conversation this weekend in a widely anticipated panel. Gates Jr., Meek Mill, the president of the NAACP, and uh, a panel discussion entitled Hate Has No Home Here, a moderated conversation on racism, anti-Semitism, and building bridges to fight all hate. That's on Sunday, and yesterday, you probably know, he was announced as a finalist for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Robert Kraft, we really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for joining us. It's my honor. How are you, Jim? We're great. Marjorie's good, too. Yeah, nice to have you. Robert Kraft, thank Hi, Marjorie. you. Hi, Yes, hello, Robert Kraft, and thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, talk about this workshop. I think this is going to be one of the highlights uh, of the convention. What's going to go on, and how would you get involved? Well, we've, uh, we've started this foundation uh, to combat anti-Semitism, but really to combat all hate. This is the greatest country in the world. I mean, we have problems, but we have to make sure that uh, all people are given equal opportunities to accomplish what they want or to get the right medical care. And um, we started this uh, foundation three years ago um, when we saw things in this country. You know, it started with Charlotteville and then the Tree of Life 
and um, we 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 think that people aren't joining together to combat all this discrimination, and we want to try to be leaders in building bridges and not allowing that to happen in this country. You know, Robert, you mentioned the slaughter at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, the haunting, horrific Jews will not replace us chant from Charlottesville, but they're sadly not outliers. What's your analysis as to why we've seen such a rise in anti-Semitism in this country in recent years? Well, I think part of it is there's a lack of empathy and people are sort of in their own world. And, you know, I think that's part of what happens with social media and people get in their own cliques. But in the end, uh, I think this country is a country that's welcomed people from all areas of the world and everyone's had equal opportunities. And the development of hate and discrimination, unfortunately, uh, our brothers and sisters from the black community have seen it you know for 400 years in this country and their situation is unique and that's why we've tried to join forces in this panel that we're having and i'm so happy it's happening in beantown you know uh, <laughs> yeah. an organization of over 100 years that is trying to do what we're our little uh, foundation is trying to do make believe that you're going to a house of worship going to your church and there's armed guards in front and yeah. inside so you can this is the united states of america that shouldn't happen but that's happened with almost every synagogue in america today people unfortunately make believe going to church and you have armed guards out in front and inside to protect. That shouldn't be happening in this country today. No, and it is happening right here in Boston, and I've seen it right in my neighborhood in Brookline. We're talking with Robert Kraft of the Kraft Group and the New England Patriots. You know, you're going to be in this conversation with Professor Henry Louis Gates. People may remember he was arrested by the Cambridge police going into his own home in Cambridge a few he years was. back. And criminal justice reform advocate Meek Mill, whom you visited in prison, uh, who was in prison for a very... Uh, what I would say was a teeny tiny uh, parole violation. So tell us about meeting with Meek Mill, uh, Robert Kraft. Well, Meek Mill has become a good friend. And um, when he got put in jail on a parole violation for doing a wheelie. Yeah, doing a wheelie. And, uh, <laughs> uh, it's ridiculous. Here's a guy who's making millions of dollars, hiring people denied the ability to see his young son and you know put in prison for a violation like that uh so the american public is paying 50 odd thousand dollars and because the man did a wheelie that's a system that's broken and you know we also helped fund found the reform movement to fight against that and i think me uh, I had never been to a jail before when I visited them. It got me so angry that I came out and spoke out about it. And a few days later, he was released. So he, it really bonded us. And um, I think he appreciated that someone like myself, we're from different backgrounds, would visit him and care. And that, you know, I took him on a trip to Poland to see these concentration camps. Uh, my wife and I led the March of the Living between Auschwitz and Birkenau in Poland, and I asked Meek to come. And he saw firsthand what was done to the Jewish people, that six million people were killed in these camps. and. He had no idea, and he saw the 46,000 scalps of women's hair pile up in the room, and then the baby shoes in the next room at one of the camps, and he had a tear in his eye, and he, he said to me, Robert, I thought the ghetto 
in East Philadelphia or North Philadelphia was the worst place on earth. But I just saw something that was worse. And it's the reason we have to join together arm in arm and push back against all this hate and discrimination and understand what a great country we're privileged to live in and we got to fix the inequities. You know, speaking of inequities, Robert Kraft, uh, we had Robert Rooks who runs the Reform Alliance that you and Meek Mill and Jay-Z and others uh, formed. And if people want to learn about the inequities in the probation and parole system that you have focused on, check out Reform Alliance. It's really important. You know, Robert, before you go, while we're really anticipating your panel, I want you to know you're the first Bostonian I've ever spoken to who used the term bean town. But I think <laughs> if anybody can get away with it, it's probably you. Do you think? Is it this good? Tell me, did I mess up doing that? I think no, you messed up no. big time, big time, Robert <laughs> he Kraft. Did not. Hey, Robert Kraft, we I really love, appreciate I love the calling it Bean Town. <laughs> yeah, Robert, Except we really we didn't throw a... beans overboard. We threw tea overboard. That's right. So you we're told from England. <laughs> so we're told, Robert. We really appreciate your time. We're really looking forward to the panel this weekend. Thanks for giving us a couple of minutes of your uh, schedule. Yes, thank we really you appreciate very it. much. It's great to talk with you both. Thanks for having me. Thank we you. We appreciate it. We've been speaking with Robert Kraft, who's chairman of the Kraft Group and founder of the Foundation to Combat Anti-Semitism. He's going to be in conversation, as Jim just said, with Harvard professor Henry Louis Gates and criminal justice reform advocate Meek Mill on a panel discussion entitled Hate Has No Home Here, a moderated conversation on racism, anti-Semitism, and building bridges to fight all hate. It's going to take place on Sunday. If you want to get more information, go to NAACP.org slash convention. Who's so coming up now? Yes, Ayanna Presley is going to be with us. In a couple of minutes, is Tanisha Sullivan, the president of local chapter, just arrived. Oh, Tanisha Sullivan. Arrived. Okay, Tanisha's she's going to be here, too. Us. Hey, I want to mention, you mentioned at the top of the show, the editorial that was written warning uh, 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 African Americans not to go to Charleston, South Boston. 1982, yeah. Michael Regenberg from EEI just she wrote texted it. to say, yep. I was the person who wrote that editorial. It enraged Kevin White in the legislature. So much has changed in today's Boston. Thank you very much for sending that, Michael Thanks, Regenberg. Michael. Okay, coming up, as Jim just said, Tanisha Sullivan, president of the NAACP Boston chapter. She is next. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7. We are broadcasting live from the National Convention at the, of the NAACP at the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center and streaming on youtube.com slash gbhnews. I'm Marco Werman. On the world, we get an outside perspective. I was born in Yemen. So many people in Sweden. Most people in South Africa. Because getting outside yourself can be a good thing. Once you move to a different country, you zoom out and you're able to see where is the other person coming from. It is the world. This afternoon at 3, here on GBH News 89.7. Support for our programs comes from you and Comcast. Through Project Up, Comcast is committing $1 billion to help provide people with the skills, resources, and opportunities they need to succeed in a digital world. Learn more at comcast.com slash project up. And Massachusetts Commission for the Blind, committed to helping employers build an inclusive workforce. To learn how you can become an employer partner and hire qualified candidates within MCB's talent pool, you can visit mass.gov slash vision. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy, Mardrigan, broadcasting live from the 114th NAACP National Convention at the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center inside the hub. We're streaming youtube.com slash GBH News. We told you our next guest was Tanisha Sullivan, who's president of the Boston chapter. She's kind enough to step aside for a couple of minutes because on the line is the congressman representing the district. That would be Ayanna Presley. Congresswoman, we really appreciate your time. Thanks for calling in. 
Uh, well, we lost the connection. Out. She's calling back. She missed your whole introduction, Jim. It was beautifully done. You have to do it again when the congresswoman. Meanwhile, I said you. she's the congressperson representing the city of Boston. That I beautiful thought, introduction. That was brilliant. Thank it was you very much. Absolutely brilliant. So, Ayanna Presley is going to be back with us in a second. A little bit later in the show, we're going to talk to Mayor Wu. We're also going to talk to a prior mayor, Mayor Walsh, who had a little bit to do with bringing the convention here to begin with. In about five minutes, we'll talk to Tanisha Sullivan, who uh, she looks calm to me. I don't quite understand that, frankly. If I were in her position, I would be trembling and sweating from yeah. head to toe, but she looks quite wonderful, I should say. Thank so, you. Uh, you do. We'll get to her in a second. Do we have Congresswoman Presley back or do we not? We don't. Okay, okay. Tanisha we're gonna, Sullivan. We're going to change plans yet again. Hi, Tanisha, Tanisha Sullivan. Sullivan. Good to see you and congratulations. Yeah. So, <laughs> thank you. Good you to a, see you both. Are you a basket case, as my as my <laughs> co-host just said, or are you are you keeping calm? No, no. I, listen, we have uh, we've been planning, we've been preparing uh, for this moment. Uh, for years, quite frankly, but definitely over the last few months. And so the team has just done a phenomenal job, and I'm really excited. Now, the fact of the matter is we started last week. I mean, we yeah. are in the thick of it. Um, today, of course, uh, we're continuing with AXO. Uh, the young people competed yesterday, uh, so super excited about that. We Tell have people what that is. So, so AXO is the academic, Afro-Academic Cultural Technological and Scientific Olympics. It we have is, somebody from there in a few minutes, but give us a headline at least. AXO is probably one of the best programs, one of the best parts mm. of the NAACP. I'm an AXO alum. Oh. Thousands of high school students compete in this competition annually. You won, Less, didn't about, you? Roughly, didn't you win? I won here in yeah. Boston. I did. I did. I yeah, did. I many so. moons ago, though. Okay, that's all right. Many moons. Many, many moons ago. Um, but the students are here. They're wonderful. They're brilliant. Uh, the uh, the award ceremony will be tomorrow. So. We also have a college summit that's happening right now. I'm told it's standing room only uh, with our young people who are learning more about the college opportunities, college and university opportunities here in Massachusetts. We've got a group of folks headed into Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan this afternoon to engage with um, some of our local grassroots community organizations. So we are in full, full swing. I want to say the most important thing you have to convey is what you said to us the other day on the radio. Everybody is invited to this. Absolutely. This is not an NAACP member only convention. It's a convention for all the people who care about the issues you care about. Absolutely. Okay. So certainly this is a business meeting. So there are some parts that are for members, Understood. right? We've got to do the business. But where we are today right now is in the hub. The hub is free and open to the public. We open this afternoon at about two o'clock. It will be open through the weekend. I definitely want to encourage everyone who wants to get a taste of this convention to come on down to the hub. Uh, Tanisha Sullivan, you said to us the other day, this is an opportunity for the state and the city to reintroduce introduce ourselves to black America. Give us, we know what that means, and I'm sure mm -hmm. listeners did too, but put it in your own words. What does that mean to you? This is, you know, one of those rare opportunities uh, that we get as a community, as a society, to introduce ourselves to the country. Now certainly we know Boston is one of the oldest cities in our nation. Um, but we also know that Boston's reputation across the country is one of being, is, is one that is rooted in some racist perceptions, right? That we are one of the most racist cities in America. Now. This convention does present the opportunity for us to reintroduce ourselves to the nation in the sense that it gives us an opportunity to share what we've been doing to address the deep systemic racial inequities that do exist. It gives us an opportunity to share some of our progress and to also share kind of where we, how we foresee moving forward. I think for us here in Boston, I'm looking forward to what happens, yes, over the next six days, but even more so, I'm looking forward to the conversations and the work that is inspired by what we all see and learn over the next six days. I'm confident that we're not gonna miss this moment. 
I'm confident that uh, our elected officials, our business community, academia, our advocates on the ground will take this experience and run with it. And Bostonians and the Commonwealth will be better for it. You know, we only have a second left, but I don't want you to leave without saying you were at a really important place this morning, which is why you weren't with us at the top of the show, uh, uh, involving a man who's a wonderful leader in this community. Could you briefly tell us where you were, if you don't mind? Well, we are certainly sending condolences to the Motley family um, as they're grieving the loss of a child. Um, you know, I, it, it's hard to put into words that type of pain, but we do know um, that uh, Dr. Motley, Keith Motley, and Angela Motley um, are people who have poured so much into our community, and yeah, so community is loving on them um, and their family right now. We really appreciate your time. We wish you a lot of luck, and we hope to see you a lot over the next couple of days. Thank Congratulations. you. Look, look forward to seeing you all, yeah. and look forward to seeing folks come through. We do, yeah. too. Yes. We're thrilled you're here, and thanks for the invite. Really appreciate yeah, it, Tanisha. Tanisha Sullivan, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy day to come be with us. We really appreciate it. And coming up, we are going to talk with In fact, the, she's uh, here right now. Yes, we are. Congresswoman okay. Anna Presti, I believe she's on the phone. We're going to talk to her right now and we thank again Tanisha Sullivan the president of the NAACP chapter here in Boston for being with us. Thanks. Congresswoman you've been very patient. Welcome. It's good to talk to you. Good morning. Good, good morning to, to you. you. Yeah, th thank you very much and we apologize for the technical difficulties before Congresswoman. So, so tell us you, what do you think this is going to mean for the city of Boston to have the uh, NAACP convention back here for the first time since 1982? Let me tell you, um, when I served on the Boston City Council, myself and Councilor Jackson were often invited by Jim Rooney to come to the convention center to talk to would-be black organizations and conventioneers about why they should come to Boston. Um, we were there because we had to make the case. There was great apprehension and reservation. The perceptions that President Sullivan referenced were rooted in very real experiences. And so when I, I juxtapose that against where we are today, that since those pitch meetings, uh, we have now had numerous organizations, uh, black serving and representative organizations who have come to Boston. Uh, it is indicative of the progress that has been made. And you know, I do sorry. want people to know that, you know, we have a historic, uh, black attorney general and district attorney uh, and, sh and sheriffs and uh, state senators and representatives and congresswomen. So great strides have been made, but Shigen uh, Itawu, uh, the chief economic development officer and formerly with BECMA, uh, often talks about how his grandmother, grandfather cautioned him from confusing uh, the motion of a rocking chair with progress. Because the chair rocks, but it's not moving. <laughs> so, you know, the point, the point being that I would never give short shrift to the progress and the strides that have been made when it comes to leadership parity, uh, when it comes to um, the electoral power, but when it comes to strides being made in equity and wealth building and racial justice. My very election is indicative of that progress. Um, but there is much more work that remains to be done, and I do believe we will come out of this uh, more clear-eyed, fortified uh, about exactly what needs to be done. You know, uh, Ayanna Presley, an NAACP convention always matters, but I would argue that it matters even more when it's just weeks after an anti-majoritarian Supreme Court got affirmative action in higher education. A governor running for president thinks that slavery was a job training program or something. Is it naive to think that a week of civil rights leaders coming together from around the country can actually talk to each other, make decisions, and possibly make a difference? Am I investing too much in this? I don't think it's uh, naive, and in fact, history has shown us that it is the only way that we have made real strides towards racial justice in this country. Uh, recently, I was campaigning uh, for the re-election of Representative uh, Justin Jones in Tennessee. Mm. And we stopped by uh, the Woolworth original lunch counter 
uh, that was desegregated by Diane Nash and many other freedom fighters. In order to advance forward, I always take a page from the past. They've already given us the blueprint. And even if everyone in this room is already aware of every sobering statistic that we offer, every inequity and disparity and gap that we must close in Boston and beyond, even if we are preaching to the choir, even the choir has to have rehearsal. <laughs> and so, um, you know, in that, in that vein, um, I think it is necessary and essential against the backdrop of all the things that the erasure of, of black history, uh, the far right extreme imbalanced Supreme Court, uh, gutting affirmative action uh, in affirmative, uh, in higher education, uh, stopping uh, the uh, student loan uh, forgiveness mm -hmm. uh, with a disparate burden on black borrowers, a nation in the midst of a march towards forced birth which has a disparate burden on black women and growing our black maternal morbidity crisis. Um, we are in the midst of very challenging times. And so it is important that uh, we are coming together at this critical inflection point. And might I add, I will tomorrow be bringing the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus uh, and other members to Roxbury Community College for a town hall, this is a part of uh, the Congressional Black Caucus Institute series throughout the country, Summer of Action, Democracy for the People. They are going to 10 cities. Uh, we are a, a CBC that is 58 members strong, the biggest CBC in the history of Congress. Uh, and uh, out of 58 members, 10 cities were chosen. Ours is one of those cities. We will be at Roxbury Community College. Uh, Saturday, July 29th in the academic building from 3 to 5 p.m. I hope you'll come um, because, again, it, it, this is against the backdrop of the NAACP that the CBC members are coming as a part of this broader series, but against the backdrop of the assault on black Americans um, in this moment. By the way, uh, the congressman will also be delivering remarks Monday here at the Juanita Jackson Mitchell Youth Awards, the Black Met Gala. Congressman, we just talked with uh, Daniela Pierre. She's uh, one of the leaders of the Next Generation NAACP Next Gen uh, group. And she talked about being from Miami-Dade, which, of course, is in Florida, which, of course, is where Ron DeSantis is the governor who seems to be on a crusade uh, against everything uh, so-called woke. Um, we, we're hearing a lot of talk lately about reclaiming that word as part of the African-American culture. What's that all about? Well, I, I think I might have recently shared with you all how I had the great honor of being asked to reimagine Dr. King's final Sunday sermon in 1968 yes. and to do that here at the Washington Cathedral. And um, at the time he delivered that sermon, he was one of the most um, reviled and, and hated men in America, in fact. And that sermon, uh, in it, it was a call to action, challenging us to remain awake in the midst of a great revolution. And so here we are in 2023, where people have sought to weaponize what it is to be awake. Um, while there are forces that work draconian in legislatures and in our court system, who seek to uh, weaponize what it is to be awake and to lull us into a permanent sleep state with uh, misinformation, disinformation, um, with scarcity budgets and policy violence and efforts to suppress our vote. We find ourselves in the midst of a backlash, a white lash, a legislated backlash and white lash against the growing power of a supermajority of the most marginalized, a supermajority led by black America, by our sweat equity, our labor, and our vote. And so it's important that we take that word woke back uh, in that it has been weaponized with a negative uh, connotation uh, when to be woke is simply to be uh, conscious. <laughs> uh, and and in, my, in my opinion, committed to the work of dismantling uh, systemic and structural barriers to uh, equity, equality, fairness, and justice, racial justice. Hey, before you go, I want to get it right. Roxbury Community College with a Congressional Black Caucus tomorrow, 3 to 5. Is that right? That's right. Great. I Democracy press the for the people. You can RSVP at democracyforthepeople.org. 
democracyforthepeople.org. Ayanna Presley, we really appreciate your time. Thanks well, so thank much, you. Congresswoman. Thank you very much for being with us. Appreciate it. Appreciate yeah. you. See you soon. Thanks. We've Thanks. Been speaking bye. with Congresswoman Anna Presley, who represents Massachusetts' seventh congressional district, and she is the first woman of color to be elected to the Congress from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And as Jim said, she's going to be giving remarks here Monday night at the Juanita Jackson Mitchell Youth Awards, the Black Met Gala. Okay, coming up next, we're going to speak with former mayor of Boston and former U.S. Labor Secretary Marty Walsh. He's next on Boston Public Radio 89.7, broadcasting live from the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center for the NAACP National Convention and streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. Welcome back to the Boston Public Radio broadcast live from the 114th NAACP National Convention at the Boston Convention Ex Exhibition Center inside the hub. We're also streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. We're joined now on the phone by the former Secretary of Labor for the United States and the Biden-Harris administration, the former mayor of Boston, Marty Walsh, and he's now head of the National Hockey League Players Association. Mayor Walsh, great to talk to you. How are you? It's great to be here. I'm so excited that the convention is finally in Boston. Yeah. Um, so it's a great day and a great weekend in the city of Boston. I know that the uh, NAACP leadership and membership around the country is excited to be in, a, in our great city. Well, uh, Mayor Walsh, I understand you had something to do with this happening here in the city of Boston. Uh, Michael Curry told, whispered in my ear about this. So what, what, what was your role? Yeah, a couple of years ago, um, the NAACP convention was looking for a location and uh, Michael, and, and because of his national leadership on the convention, uh, put a bid in uh, for the convention to be hosted in Boston in 2020. Um, the local branch, Tisha Sullivan, was, was, was also involved. And uh, we built a relationship with the national NAACP uh, and put on a presentation. And I went to Detroit when they chose Boston to host the 2020 convention. Uh, we were excited about it because for a lot of reasons, number one is having uh, the oldest historic, uh, most historic civil rights organization coming to the city of Boston uh, in 2020 was important. Uh, and also really thinking about where we were as a city, where we have been as a city, and about moving forward as a city. Uh, so we were excited about it, um, and we were raising money and getting ready for an amazing uh, co convention in 2020 uh, and bringing delegates from all over the country. And then the pandemic happened, uh, obviously, and it set us back. Um, and the NAACP con committed to us that even though that, that commit, that the next two conventions went virtual, that they would come to Boston in the future in 2023 is the year they're here. Um, so I'm excited, even though I'm not, I wish I was the mayor today because uh, I would have loved to agree them, but I'm sure Mayor Wu will as well. Um, it's exciting to have them in Boston, um, and, and hopefully uh, I know they'll have a great convention here. Yeah, but you're getting free hockey tickets now, so that's a plus. <laughs> so, uh, 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 Mayor Walsh, you're quoted as saying around the time you can't erase – our history, but we wanted to change our image. What do you think is, I mean, obviously you traveled the country as uh, Secretary of Labor. What do you think is the most important thing or things that people coming to this convention from around the country have to experience to go home and say, Boston's not perfect, but it's a hell of a lot different than what it was 40 years ago when the NAACP was here? Well, I, I, think, I, think, that, I, think, people will, I think people will say that and see that in the city. They'll experience it on the streets. Um, but, you know, we still have work to do. I think when you think about our elected leadership 40 years ago, it was predominantly white men. Um, and, you know, we were in the, the right immediate aftermath of busing. Uh, we, were, we were still hadn't integrated, I don't believe, our housing uh, developments in the city of Boston. Um, and, you know, there was, there was a, lot of, a, lot of ch a lot of challenges. Our, our police department, our fire department, our public safety, our, our workforce, was predominantly white men um, when you think about the time. And, and, and a lot has changed in, in 40, 50 years in the city of Boston, and there's still work to be done. I mean, we have very diverse. When you think about the Boston delegation, both at the State House and in the City Council, majority people of color, uh, you think about first time in the history of our city, we have a person of color as mayor of the city of Boston. Uh, we have, uh, you know, a congresswoman, a congresswoman, uh, person of color, Ayanna Presley, uh, a black woman who's the representative in Congress. 
We have a, a black district attorney, a black sheriff uh, in, in, in county offices. So, you know, the elected office have changed, but we still have work to do on the ground. It's about equity. It's about inclusion. Uh, we did some of that work as, as mayor in the city. Um, you, know, we, you know, we weren't perfect, but we did a lot of work. And, and, and again, it's going to take time, but I want, I want people to come to Boston and say, this is, I expected to come to Boston and feel unwelcome, and I left here feeling incredibly welcome. You know, uh, Mayor Walsh, um, your, your family's all from Ireland. My family's all from Ireland. You know, yeah, Boston's been a pretty Irish town for a long time, a lot of Irish people in charge. And I couldn't help thinking I'd been around here a long time, too. And back in, you know, in 81, you had the families terrorized in Dorchester in 82, and you had that young man chased down the tracks in Savin Hill. A lot of the names on the police docket were like yours and mine, they were Irish. Um, you must have thought about that, how things yeah, have changed. Yeah, if you, but if you, if you go back uh, 30 years before that, then they, were, they weren't Irish, they were different names, and I think it's unfortunate. And, and you know, as an Irish, Irish American, um, I, I try to tell people all the time, don't forget your own history. Yeah. Um, don't think, you know, when, you come, when, when people came to this country at the turn of the century, 19th to the 20th century, like, we, we can't, I think some people might have forgotten the fact that their ancestors or other people's ancestors were hated and not wanted here in, 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 the, in the country and in yep. the city. And, and, and I try to tell people, like, let's study history and understand the importance of that, understand the importance of opening arms and being welcoming. And, yeah, you're right. During that time, there's been a lot of incidents, in, racial incidents in our, in our country and in our city. That they, they were Irish surnames that were part of the 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 the, the you know the, the aggression, if you will. Um, but we have. To, I'm not saying forget that and never ignore that, but learn from that and build on that and move forward. Um, I think that that's what we have to do. I mean, you, you can't erase the past, nor should we ever erase the past. I think the past is very important to remember and understand that there are still people in our city, black people in our city, that have lived here their entire life and don't feel welcome and don't feel don't feel accepted, and that's wrong. We're talking to Marty Walsh, who was mayor when the invitation was made and accepted for the convention to come here that resulted in what's going to happen in the next week. You know, one last thing about history. I did the math. You were a teenager in the middle of all this when uh, uh, the convention was here last. Do you remember vividly the kinds of things Marjorie's talking about as a kid or, or no? Yeah, I remember, I remember some of that stuff. I mean, I was I was young when it happened. I'm 56 now. I mean, I remember I remember busing. I remember walking to St. Margaret's School down Columbia Road, and the the William E. Russell School was in Dorchester on, on Columbia Road. And I remember that's a grammar school. I remember the school buses pulling up with motorcycle police there, and I was like in first and second grade in '73 and '74, and just thinking like you know lo- looking back on it, how strange that is. Here I am walking to school. Uh, with my older cousin, um, you know, basically to school, and here are a kid, young black kids that are being, uh, not knowing at the time, I, I didn't understand at the time, but being bussed into the William E. Russell with police protection. These are kids same age as me, yeah. uh, going to grammar school, and, and, you know, again, not at the time understanding the magnitude. There was no problem at that school. But then as you get a little older and you start reading into the history of the city and Common Ground, the book Common Ground, and and doing research on it, you realize, like, really how bad of a time it was. I, I couldn't imagine, like, having to be police protected walking from my house on Taft Street yeah. to St. Margaret's School. That I didn't need that. I didn't have to have that. And, and, and you know, whether, whether or not people, like, people, some people say people should get over it, that, that's a traumatic incident in your life that you'll never get over. Right. Uh, no matter how much counseling or how much conversations or how much we do. So that's something that, that you know, history will never erase it. But what we have to do is build on it and, and make our, make our, make make our city uh, more accepting and, and understanding and, and, and welcoming to people. Mayor, Secretary, we really appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Marty Walsh. Really appreciate it. We've been speaking. Right, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much, Mayor Walsh, for being with us. We've been speaking with the former mayor of Boston and former U.S. Labor Secretary in the Biden-Harris administration. Marty Walsh is now head of the National Hockey League Players Association. After a quick break, are we talking to GBH Morning Edition co-host Paris Alston right now? We're running out of no, time. No, we're, we're not. We're going to talk to her in the 12 o'clock hour. We're going to talk to her in the 12 o'clock hour. I'm here I to answer so. all your questions, Thank Marjorie. you very much, thank Jim. Well, I just want to make sure I was on the right page here. Okay, we're going to talk with Paris Alston a little bit later. Uh, up next, the news from WGBH. We are Boston Public Radio 89.7. We are broadcasting live from the, uh, from the Massachusetts Convention Center where the NAACP convention is being held. And we are streaming online at GBH News. We're streaming online. <laughs>
I'm we're over now. Bye. You're listening to Boston Public Radio with Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan. Just ahead, more smart conversation about what's going on in our community. That's right after an NPR news break here on GBH News 89.7. Support for GBH comes from you and Blythewald, presenting the Music at Sunset Summer Concert Series overlooking Narragansett Bay every Wednesday night from 6 to 8. You can find the full schedule at blythewald.org. Celebrity chef Ainsley Harriet is pitted against journalist Anne Diamond as they travel around London searching for antique treasure. Watch Celebrity Antiques Road Trip tomorrow at 7 on GBH 44. Trusted. Local. News. You're listening to 89.7 WGBH, HD1 Boston, online at gbhnews.org. GBH News with NPR. What matters to you. I'm Jim Browdy, ahead on Boston Public Radio. We're broadcasting live from the National NAACP Convention. It's the first time the convention has been in Boston since 1982. Back then, one of the local editorial boards advised attendees to avoid visiting Charlestown, the North End, and South Boston. A lot has changed since then, but many of the issues remain. We'll bring you conversations with local and national leaders in business, government, and civil rights. I'm Marjorie Egan. We'll bring you a conversation about environmental justice with the Reverend Mariana White Hammond, the city's open space star, and legendary local journalists Ron Mitchell and Mel Miller of the Bay State Banner, Boston's oldest black-run newspaper. Former Boston Mayor Marty Walsh and current Mayor Michelle Wu as well. All that and more ahead, live from the NAACP convention, Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Lakshmi Singh. Tens of millions of people are weathering another day of punishing heat that in some parts of the country is projected to feel like 110 degrees outside today. Some of the U.S.'s large power grids and utilities are struggling to keep up with demand for cool air as extreme temperatures expand from the southwest further east. NPR's Amy Held reports scientists say this summer's oppressive heat is putting the planet in uncharted territory. Many in the U.S. are experiencing the worst heat of the year. D.C., Philadelphia, and Boston are all under heat emergencies. While in the Southwest, entrenched heat has left records in the dust. Same in Europe and China, where it hit 126 degrees this month. July 2023 will shed the records across the board. U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres says it's just the start. The era of global warming has ended. The era of global boiling has arrived. Guterres says world leaders can still act, avoiding the worst of it by reducing heat-trapping gas emissions. This week, President Biden announced steps to protect people from the effects of heat amid calls to do more to restrict the fossil fuels contributing to it. Amy Held, NPR News. The head of Israel's Air Force warns today that Israel's enemies may exploit current protests and fears of an erosion in Israel's system of checks and balances. He says the military needs to remain vigilant and prepared. Meanwhile, in an interview with NPR Stevinsky, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu maintained the heavily disputed measures underway to overhaul Israel's judiciary will not undermine Israeli democracy. I don't think it's affecting our national defense. Israel is very strong, and I, I think our enemies who certainly don't understand democracy, like Hezbollah or Iran or others, don't understand that we can have moments of conflict and disagreement and protests and demonstrations in uh, democracies that do not bring down uh, our systems. Earlier this week, the Israeli parliament passed the first of Netanyahu's changes in removing the Supreme Court's powers to void government and ministers' decisions it deems unreasonable. Americans should leave Haiti as soon as possible. That's a warning coming from the State Department. NPR's Michelle Kellerman has the latest. Non-emergency government personnel and family members of embassy employees are being evacuated from Haiti. The State Department says other Americans should look into commercial options as soon as possible. 
The State Department says that kidnapping is widespread in Haiti and that the victims regularly include U.S. citizens. Without providing specifics, the department says that U.S. citizens have been physically harmed during kidnappings and families have had to pay thousands of dollars in ransom. Gangs control much of Haiti's capital. The country hasn't had elections since President Jovenel Moïse was assassinated two years ago. That's Michelle Kellerman reporting. It's NPR News. Good afternoon with the latest from the GBH Newsroom. I'm Henry Santoro. Local veterans are being urged to apply for the federal health and financial benefits that they've earned. GBH's Mark Hurst reports as part of a new national push from the Department of Veterans Affairs to get help to veterans exposed to toxic substances during their service. Under a new federal law from last summer, veterans with toxic exposures, say due to Agent Orange or burn pits, can more easily get benefits from the VA. VA National Press Secretary Terry Terrence Hayes is in Boston today as part of the push to help vets. He says anyone possibly exposed and with a condition listed in the new law, which ranges from high blood pressure to cancer, should apply. Bottom line is this. All they need to do is sign up, and it's pretty much a slam dunk that their claim will be granted. Massachusetts veteran Michaela Brito says vets can get top-notch medical care and financial support. Anything from about $160 a month to $3,500 a month. There's more info at the website va.gov. In Boston, I'm Mark Kurz, GBH News 89.7. A South Coast man is charged in connection with the January 6th attack on the nation's capital. That's according to the U.S. Attorney's Office out of D.C. Michael St. Pierre of Swansea was arrested in Fall River yesterday. His charges include destroying government property and allegedly threatening to harm former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. A court date has not yet been set. In sports, the Red Sox start a West Coast road trip tonight in San Francisco with a series against the Giants. And if you like yesterday, you're going to love today. Hazy, hot, and Henry with highs in the mid-90s. This is GBH News. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include Fisher Investments. As a fiduciary, Fisher Investments is obligated to act in their client's best interest. Learn more at fisherinvestments.com. Investments in securities involve the risk of loss. It's Friday. I am Marjorie Egan. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. We are broadcasting live from the 114th NAACP National Convention at the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center inside the so-called hub, where there's a hub of stuff going on all around us. We are also streaming on YouTube.com slash GBH News and broadcasting, of course, on 89.7 GBH FM. Hello again, Jim. Hey there, Marjorie. We're hearing from leaders, thinkers throughout the show today, many more to come. Uh, And at some point, we'll try to get to some of your calls and texts. Some of the people coming up in the next couple of hours, uh, Imari Paris Jeffries, obviously from the Embrace, the mayor of the city of Boston, Mayor Wu, the two great vendors with whom we spoke the other day on the air, Rose Theram and Ricardo Pierre Lewis, they're going to give us an update that one of the leaders of Axe, so a whole bunch of people coming up in the legendary Mel Miller, obviously the founder of the Bay State Banner. Uh, we're joined now, though, speaking of the mayor, at the GBH booth by Reverend Mariama White Hammond, Boston's Chief of Environment, Energy, and Open Space. Reverend, it's great to see you. Welcome. It's good to be here. Yeah, so we're really excited to talk to you because I think environmental justice is something we hadn't heard about much until very recently. So explain to people what that what that means, what that means for Boston, what that means for all around the country. Yeah, so, you know, the environmental justice movement really has been around quite a while. Uh, started in mostly in the American South. A lot of folks looking at this question of who bears the burdens when there's pollution, when there's those sort of negative impacts on communities. And then the other side of the question is, who gets the benefits, right? Who gets the open space? Who gets the beautiful streams and the clean water? And environmental justice is really lifting up the reality that, unfortunately, there are many communities where, and particularly black communities and communities of color, where they don't get any of the benefits, they're not getting the tree canopy, they're not getting the parks, they're not getting those powerful, important things that are helpful, and they're being asked to bear the burdens. They're getting the pollution, the ash pollution, the air pollution, all of these negative impacts. And so environmental justice just says that we need equity. 
you shouldn't have some people getting all the benefits and other people getting all the burdens. Does the average person get how climate change has exacerbated these racial inequalities that are going to be the focus of a lot of the next week here? You know, I've been working on this issue about 10 years now, and uh, I think early on, maybe not everybody did get it, but we are here in July 2023, the hottest month on record ever in 120,000 yeah. years. <laughs> And I think people are getting it. People are really getting it now. What are you doing in the city to deal to address these inequalities, these inequities? Well, okay, first of all, we've made sure that we're paying attention to what are the current state of affairs. So last year we released a heat report where we used drones and a variety of different um, data techniques to really map what are the hard, hottest places in our city. And unfortunately, when you take the hottest places in the city, and you put that on top of the places where redlining occurred in our city, they're almost a one-to-one -one match. And so really telling the truth about the fact that this climate change, yes, is happening everywhere, but it's not affecting everybody equally. Some people are paying the price far more for the climate impacts, and we need to be honest about that. Because then there's the next step, which is, now that we know where the problem is worse, that is where the majority of the resources need to go. And so we've expanded our tree division. Mayor, we put money in the budget to take us from three staff people to 16. Mm -hmm. uh, and our heavy focus is on how do we increase canopy in those neighborhoods where in the past we didn't put trees. And in the past we put a lot of concrete. And in the past we made decisions that made it hotter for people. And also looking at things like how do we help people get air conditioning? How, how do we do the things both that lower the temperature in the neighborhood and that help people in their homes to survive? That's the voice of Reverend Mariama White-Hammond. You know, I, I remember we were talking a, a while ago that it, because there were all these huge trees along Melanie Cass Boulevard, huge, big, mm -hmm. mature trees, as they call mm -hmm. them. And there have been these plans made like 10, 15 years ago to just get rid of them mm -hmm. uh, for uh, wider sidewalks, bike lanes, all that kind of stuff. You used to yell at Marty Walsh on the radio every well, month, don't you because, remember? Because, you know, when I say when I say people hadn't heard that much about environmental justice, justice or in terms of, of redlining and stuff, it didn't seem to occur to these people that this was a bad idea to get rid of all these mature trees because you put up these little teeny tiny trees, we'll all be six feet under before they get big enough to make a difference. And then people stopped it. Mm. But that was a weird thing. Yeah, I think the reality is that people have often not valued nature. I yeah. mean, that's why we're in the situation we're in with climate change. Because we think we can pave over everything, and sometimes our mentality has been progress is bigger, better, this, you're gonna develop this, that, and the other. And, and the reality is, nature has been around since the very beginning. And it has a very important role to play, and everybody has a right to connect with nature. It's not just for heat. It's good for our mental health. Yeah. It's, it cleans our air. It has pro prospects and, and properties you can't manufacture. And I don't think we've appreciated that enough. Reverend, in the last minute we have, is the NAAC, I mean, there, we talked to Michael Curry before, just to, touched on some of the resolutions and business of the convention. Is the convention addressing these issues that you care about? Yeah, so this has been a part of the convention, I think, for at least the last four cycles. And um, what's been amazing is uh, I've, I've been able to meet with folks. I, last year we went as Boston was sort of taking the baton from Atlantic City, got to um, connect with some folks there. Uh, I'll be on a panel tomorrow where we're talking about these exact same issues with myself, but other leaders in this conversation. So, yeah, this... You're right. Ten years ago, I think people were a little fuzzy on it. They thought it wasn't as important as, as many other issues. But now I think people are really seeing, seeing the connections, and particularly post-Hurricane Katrina. I think for me yeah, and many point. of us, that was a wake-up call for how climate change is a threat multiplier. It takes everything we care about and makes it even worse. And so we can't afford to ignore it. Thanks for your time and thanks for your work. We really appreciate it. It's great to see you. It's good yeah, to be thank here. You, thank you so much for being here. We've been speaking with the Reverend Mariama White-Hammond. She's Boston's Chief of Environment, Energy, and Open Space. We very much appreciate your taking the time to be with us. After a quick break, we're going to talk with the Bay State Banner's editor, Ron Mitchell, and the Banner's legendary founder, Mel Miller. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting uh, in, down at the Convention Center in South Boston for the National NAACP convention.
Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Brady and Marjorie broadcasting live from the 114th NAACP National Convention at the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center inside the hub, as it's called. We're also streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. We're joined now by Boston. I don't know if he minds being called legend. Do you mind being called legend? Do you mind? A uh, little Legend, do you mind that or not? Oh, I don't care. <laughs> I, I don't care, he said. By Boston legend, Mel Miller. They, they called me worse. <laughs> I'm sure. We'll get to that. He's the founder of the Great Bay State Banner. Along with him is Ron Mitchell, the paper's current editor, former GBH'er, I should say. The Bay State Banner is the oldest and largest black newspaper in New England, founded by Miller in 65. I should also note it's now co-owned by Mitchell and the filmmaker Andre Stark, who was talking to her last night, who's known for his films for GBH's Frontline and Nova. Pulitzer Prize winning former Boston Globe and former GBH editor Ken Cooper is there an editorialist consultant during this transition. Mel Ron, it's great to see you both. Thanks well, for being here. Glad to be here. Well, thank, thank you, thank you very you. much for, for coming down, uh, both of you. You know, Mel, we talked to you about this before, but it's a great story. Um, uh, one of the things that put the Bay State banner on the map, you told us about this protest by a bunch of mothers uh, down oh, at yeah. Grove Hall and how it was covered in the, uh, like the Boston Herald, Boston Globe, and how it was covered by the Bay State banner. Tell people that story. Well, that's in 1967. People can remember at that time there were urban riots all over the country. And I think that our Boston police were in expectation of having one in Boston. So they had made prior plans to prevent this from happening. What happened was that the Mothers for Adequate Welfare, called MAWS, which was uh, an interracial organization of women who were protesting bad treatment as uh, welfare mothers, it, I won't go through all of the ugly, ugliness, and uh, so they they had a campaign in Grove Hall, uh, where the welfare office was located, and um, the campaign got a little uh, excite, excitable at the end, and the police came in in droves. I found out later that the police were already set up to have a an expectation of it being uh, a violent situation in Franklin Park. So they just had to bring the forces over. And they attacked people in the street, everybody. And we, we wrote a, a headline which became quite famous, Police Riot in Grove Hall, Scores Injured. Now the interesting thing is, show how the media works. All of the major media thought that, oh, this is going to precipitate serious violence. Actually, it did just the opposite. Because people said somebody's speaking out the truth of what yeah. happened. And the truth closed it down. And I, I don't think most people understand the power of the truth yet. <laughs> you know, uh, Ron, Still. That, that headline, <laughs> Still. Uh, I think it's fair to say, I didn't live here then, but I've read a lot. That headline did change the city to a it great did. degree. Yeah. And the leaders we've spoken to, Tanisha Sullivan, head of the Boston chapter, Michael Curry, former head of the Boston chapter, now on the national board, Michael said just before, there's still racism in the city. There's no question about that. We're making progress. But I think they both hope that this next seven days can lead to change, not only in the city, but how we're perceived beyond our borders by other people. Do you imagine, are you among those who think Boston can change just after seven days of the NAACP in town? I think that Boston has changed over time and will continue to change, but I think the perception of Boston may change as it hosts more African-American folks and treat them in a way unlike the experiences that Michael Che, the famous actor SNL. and comedian, yeah. you know, who said the most again, racist city in America. In, uh, I grew up in Boston. This is yeah. my city. And I understand his sentiments. I grew up with racism. But the wonderful thing about Boston is we've always had people on the cutting edge of civil rights. This is a civil rights city. Not only is Mel a civil rights yeah. leader, but we've had them going back to W.B. Du Bois, going back to William Monroe Trotter in the you know, early 1900s. So it has been, so early 20th century, it's, it's been a serious, serious city. And I think that hosting the convention here this time, when this country is in such a crucial phase yeah. of its, you know, pushback on anti-Semitism, pushback on the excessive racism, and the institutionalized racism that we experience, you know, affirmative action under fire. It's, it's really important to have it here so that the 
members of the convention can draw on the history of the city mm -hmm. and the history of the civil rights leaders like Mel. You, you know, when you say twice that Mel's a civil rights leader, this is the same guy that tells Reverend King he's not gone <laughs> south because he doesn't believe in yeah. nonviolence if people yeah, screw no, around no, with him. Uh, that was you, wasn't it? Yeah, no, no. Abso abso absolutely. Uh, I, I've never been nonviolent. And, and, uh, and, and I'm going to tell you quite frankly, a lot of what people call civil rights is really something other than the conventional civil rights that we might find in other places. Boston, what do you mean? What do you mean, Mel? But, well, Boston is different. Boston was a, a, a place where immigrants came from all over the world. That wasn't Atlanta or Chicago or other places. Boston, you could find Irish, Italians, Jews, uh, uh, Arabs from the Middle East. People from every uh, every uh, country living here, and they set up communities. And it's not to me to be unexpected that people would look out for their own, the people from their own culture. And and so sometimes what we have is people uh, getting too excessive with that. And that's really quite different from the civil rights mm -hmm. in the South, where people hate you. Like so many Irishmen have always said to me, "Hey, you are great, man. You could be, you could be Irish. You could, the only problem is you're not Irish and Catholic." <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah. I, under, I understand that a hundred percent. Roxbury truly was a tremendous melting pot back when you were yeah, going. You know, all the different yeah. cultures in you know one block, all in the same area, all growing up together. And I think that that's the hope for our city. I have two young adult uh, college age boys, and I would take a group of their friends places and away in the summertime for a week and we would go and it was always a rainbow my kids don't see color but yeah. racism is still out there and they have to deal with that's, the backlash of that so i have great hope for where we can go and i think that's part of the reason why i was honored to buy the paper from mel and to to work with andre to to, to take it over and transition it and help to keep it black journalism is crucial in our country you know from the t uh, from multiple murders that were put in the paper uh, and that folks were allowed to see back in the 50s and 60s that really shared the horror of what folks were dealing with. Mm -hmm. And today, it's a different type of racism. It's not as brutal in some ways, but it's just as damaging to our society. You know, the race of the anti-Semitism that has come up in the past five or six years. And, you know, that's what our paper deals with. It tells the truth, as Mel said. And when you tell the truth, you know what they say, Mel? Tell the truth, shame the devil. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Tell the truth, shame the devil. So what do you see people talk about? You've, you've got the long view here, Mel Miller. Um, do you think that th having the convention here in 2023 is going to matter long term, succeed, long, well, make well, a difference? Well, I, I, hope, I hope that people come from all over the country and learn how we do it in Boston. Because if you look at the records, we, our performance is way better than a lot of other cities. I, I don't mean to be arrogant about okay. our success, but <laughs> I, I, I'm a Boston dude, and yeah. so and and I I really sincerely believe that. You look at it, we we don't have the kind of violence that they have in Chicago or a lot of the other cities, and 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 one of the things that was very important that you just mentioned is that we we didn't have racial discrimination in the schools from 1850 on. What we had was something that nobody really fully understands yet. And, and uh, people outside think that it was just racial. Well, you know, we can't, we can't ever describe uh, the conduct of the most ill-educated and violent member of a, members of a group representing the whole organization. And I'm going to tell you quite frankly, I think that it was really much different from what people uh, understood and everybody was so happy to take this evidence and 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 uh, ruin the reputation of Boston everywhere I, th I think that was not unintentional because other people weren't they weren't doing as well as we were 
Maybe not, but as an outsider who moved here and loves this place, I have to say there were some things that we, frankly, should be pretty ashamed of that hopefully oh, we're yeah. hoping to build out. You know, before you go, one of the great things I love having you two together is the continuum. You know, the... the, the Absolutely. As we say, is, and, you know, the other... I'm talking to Ken Cooper last night at Michael Curry's event, and you, and uh, Ken Cooper, we're reading articles in the Globe, and not, now he's serving as your editorial consultant during this transition. Ken used to work with us. He's a wonderful editor, obviously prize winner at the Boston Globe. He was writing stories in 1982 for the Boston Globe about the exact same things in the city that we're, we're talking about. So I have to say there's so much history uh, represented in the wonderful work you guys have done and are doing now. And we wish you and your partner a lot of luck. And Mel, we always love spending time with you. Thank you both for your time thank today. You. Well, I, love you. Your, I love your show. Oh, well, thank, you very much. Kind. thank you very so much. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. Be well. Both Ron and Mel I, I also down. love your show and have listened for years when I was a oh. cameraman. I used to listen on that radio, oh, driving whatever you. the story was. By the way, the do day. you know that if you do good work, you don't have to praise the show to get That's back right. on? Yeah. <laughs> Remember, our moniker is the truth. Our moniker is the okay. truth. You know, I'm trying good to, to see you both, gentlemen. Thank okay. you so much. We've been speaking with Mel Miller, founder of the Bay State Banner, and Ron Mitchell, who is now the paper's editor. We thank both these gentlemen for coming in. We really appreciate it. Thank Coming you. up, we're going to talk with our colleague, Paris Alston. Yes, we are. She's been covering this whole event. She's going to tell us what's going on, what to go, what to see. You're all right there? Don't step on that. When Thomas Green went in for surgery to relieve pain in his legs, he was expecting it to be covered by his insurance. But a mix-up by the provider left him and his wife with a big bill. My initial response was, this is impossible, so something's wrong. I'm Juana Summers, the fight to fix those charges. On All Things Considered, from NPR News. Today at 4, here on GBH News 89.7. Funding for our programs comes from you and the Museum of Science. The journey to Mars starts here. You can experience all things Mars online and in person. The journey begins at mos.org slash Mars. And Sullivan Tire and Auto Service, family owned and operated, committed to keeping New England drivers on the road for over 68 years. You can visit SullivanTire.com to make an appointment and they'll be ready for you when you arrive. Welcome back to Boston. You know, Jim Browdy and Mark Regan, lucky enough to be broadcasting live from the 114th NAACP National Convention, the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center. We're inside the hub, as it's called. We're also streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. And I should say, I want to reiterate what Tanisha said, Michael said before. This convention is open to everybody in this community, not just NAACP members. And if you care about the issues that we've talked about, the issues you know they're going to be addressed in the next several days, the issues that unfortunately are consuming much of our national dialogue, I would say this is the place to be. And uh, you weren't here yesterday. You know what the wonderful thing was? We're waiting for Paris Olson, our colleague, to join us in a second. Uh, uh, Arlene, and Arlene called. It turned out it was Arlene Isaacson, who is one of the most important LGBTQ advocates this state has ever seen. It was our final call yesterday with uh, uh, Andrea Cabral. And she said something I thought was really simple but great. What? Is everybody should go out of their way when they see a delegate from the convention to go over to them and say, we're really happy you're in town. Welcome to Boston. I mean, do an individual thing to make this a welcoming experience for people who are delegate. kind enough to... I assume they're going to be wearing a thing. Like, you ever been to a convention in your life? Well, I've been to a few. Jim Browdy, GBH. Okay. You've All never right. been to a convention in your life? No, I've been to conventions. I didn't know everybody had a little name tag. but Well, maybe they didn't give they you do. a name tag. Do you know what I mean? I think name tags should be on your forehead. I like otherwise that. Otherwise, you have to look down to get the name of the person that whose name you forget, Jim. A little bit later in the show, we're going to talk to Mayor Wu. We are going to talk to another one of our colleagues, Philip Martin, who's here. One of the leaders of AXO, which you heard described before by Tanisha Sullivan, which is a fabulous thing that's been going on that is huge for teens in this movement. Amari Paris Jeffries, 
from the embrace, Colette Phillips, who has been working on these issues forever, and two of the great vendors uh, uh, who got contracts here, who are doing wonderful things, who I think can be part of the change force of this uh, of this uh, convention. Do we know where Paris is, or do we not know? Oh, she's doing this on our headphones? Oh, I thought she was oh. here. Paris, are you with us? Oh, I'm so oh. sorry. Hey, Paris, how are you? thinking about name tags on forums. <laughs> well, don't you think? I mean, it makes sense, right? You have to look down at Absolutely. the person's chest you can look to right see their the name. Place. They know what you're doing if it's on the forehead. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> oh well, well, listen, y'all. I'm here. At, folks are already lining up. I love what you were saying about uh, this being open to the public because people are ready for this convention. I've run into a number of people who are very excited to get in here and to experience the Hub, which is a free interactive experience opening up to the public at two o'clock. Uh, while I was out in the front hall, I spoke with two young people, um, Madison Dotson and Maya Harris, who are here visiting from Kansas City for the convention. It's really nice. Way nice than I expected. But <laughs> yeah, I hear. What were you expecting? Say it, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting it to be like, you know, nice buildings and all yeah, that. I expected it to be a little bit lower down, but it's, yeah. it's really nice. <laughs> I think there's more there, Paris, is so, all I can say. So right? World-class city. <laughs> they thought they were coming to a dump? Is this really what they were saying here? They were like, we only heard about the big dig. We don't know what happened after that. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, that's a riot. Yes. That's a riot. Absolutely. So, did you find out where they're staying? Are they staying in a nice hotel? I don't know where they're staying, Marjorie. Yeah, I mean, maybe they are staying in one of these nice buildings, possibly down in the seaport. But I know one thing that folks are driving are, are people to check out all of Boston outside of the convention. Um, in fact, later this afternoon, uh, starting at 1 o'clock, actually, there's going to be a tour through the city's black neighborhoods, Dorchester, Roxbury, and Mattapan, where people are going to be able to experience places like Nubian Markets, which I know yes. you two are familiar with. Yeah. Yeah. We had Esmael on, who's one of the founders of it. It's a great operation. I'm so glad they're doing that. You know, uh, 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 I don't know. I, people are just beginning to trickle in, so maybe it's too early to ask that. We've talked a lot about the reputation of the city. We mm -hmm. unendingly talk about that humiliating, horrible survey from 2017 where Boston was picked as the least welcoming city in America by mm -hmm. African Americans across the country. Do you get even a preliminary sense from some of the conventioners with whom you've spoken about any trepidation about coming to Boston in 2023 or... Or is there that yes. feel not there? So, really? I mean, it's definitely a mix, Jim. I, I spoke with someone who is part of NAACP earlier today, and she was telling me how she came to visit uh, a friend in, I believe it was 2009, and she was... You know, she was like, where are the black people out? Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> it's a little cold and icy here, right, in more ways than one. But at the same time, I spoke with some young people from the AXO competition yesterday, and they were just saying so many great things about the experience they've been having in the city thus far, just being greeted with lots of warmth and smiles. So what do you think? I mean, you've been, I, I know you're from North Carolina, right? I am, Southern yeah. girl. Uh, but you've been here for how long in Boston? Six and a half years. So, so what do you think? I mean, there's been a lot of talk uh, from, you know, Michael Curry, Tanisha Sullivan, people we've talked about, that this is going to make a difference here. You've been here six and a half years. Mm -hmm. You cover the news. Do you mm -hmm. think we're being overly optimistic or they're being overly optimistic? Or do you think, is, you think there's some lasting uh, change that can come from this? What do you think? I, I do think that's the case, Marjorie. I mean, part of it is the visibility, right? I mean, yeah. putting Boston on the national stage with a convention with the magnitude that this one has is really important. And that comes off the hills of things like the Boston Wild Black Family Reunion that we just had last weekend. I had a friend back home who sent me a video of it and was like, did you know that this was going on? And I was like, yes, girl, I'm out here. <laughs> and then, of course, we had the um, unveiling of the Embrace the monument to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Karata Scott King earlier this year. And so that reputation is turning around. I do feel that way. And I think, uh, you know, Boston, its blackness is finally getting on the national map. Yeah. By the way, Amari Paris Jeffries, who runs the Embrace with some mm -hmm. other great leaders, is going to be with us in about 10 or 15 minutes to talk about exactly what Paris just mentioned. And you know what's great? When you do see pictures of the Embrace, whether it's on TV or in the paper or something like that or online, a lot of people 
are down mm-hmm. there looking at that thing. And a lot of people are inside it, you know, looking up, which is really kind of cool the way you look I up. I can't believe you said that the most. I've said this before. I've done it two or three times, stopped on Tremont Street, often with my younger daughter, early evening. And when you stay at nighttime, when you stand below the embrace and look skyward, it is really beautiful. All this BS from a couple of people who are upset about it at the beginning is such a beautiful monument yeah. to the kings, I think, and so important for the city. You know, I never asked you, what do you think of the embrace, Paris? You know, honestly, I think it was, uh, it may have been Leslie Jones who said this, but it, someone said this, and I stand by the feeling that it is an erotic piece of public art, and I think that is okay, right? I mean, I know it wasn't necessarily <laughs> oh, intended to be that, but... I love you, Paris. <laughs> no, Leslie Jones That's said great. far more... We're living through a sexual revolution. Uh, uh, beautifully put. <laughs> hey, Paris, we'll talk to you a little bit later. Doing Sounds great work here. Paris Sounds Olson, great. You colleague. too. Hey, thank, thank you. Care. Thank Thanks. you very much. I love that. We've been talking to Paris Olson, who is our morning news anchor here at GBH, and she's covering all the doings of the convention, and we're very glad she took some time from her reporting to be with us. Okay, up next, we're going to talk with a 25-year-old aerospace engineering PhD candidate, TikTok influencer, woman in STEM. Naya Butler-Craig is with us. Our first question is, what is an aerospace engineer? <laughs> She's going to be here in just a second. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 uh, GBH. We are broadcasting from the NAACP convention down in the seaport in Boston. Boston Public Radio. You're listening to us broadcasting live. That's Marjorie Egan and me, Jim Browdy from the 114th NAACP National Convention of the Boston Convention Exhibition Center. It's inside what they're calling the hub. We're also streaming live on youtube.com slash GBH News. You know, a major message from the convention, as we've heard more than once earlier in the show, is about lifting up and supporting the next generation of leaders. Part of that is through something called the Afro-Academic Cultural, Technological, and Scientific Olympics. Act so. Tanisha Sullivan was so excited about this before, she almost exploded when she was talking <laughs> about it. And we're joined now by Naya Butler-Craig. She's 25 years old, working towards her PhD in aerospace engineering. When she's not working towards her degree, she's posting about aerospace engineering to her tens of thousands of TikTok followers on her account, Astro Naya. Naya Butler-Craig, it's great to meet you. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's a we're pleasure. Thr- we're yeah, thrilled to have you. Thank you for being here. So, I, as I just said, my first question, because I'm someone who had to take physics for poets, because I really couldn't do anything <laughs> having to do with math or science, but I, I really don't know. What does it mean to be an aerospace engineer? Does that mean you're going to be building rocket ships? Is that what that is? It's exactly that. Um, so so you're are- a rocket, are you a rocket scientist? It sounds cliche and, and funny, but yes. <laughs> so, oh, there is such a thing as a rocket scientist. Apparently. We have it right here. We just met her. So, so yes, that means you study how to do these things. Yes, ma'am. Right. We, yeah. we study. We try to optimize those vehicles so that we can use them for a long amount of time. And uh, aerospace tends to be divvied into two different sections. So there's uh, things concerning our airspace and things concerning outside of our airspace, in space. And so my focus is actually in astronautics, which is the space industry. Wow. You know, would, no. would you ever want to be in space? I do. One of my life goals is to be an astronaut, actually. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> By the way, no, I, I knew Marjorie was going to get this off track. As soon as she saw what you did, I knew this was going to happen. I want to get back. Michael Curry, who's on the national board, is on our show every week from the NAACP. He's been talking about AXO, I would say, almost every week in anticipation yeah. of this convention for weeks, if not months. Wow. Start at the beginning, though. What is AXO and what's the goal? What's the intention? To be honest, this is my first time being involved with AXO, so I was really, really confused when I got asked to be on the panel, but from what I've heard is exactly what you said. There's some brilliant, brilliant students, the next generation here. They're coming up with all kinds of different technological things, and and they're here to present that and compete to win. I don't know what they win specifically, but um, I know for the STEM Innovation Lab that I'll be speaking in, our goal is to continue to encourage them to seek STEM opportunities and STEM 
STEM careers after their youth because there's just it's so ripe right now and I think that that brilliance is what we want to continue to feed to society. You know, to stay in the STEM or STEAM world, however you want to, whatever acronym you want to use, we've talked a, a decent amount through the last couple of years about how the discrimination against women in those. How about how are people of color, young people of color, welcomed if at all in those that realm? I would say it's definitely improving. I started my undergrad career back in 2015, and so, I mean, it's been almost night and day to what um, I've just kind of witnessed as far as numbers go, and numbers of black women and black people in this aerospace industry specifically. Um, even when I started grad school, I was one out of like 600 in the grad program in aerospace engineering. Now I'm, I think I'm, I think I'm seven. There's seven of us now. And wow. so it's it's a it's a very it's a creeping thing. But my my biggest kind of message about recruiting black talent is to make sure that you can retain it. And so what we tend to have is you have recruitment without retention, and you are bringing people into systems that don't support them, and that breeds burnout. That brings people leaving the field. And I believe that's one of the biggest challenges right now is facing black students. You know, can we talk about that growth in numbers for a second? Sure. Describe the feeling when you're the one, mm. as opposed to you're surrounded by people who are like you in a an industry in an area that you care about. What's the what's that feel like? My goodness, being the one is extremely isolating, as you would imagine. Um, not just because the work is hard, but because the interpersonal relationships are also hard, and you don't know how to navigate those a lot of the time. Especially, I'm a first generation college student, and so I came into completely new territory. But the first thing I did in undergrad was join NSBE, which is the National Society of Black Engineers. And that's where I got introduced to all the other people that look like me in the yeah. field. And when I tell you that made, oh my God, a world of difference just because I had somewhere to really be myself. And when you're the one, you're afraid of doing that. You, you think you have to assimilate and conform to what you think a scientist should look like. But when you see people that look like you, you can really let loose and just be yourself and also do hard technical work. Well, so. you know, you, you, you talk, we introduced you, you have a lot of TikTok followers, tens of thousands actually, and what you're posting about is aerospace engineering. So if you've got tens of thousands of people, there's a lot of interest in what you're doing. Absolutely. Um, I would say people are definitely interested. Like, we've never had a, I don't think black students have ever not had an interest in the space industry. It's just been a matter of opportunity and access. And so that's why I posted TikTok is to one, show that I'm tangible. I show you everything I've done to get to this point. So if you want to follow it or take it as a guide rail, then do so. Um, and, I, and I think that that's really the grab as far as my, my platform goes. And we should say too, Axos, uh, a lot of these students are competing for scholarships and other rewards. But it's besides, it's not just STEM. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, Humanities, it's essay writing, playwriting, drawing, Cooking. filmmaking. Yeah, so it's it's the full range yes. of kind of things that, that people can do. How fun is it to talk to some of these kids? Oh my goodness, it's it's eye opening. One just because their ideas and their world view and vantage point makes them so valuable to the technological industry because you have to stay fresh to stay on the cutting edge of technology and they have such fresh perspectives and I, I mean I just love hearing from young people who are interested in STEM because they will think of something that is totally different from what we're used to what it's totally different than like what's traditional or status quo and it can answer some really hard problems in engineering and science so it's, we're it's talking, enlightening. We're talking to Naya Butler Craig I'm gonna go back to, uh, I'm gonna fall prey to what Marjorie started with describing your skills in your bio, listen to what her research is, Marjorie. Yeah, I, saw I want you to explain oh my God. this. Her research, this is Naya's research. Naya's research involves characterizing the electron energy distribution function at the inner front pole cover of a magnetically shielded Hall effect thruster with a central, I'm not done, with a centrally mounted cathode using laser Thompson scattering. Is that a fair description of what you do? That's, that's exactly what I do. You know, before you go, uh, I read that you're a fellow, a gem fellow at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Are you living in Georgia now? I do, yes sir. What is the anticipation of, we, we, most of America is waiting to see what Jack Smith, the special counsel, does vis-a-vis -vis the January 6th insurrection and what happens with Trump. And obviously the uh, Fonnie Willis, who's the DA in Fulton County, is apparently readying a pretty major, broad set of indictments, not potentially against just Donald Trump, but of some of his allies as well, for early August. What is that the talk of the state? I mean, what's it like in Georgia right now with this thing 
ready to explode, I think. Absolutely. I'm not in those conversations as far as the, po the politics goes. Um, honestly, one of the biggest things I've been passionate about is getting um, more pay to grad students. That's kind of been my focus. Uh, they <laughs> need more pay. That's real uh, they need more pay. But, I mean, I'll speak for myself as far as what I'm excited for. I, I, I think it's absolutely necessary, and I'm, I'm excited to, to see justice <laughs> be served, for sure. Naya, you're terrific. It's really great to meet you. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. I hope this AXO thing is as great as it sounds like this week, and thanks for your time. We really appreciate it. You know what else? You know, I thought the rocket scientist thing was a joke. Now we can say we've met someone who's actually <laughs> a rocket scientist, and I can tell everybody all about this. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you so in. much well, for Naya. having me. We've been so much. speaking with aerospace engineer Naya Butler-Craig, an actual rocket scientist. Scientist. You can follow her on TikTok where she's got tens of thousands of followers and Instagram and at Astro Naya. Thank you so much. In just a second, we're going to be joined by Embrace Boston President and CEO Amari Paris Jeffries. He's going to be with us up next. You are listening uh, to Boston Public Radio broadcasting live from the 114th NAACP National Convention at the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center. And we are streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. back to Boston Public Radio. Marjorie and Jim Browdy, I think you've picked up on the fact we're not at the library today. We'll be back on Tuesday. We're broadcasting live from the 114th NAACP National Convention, the Boston Convention Exhibition Center inside the hub. We're also streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. In anticipation of coming here, Marjorie and I have been talking the last couple of days, and the only thing that rivals this in terms of anticipation and excitement, I think, was the dedication of the yeah, Embrace just a handful similar. of months ago. We're joined now by, he's not a rocket scientist, but he may be the best dressed guy in Boston. <laughs> he's also the president and CEO of Embrace Boston, Amari Paris Jeffries. Amari, good to see you. Great to see you both. Oh, wait a second. Yeah. And a recent PhD for which we share our congratulations. Thank you. Now I am actually a rocket scientist. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Or can you some kind that? of scientist. Can you believe that? Some kind Amari, of it's good to see you. But I was wondering, I mean, we're we're not far from the embrace, but we're a little a little bit of a hike. So there must be some plans here about people going to visit the embrace. What's happening with, with uh, are there shuttles or taxis or yeah. Uber or what? Yeah, there's part of some tours around uh, the Embrace and the Black Heritage Trail, the Museum of African American History. And so, you know, we want people to experience Boston and, and not just be at the seaport and the convention center, although this is a great neighborhood. And so uh, Boston has a lot to offer. And I think there's even some things happening in a few of the neighborhoods that uh, we hope some of the incoming folks c go and visit. You know, as powerful as I know I speak for Marjorie as we think the dedication of the Embrace and its existence uh, is, even though Paris said that she does connect to those who talk about the eroticism. I don't know if you heard that a couple of minutes ago. You can discuss that with Paris if you well, choose it individually. it is an embrace between okay, a fine, husband and fine. a wife, so there yes. is a little it, erotic undertone to that, I You know, would it say. seems to me Let's almost so, as if anyway. it was planned, and I, know, I don't think it was. The one-two punch, for lack of a better expression, of the Embrace dedication in January, and then the NAACP convention with delegates from all over the country by the thousands and thousands coming here, even it seems to me sort of multiplies the message many fold. Am I, am I being unduly optimistic or no? No, I, I, think, you're, I think you're right. And, and remember when the conference, the convention was coming to Boston, there was no embrace. There was going to be a big hole in the ground. Well, that's a great so, point. So it's and symbolic and I think even more meaningful that three years later, not only do we have a, a different landscape in our city, a different landscape in our leadership, uh, uh, a, a city council. Perfect. You got it. You got good, it. Yeah. A, a city council that's super diverse. Um, we have an embrace, and so we, we are a different city than we were uh, when the convention was going to be here. No longer a hole in the ground, but filled with an embrace, uh, filled with love, and filled with meaning. You know, we spoke to you on the day of the dedication and saying 
if as great as the the monument to the kings and all they stood for was, if it was a one and done thing, obviously its impact would be far less than what you're planning. We talked about the, is it called the Embrace Center? Is that the latest name? I know the name has changed. Right now is the Embrace Center. Could be the Browdy Center, depending on, um, you know, we are. How much I donate, exactly. (laughs) Right, we are fundraising for it. So it's 31,000 square feet of museum, a music hall in the former, former site of Connolly's Tavern. So that was a famous jazz juke joint in Lower Roxbury, Boston, uh, and an uh, incubator small business center. And so we, we want to continue to work. We made three commitments uh, when we decided to build this monument. One is to build the Embrace. The other was to raise a million dollars for 12th Baptist Church and to donate to 12th Baptist Church. And then lastly, to build a center of economic development in Roxbury. And so we are well on our way. What's the timetable? And so we, the, the major partners are My City of Peace and HYM, so Tom O'Brien and Reverend uh, Jeffrey Brown. And so they just signed the agreement with the city. And so we imagine about 35 months from now, we'll be standing, you know, breaking a, a bottle of champagne and opening the doors. So you thought a lot about these kinds of things, what the Embrace can mean to Boston, what the Centric can mean to Boston. Um, Many people, Tanisha Sullivan, Michael Curry, talking about what this convention could mean to Boston. So being optimistic, well, I suppose you don't have to be optimistic, but what do you think it could mean to Boston? Yeah, you know, Jim Jim and I were, like, joking around yesterday at the opening event and, and, you know, talking about that, you know, the reason that, you know, Boston has a lot of conventions. This place sees a lot of conventions, but I think the reason that this convention is more meaningful to our city, because it's a, it's a test, right? And Boston has a reputation of not being a friendly place, being a racist place. Uh, being a place that does not have a significant black community, all the things that we know is not true. And I think yesterday when the chairman of the NAACP said there has been no greater welcome than what the city of Boston has extended to the NAACP, and the convention than the city of Boston. I, I mean, I, I was looking at you when, when he was saying that because I, I couldn't have felt more proud. So yeah. uh, it, it was an amazing moment. And I think it's it's not lost on all of us that what this convention means for Boston. You know, we just were mentioning this a couple of minutes ago, but every time you go by the Embrace, whether you're driving or walking or walking through the common or you see something about it on TV or the, online or whatever, there's always crowds of people there. It, usually there's a half dozen people inside it. So it's, it's apparent to me anyway that, that the embrace has is, is made its mark in just a very short time. What yeah, do you I, hear? Yeah, I think, I think it, it's doing what we hoped it would do. You know, earlier, a couple of weeks ago, the actor strike was outside of the embrace. Uh, yesterday, I saw a live music performance by young people who were at the Box Center City of Boston summer program performing at the Embrace. Uh, there's visitors, there's older adults, there's young people, there's children. And so it, it's meant to be the site that, you know, brings contemplation. Uh, it's a meeting point. It's a place of origin. It steps from the Parkman bandstand where King spoke. I think all the things that we wanted to be so far, it, it's uh, hitting the mark for us. You know, and when I, by us, I mean the city. One of the things I love about Michael Curry, who joined us at the top of the show and obviously was instrumental on the National NAACP board, former president of Boston chapter, to bring this convention here, he sugarcoats nothing, which I think is really important if you want to make change in this world. And I asked him a question at the top about, you know, change in the city, and he said, come on. There's still, ra- I'm paraphrasing, there's still racism here, there's still segregation here, there's still those kinds of things. Uh, We have a mayor of color. She's going to join us in about 45 minutes. The city council looks totally different than it looked even just a handful of years ago. But it still is a segregated city to a great degree. What breaks that logjam, Amari? I mean, all that's true, but you you have to remember that all of these these leaders, a new mayor, the city council, a lot of the civic leaders, uh, BECMA, Embrace Boston, Boston Wild Black, these organizations didn't exist in their form. Uh, a few years ago, and so we're 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 still in our freshman year, and so I think you know we want progress to happen quickly. Uh, we want it to happen fast, uh, and I think the result of the leadership in place right now is progress. And so folks have a lot to be proud. It was not easy. Uh, it was not overnight. Boston was one of the last cities to have a a diverse mayor, a black mayor of, yep. of major cities in the country. Right. And so we got to celebrate the progress. We still have uh, work to do, but the first thing about winning a championship is to get the players, the right players on the team in the right positions. So I think we're doing that. Speaking of progress, what's your Ph.D. in? 
It is in higher education administration. And so, you know, unfortunately, I just came back from the funeral of, of uh, 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 Keith Angela, Motley. Keith Motley's daughter. And, and yeah. Keith Motley, who, who is the longtime chancellor of UMass Boston, uh, a friend of mine. And so I have aspirations to one day follow in his footsteps and be a college president. And so higher education administration is, is what my degree in. As in, and uh, it, it was a lot related to my research interests were related to what we were doing at the Embrace, which were building socialization engines for change. And so that's what I studied uh, in, in my program. And so I hope to do that. It's also the one year anniversary uh, of my own wedding today. And so oh, I'm celebrating the first part. And so I'm bearing gifts uh, to you. Last time I was here, today? I brought <laughs> gifts. And so these are commemorative Embrace oh, coins. Thank you. Um, oh, thank you. By the way, you know, everybody is listening and saying how kind of him to do that. First of all, we weren't invited to the wedding. And when we found out <laughs> Michael Curry, was it Mexico? Is that what you remember? Yes. It, it, it was in Mexico. Okay, oh, he's, he's stuttering now. <laughs> Michael Curry calls us from Mexico on the show. I said, what are you doing yeah. in Mexico? I'm at this guy's wedding. I said, which guy? And he says, you. So uh, didn't you bring us a gift back from there because yes, you felt did. so bad? I, I, I did. I did. did. And, and, yep. and we have a dinner set up soon to, to celebrate on, on local soil. Do you need so my email or you don't need, do you need the email? I definitely need the emails and the phone okay, number. Fine. So we're, I'm, I'm you know, you're, there's a lot of pressure because you did that beautiful video with Janae Osterhoff from the Boston Globe talking about, you know, uh, marriage and falling in love. So pressure's on, I would say, Mari. It, pressure's, pressure's on. on. So we'll, we'll have our own celebratory Mexican wedding uh, <laughs> di dinner meal together, and then we'll go stroll to the embrace. Congratulations okay. on the degree, on the progress you're making with your organization. And it's great to have you here. It's good to see you, Mari. Great Thanks so much. Both. Be well. Thank you very, Thank very you. much for coming in. And congratulations on the, your anniversary and your PhD. See We've you, been Mar. speaking with Embrace Boston President and CEO Imari Paris Jeffries. Thank you very much for being here. And up next, we're going to start. We're going to talk to somebody who is well known to almost every single person in Boston. Yes, Colette she is. Phil Phillips. She's run businesses around here for years. We're going to talk to Colette Phillips. Up next, you're listening to Boston Public Radio, broadcasting for the 11th, for 114th NAACP National Convention at the Boston. Convention Exhibition Center and streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. A campaign that seemed to be aimed at opposing Boston Mayor Michelle Wu fell apart before it started, but it raised the question, will Wu face a serious challenge when she's up for re-election? I'm Adam Riley. This week on Talking Politics, we take a very early look at the 2025 mayoral race, plus what the national NAACP convention coming to Boston could mean for the city. Talking Politics, tonight at 7 on GBH2 and online at gbhnews.org. Our programs are made possible thanks to you and the Boston Speakers Series, announcing its upcoming season of seven evenings featuring Jane Fonda, Van Jones, former Ukraine Ambassador Marie Yovanovitch, and Congressman Adam Kinzinger, bostonspeakers.org. And Comcast Business, committed to providing connectivity for your business by offering cybersecurity, internet, and mobile solutions. Comcast Business, powering possibilities. Restrictions apply. Comcast Business, internet required. Trusted. Local. News. You're listening to 89.7 WGBH, HD1 Boston, online at gbhnews.org. GBH News with NPR. What matters to you. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Marge Regan. We're broadcasting live from the 114th NAACP National Convention, the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center, inside the hub. We're also streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. We're joined now by Colette Phillips. Everybody knows Colette Phillips. President and CEO of Colette Phillips Communications. Also founder of the GK Fund alongside Andre Porter, which provides capital, technology, and mentorship for BIPOC founders of startups and small businesses. And she has a new book coming out in January. We'll talk more about that in the days ahead called The Includers. Colette, it's great to see you. It's great to be here. Could you so raise your mic about an you inch? Perfect. How about Thank that? you. Perfect. That's perfect. Thanks. Thanks. So, Colette, when I, I w in anticipation of coming here today, I was reading a lot about uh, previous NAACP conventions and this line from Joyce Ferry about bowling, you know, political activist in town. She's been around forever. She's been involved in these different conventions. And she said 
she was saddened to be asked by uh, people who came here back in previous years, 82 and stuff, can we go to Charlestown? Can we go to Bunker Hill? Can we go to South Boston? And ba- basically, in the 80s, early 80s, that was risky business. But then I read about where your office is today. Where is it? In Charlestown. <laughs> in Charlestown. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, we have a long way to go, Welcome obviously. Welcome to but the that's, new Boston. Yeah, but that's something, no doubt, it right? It is. Yeah. It is. When I came to school here at age 17, I was told there are four places in Boston you should not go as a black person. South Boston, East Boston, Charlestown, and the North End. Yeah. Now, my office was, my office was on State Street, pre pandemic and um, I was like five minutes away from the north end so I used to go into the north end for lunch and now I'm in Charlestown so that's what a difference two decades have made. Do you have a view of the water in Charlestown? Can you see the water? No. No. Okay. Okay. (laughs) But you're close. It's close. You're close to the water. Okay. You know you've been working uh, I think as hard as virtually anybody. There's no story about an attempt to advance the profiles and, and, and work of people of color who are entrepreneurs in the city than you. You're in the center of every one of these for which you should, I'm sure, feel very proud. It seems to me, though, that, and we're going to talk to a couple of vendors who we spoke to the other day, Ricardo Pierre Lewis and Rose Sterham, who we talked to. It seems to me that this is a sea change moment on that front. The notion that the city of Boston and the NAACP itself decided with great intentionality to ensure that virtually every vendor at this convention is a black vendor is a huge moment for me. And But you'd know better than I, is I, it? I think it's a, it's a demonstration of leading by example. Because if this is one of the largest black civil rights organization and if they don't engage and hire black vendors, then they're sending a message to the white community. You don't have to hire black people. Yeah, but how sick were you through the years hearing leader after leader after leader say, I'd love to hire a people of color. Who but I can't business. find them. Can't find them. They don't have the experience. Well, the reason they don't have the experience is because you don't hire the, them. They don't get the experience. They so, can't build experience and capacity if you're not hiring them. So, well, this, I mean, I really do, again, I'm as cynical as the day is long. I said this to Rose and, and Ricardo the other day. It seems to me this is going to make a change. Come the end of this convention, you can't say that crap anymore, right? Well, And I think we would be remiss if we also did not give some credit to both Mayor Wu and Chief Shigun Idowu, who really made it part of their centerpiece to begin to break up contracts. And that started really with Mayor Janey, so that smaller business could have procurement of under a thousand, under a hundred thousand, or under five hundred thousand, because before small businesses and most minority-owned businesses are small businesses, and we all know small business are the economic engine. The people who are hiring, people who are innovating, are not the big companies. They're outsourcing to China and India, the Caribbean to do the work. The people who are really providing jobs are the small businesses. Well, you know what I found is so different and encouraging about the Wu administration? Not only that she's a young woman of color, she's a little out in her administration, people of color, they're young. And and it's like a whole different attitude of from the old boss into the new boss. And so talk a little bit about that. I mean, people that are my age, you know, we we saw some of the worst things. And but if you're 35 years old now, your, your view is so different. Exactly. A lot of that didn't touch those young kids. And they went to school with diverse people. Mm-hmm. So young white professionals don't have the kind of hang-ups that their parents or grandparents had. Because they, you know, and it, it's all about your social network. If you're interacting if you are having breaking bread with, get to know, you're dating across cultural lines. This is why I created Get Connected. Because 
people... Explain what that is for people who don't know. I should have even mentioned. I'm sorry, Colette. Explain what it is. Get Connected is a cross-cultural networking event I created 15 years ago to help break down the barriers because I was tired of going to rooms where either I was the only or there were less than five people of color yeah. in the room. And so, how did you do it? Because you, you, you've been in Boston for quite some time now. So how did you manage your communications business, um, given what you just said, going to a room and you'd be the only black person there, or one of five? How did you? Well, your charm, of- I guess, call it. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> but more than that, you know, it had, to, it had to be hard. Well, I have to say that Allyship matters. Yeah. I, I was fortunate to have uh, white males who were very open and receptive to giving a black woman the opportunity to work. And also, I think I was smart enough to say to companies as a differentiator, you are leaving money on the table yeah. if you're not marketing to black people, to Latinos, to Asians, to, you know, immigrants who might speak a different language. And it's like, bing, 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 ching, 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 ching. <laughs> you know, it's not about, it wasn't about the color of your skin. Yeah. Then. It was really about the green. The green. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you know? before you go, I know we're going to talk to you about this later in the year, The Includers. What are we going to see in this book of yours? The Includers is a book that really addresses why we need white men to step up and to also highlight and spotlight the white men across the country and in Boston who are working to systematically break down the barriers and the structural, um, systemic, racial differences to be, create a more inclusive world. People like Bob Rivers, like John O'Hanley at State Street, Tim Sweeney at Rivers Liberty is an Mutual. Eastern bank for those who do, right? You know, yeah, yeah. yeah, Liberty Mutual. Yeah. Uh, Tim Sweeney, the new president. Yeah. He started doing this work even before he became the president. And why do I know? Because I worked with him. Yeah, but I hope you, again, I, the book won't be out till January. Some white men did that because it was the right thing to do. Some white men did it because it was good for the bottom line. And a third set of white men did it because they were drag kicking and screaming to do it. Well, the you ones who are kicking and screaming are now the ones that are retreating from <laughs> diversity, equity, and inclusion because it just was a box check for them. Yeah. It yeah. can't be a box check if you live in a world where two-thirds of the people don't look like you. If you want to do business in China, India, Africa, Middle East, South America, you better have a team and a staff that reflects your marketplace. Colette Phillips, it's wonderful to see you as always. Always a pleasure. Yeah, to thank be you here. very Thanks much. Sir. Congratulations on your fantastic career. Really appreciate thank coming you. in. We've been speaking with Colette Phillips, President and CEO of Colette Phillips Communication. She's also co-founder, along with Andre Porter, of the GK Fund, which provides capital, technology, and mentorship for BIPOC, BIPOC founders of startups and small businesses. Mm-hmm. Thank you again, Colette, for coming in. Thanks. In just a couple of minutes, two people we had on the show earlier in the week. I wasn't there, but Jim was. Business owners Rose, St- Rose Stammer, Ricardo Pierre-Lewis, will swing by in just a few minutes. But first... Do you oh. recognize that guy over oh, there? Oh, I do. Oh, I was wondering what I was going to talk guy? to. Philip Martin, our colleague. Oh, that's Philip yeah. Martin. That's he's gonna, right. Oh, he's going to come talk to us now. He's okay, doing just that a first. minute for uh, for Rose and Ricardo. But right now, we're going to talk to our colleague, investigative reporter Philip Martin, who's been around this town for a while. He's going to give us his perspective. You're listening to Boston Public Radio. Uh, we are broadcasting uh, live from the uh, convention center down here in South Boston. I keep missing the page. Whoever we are, we're, exactly what we we're are. at the we're NAACP Public Radio. convention. And we're yeah, very happy about that's it. That's right. That's where we are, Jim. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. My pleasure.
Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. I am Jim Browdy. She is Marjorie. We're broadcasting live as we have all day from the NAACP National Convention, the Boston Convention Exhibition Center inside the hub. Also streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. And I want to reiterate what Tanisha Sullivan, the Boston chapter president, and Michael Curry, former Boston chapter president, now national board member of the NAACP, said, this is not a convention only for members of the NAACP. It is a convention for the people of greater Boston as well. If you care about the issues that are going to be addressed, if you care about the issues that we've been talking about for ages on this show, they're going to be the focal point of the discussions here. You should get on down here. Check out, just Google the convention. Check out the events that interest you most. And I hope you'll do what we're doing. It's coming on down. Speaking of coming on down, one of our great colleagues just did that. Philip Martin, Marjorie didn't recognize him at first, but then she did. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, he is here, a great investigative reporter and our wonderful colleague. Hey, Philip, how are you? Hey, Jim. It's Marjorie, how well, are you? Fine. But, you know, I, I, I think you got to Boston, what, mid-80s, something like that? That. I'm sorry. When did you when get, did you to get here? Mid Oh, I first I, I first came out to Boston in '75, and 75. then returned returned around '77. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, so you've been here. So yeah, you've I've been, been here, here for because the convention was the last NWC convention 82. was '82. So you've right. been here for a long time, and and uh, I've been here for a long time, and I remember covering a lot of horrible, horrible stories uh -huh. in Boston when I was a young reporter at the Boston Herald. But I wonder what your perspective is. I mean, are we being too naive and hopeful? Or do you think that, uh, that things have changed and they're going to keep on changing? You, you know, I don't know if you ever heard that Eddie Harris uh, tune, uh, uh, compared to what? No, I did. <laughs> And this, and it is compared to what? It's, I mean, 1982 <laughs> and 2023, dramatically uh. different. I mean, 1982, put, put yourself in a position in Boston uh, where uh, there is a firebombing of a black family yes. in Dorchester. Uh, and they uh, beg to be moved to a housing project because of the racial violence. Put yourself in the 1982 in a period where a young man named William, uh, Atkinson. William Atkinson is chased in Savin Hill yeah, by a group of young white men, yeah. and he's run over by a train. Yeah. Uh, 1982 was a year in which uh, there were about 119 arson fires in Boston, started by uh, firemen and police officers, who were later convicted in, in this case. 1982 was, uh, uh, George Chip Greenwich talks about uh, nighttime apartheid in Boston today. Again, compared to what? 1982 was extraordinary. You, we could barely go out at night in Kenmore Square or in or almost anywhere without encountering um, uh, a situation where you got into a fight or there were, were or where violence was, was threatened. There was so much racial tension you could cut it with a, with a knife. Compared to 1982, 2023 is very different. It's not to say these things have disappeared because they haven't. Have they dissipated? They have in many ways, in a lot of uh, obvious ways. 1982 was also a year of extraordinary um, gentrification. The South End essentially lost its personality yep. that was represented by Latinos, black people, uh, and uh, white people, and poor white people. And it didn't, the neighborhood changed dr dramatically. But it also, there was a period uh, where gentrification was having another impact where neighborhoods where black and uh, Latinos and others could barely go to at night, suddenly those were changing. Uh, it, because of the middle class trans transformation of, the, of East Boston, uh, the South End, South Boston, suddenly, starting in the 80s, you could actually start to walk into South Boston without fearing uh, for your life, ironically, because of the gentrification that was taking place. So you had an extraordinary economic displacement that was taking place against poor people. Many of them uh, Irish white people who were moving to uh, the South Shore and, and Italian Americans into Americans who were moving to places like Medford and Malden. Uh, and, uh, and the neighborhoods were becoming easier to navigate for black and, uh, and Latino people. Now this wasn't all happening in 82. It was starting to happen. Because you also had uh, in the city something called the Community Disorders Unit. Yes. Boston Police Department. What was it dealing with? Racial violence. It was dealing with the type of racial violence that gave Boston its reputation uh, for racism. In 2023, when you talk about at least one factor for measuring racism, 
in this country, which is segregation. Boston is not the most uh, segregated city in the country. My hometown of Detroit is. Uh, and, 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 and by other metrics, the most racist areas in the country include a large swath of Florida that is uh, run by a governor who's trying to shine the, uh, the chains of, uh, of slavery. slavery. Yeah, but hey, can I get back to your compared to what for a minute? Yeah. Compared to what? I'm sure you're right. You're much better at history and current events than I am, and you always have been. Having said that, this still is a very segregated city. Yes, well, we question. talked about this earlier in the show. And while there's been a progress on a lot of fronts, that's the most striking to me repeatedly, including coming down to the seaport. Adrian Walker wrote that fabulous piece during the series on racism about, I don't know, six or seven years ago about how unplanned the seaport was how few mortgages that were granted were granted to people of color. I mean, on and on. The other night I came down here and had dinner, and you look around you, this is like a new white city. That's and right. attached to this on the side is the convention center. So maybe Florida is worse, maybe Detroit is worse, but we still have a decent path to travel. And I'm glad you said that. And, and, and because, yeah, you could, it's compared to what, but in its relative state, it's still a, a very segregated institution, or, or city rather. Uh, you, Jim, you're, you're spot on. When you walk around the seaport, and the, and the planner should be embarrassed. The, there was the, no yeah. planning. The, the, no planning. The, 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 yeah. But the folks who allowed these buildings to go up without thinking about what you were building, they should be embarrassed. I mean, the fact that you can walk around the seaport and see people walking with their beautiful dogs uh, and, you know, and, and, and walking along the shore and thinking, wow, things are just fine, without seeing a person of color anywhere in sight. Well, that, that, I, that's, that's embarrassing when you consider yourself an open city and where some people don't even understand the issues of race because they feel like, wow, we, we, we've been nice to someone, uh, you know, or so on and so forth without understanding it's a lot deeper than that. It's systemic. Yeah. Yeah. Not to mention building all these buildings right on top of the water, you know, that, are, that you Buildings, are, buildings on top of the water. Yeah. And, and, and I, I find it interesting that <laughs> at the start of uh, Marty Walsh's administration, I actually drove around uh, with, uh, 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 with, with one of the heads of his new, um, what was transforming from the Boston Redevelopment Authority mm -hmm. to oh, something yeah. else. And he, and he said at that time, you're going to see uh, affordable housing here. You're going to see more people of color here. Uh, you're going to see uh, this neighbor, this neighborhood transformed. It's not to be, uh, and and, no. and we cannot talk about, of course, racial uh, demarcations and 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 segregation. We're also talking about the economic schisms uh, that are so. Uh, 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 prevalent in Boston that characterize Boston. Well, we also, I'm embarrassed to say, well, we've talked about that survey about how unwelcoming the city was to African-Americans across the country. We haven't mentioned once the the notorious wealth gap figures out of the Federal oh, yeah. Reserve. $8 for a black family, 250 grand, this is a bunch of years ago, for uh, a white family, Dominican family, Puerto Rican family, zero, essentially. By the way, the Fed with the Boston uh, Foundation and others are redoing those kinds of things. But that's also from having spoken to Michael Curry, not today about it, but in the past, it's also something they're hoping to zero in the next few days. My optimism, and you know me well enough, Philip and Marjorie, clearly does, I'm the least optimistic person <laughs> Ever. But yeah, that's, uh, that's not uh, entirely about true. About anything, <laughs> building's but, gonna you know, collapse while we're you know, here. You know what, I, you know what I'm out. thinking? Uh, uh, I mean, even as the day is going along, uh, I'm convincing myself more. Not that all of a sudden a week goes by and we've all had an epiphany. We spent a couple of weeks in anticipation when Amari was here. I was thinking about it of uh, the Kings and what they had done for this country and for this city. That was a good thing, and we floated away afterwards like we always do. We spent a week or two in anticipation of the NAACP convention talking about the NAACP, issues that affect people of color mm -hmm. in this country. We're going to talk about them, all of us, intensely, regardless of how we come from, where we come from, uh, for the next week while they're here. And it seems to me that not all of that dissipates, that when you spend that much energy focusing on major issues and problems that confront this country and the city, that some of it stays with you, and it does have a, a potentially changing effect down the line. Is that pathetically optimistic? No, I don't think it's pathetically optimistic. I think that there is a, a there are, you just had Colette Phillips on, on the show, 
She is someone, of course, who wants things to change. She's also a realist, though. She knows that there are some things that are, are not going to uh, change. You know, they are, they're, 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 they're not a static. But there, are, there are some things that remain absolutely impenetrable. And, I mean, and we know that just from the, uh, uh, the, the position of some individuals now who see a green light to oppose anything that uh, resembles diversity, equity, and inclusion. You have a hardcore group like that. And some of them, by the way, are in Boston. How do I know this? Or the Boston area? Because we're working on an investigation right now oh. where, where folks are, in fact, uh, 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 trying to entrench the anti-DEI uh, uh, ideology, concepts, programming uh, into some of our area schools. How about the exclusive <laughs> reporting you did a few months ago about the demonstrators outside the hospitals? Yeah. Well, that's right. Yeah. That's right. And, and, and th that was a more obvious example. Groups Are you like talking the, about Save Our City? Is that what you're talking about? Well, no. Uh, it, well, uh, I won't get into the particulars okay. of the okay. investigation, but you do have a situation where, uh, I mean, Jim, you just pointed out uh, where the neo-Nazis marched in front of a hospital demanding that the hospital basically end programs that address equity and so on and so forth. But I'm not even talking about those. A lot of people would not uh, ally themselves uh, for uh, reasons of respectability. Because it's too overt. It's too overt. Yeah. But, but it's more like uh, if you, uh, it's, I would liken it more to uh, the John Birch Society, where you had people who wore suits and ties and bow ties even, uh, and they considered themselves respectable. Oh, ties even. <laughs> and you see the John Birch Society, by the way, and some of their ideas are creeping into the very uh, policy papers of yeah. groups like Moms for Liberty. Uh, but they would not see themselves allied yeah. with the Ku Klux Klan because, again, it's too overt. It's too, it's too right. direct. Understood. But you do have a core ideological uh, uh, initiative that's taking place in the country that basically uh, pushes back against the pillars of progress, uh, in those pill including here in the Boston area. Your reporting has been terrific, and I know right. it'll continue. I to appreciate be. that. Yeah. Philip, it's great and to see you. We're all excited about Thank this you. new investigation. I didn't even Thank know you. about this. How'd you get one of those exclusive public media partner buttons? Oh, we get my, them. Our, our our GBH staff was amazing. They're giving I these love out. Those. Oh. Okay. And uh, I, of course, I grabbed two or three of them. I'm sure you did. <laughs> <for> family <laughs> and friends. Philip Martin, we hope we'll Martin. talk to you before the end of the show. My, Thanks the so much. Great investigative reporter here at GBH, Philip Martin. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us, Philip, and give us your perspective on everything. Thing. Now we're going to talk with two people we, uh, that Jim had on the show. I was on vacation. He had them on earlier this week. Business owners Rose Starm and Ricardo Pierre Lewis will swing by to talk about uh, something pretty exciting in the business world. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live from the, national, the NAACP National Convention at the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center in South Boston. We're also streaming on YouTube.com slash GBH News. When Thomas Green went in for surgery to relieve pain in his legs, he was expecting it to be covered by his insurance. But a mix-up by the provider left him and his wife with a big bill. My initial response was, this is impossible, so something's wrong. I'm Juana Summers, the fight to fix those charges. On All Things Considered, from NPR News. Today at 4, here on GBH News 89.7. Support for our programs comes from you and Subaru of New England. You can power your summer adventures in the all-wheel drive, all-electric 2023 Subaru Solterra. You can find your Subaru retailer at SubaruOfNewEngland.com. And the Children's Trust, managers of Safe Kids Thrive, helping youth-serving organizations keep kids safe from sexual abuse. Prevention plans at SafeKidsThrive.org. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Mardrigan and Jim Browdy. We're obviously broadcasting live from the 114th NAACP National Convention, the Boston Convention, an exhibition center. We're inside what's called The Hub, and we're streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. The other day I mentioned that a recent report by GBH, by the way, found that of the contracts the city had given out, I think it was up to 2021, 0.4%. Let me repeat, half of 1% went to black-owned businesses. Well, 
At this convention, things are about to change. Two of the vendors who are helping to make that change happen are with us today. You'll recognize, they were here a couple days ago. We almost never invite people back so quickly. We want an update a few days later. Ricardo Pierre Lewis is the founder and CEO of Privé Parking. He's also the treasurer of the United Neighbors of Lower Roxbury. Rose Therum is owner and founder of Rosemark Production in Dorchester, one of the largest vendors at the NAACP convention. Welcome back. Great to see you both. Thanks Thank for doing you. it. Happy so to be here. I'm going to so ask you some summary questions because Marjorie missed this. Rose has done events in Israel for thousands of people. Rose has worked with inaugural committees for presidents of the United States. Rose Theram, prior to these contracts, how many contracts did you ever have in Boston before? One. One, an itty bitty one from <laughs> what I understand. 64 events and less than 300K to do it. So yeah, pretty small. And how many yeah. years your business existed? I'm sorry, how many years? How many years your business exists? Uh, we're a business five, me in this position, 15. Fair enough. And, and Rose from Mattapan. So, I mean, local woman here having to go all over the country uh, for work. And, and, and Can I just bring them up to yeah. date on Ricardo? Because you weren't here I yet. saw Ricardo's very handsome picture in the paper. <laughs> well, I wanted to I tell was that story. He's coming in. Are you flirting with me on live? <laughs> Trying. Maybe she is. So, Ricardo, you've had this valet business thing. But your, apo your approach, I spoke to him about it last night, uh, the head of economic development for the city, Shigoni Doho, and asked you if you can deal with the transportation for seven to 10,000 conventioners. And you didn't have the capacity, but what did you do? Um, I had to think outside the box. Obviously, it was a perfect opportunity for us to get some exposure and show that we're capable of doing this. Um, so what I did was I said, hey, listen, we may not have uh, the capacity, but we have the network and the relationships and the partners. And so I went out, uh, contracted uh, a motor bus company, and it was a great partnership. It made sense. And we came in and uh, put a, together a competitive proposal and won. And now you can do that. And now we Not can just do that. here, but next week and the week after. Oh, yeah. That's okay. the goal. So, yeah. so I wasn't there when, when you spoke before, but, but uh, this has always amazed me. The excuse always is, well, you know, there, there are no uh, companies, uh, black-owned companies or women-owned companies. Obviously, there are. So what did you think during this time that you were gallivanting around the world but not getting the business here? What did you think? I was sad. Um, yeah. I, I told Jim that I thought about moving uh, many times with my family base is here. Um, I think that's the excuse is that minority owned businesses don't have the capacity, we don't have the money, we don't have the foundation, um, yet my company did and we still didn't get the contracts. And even today, we're at the convention center, we are a preferred vendor um, and we've gotten zero contracts until the NAACP has come into town. So. It's, it's, it's pretty sad. <laughs> so is it just plain old racism? I mean, wh what, what is it about? I think it's just a way of doing business. I think it's legacy contracts. I think yep. they get, you get used to using the same person. Um, and there's not a lot of businesses that I think have come into a space that they're ready to take on um, this type of events, but we are, and that would mean doing something different. And so I think people are just used to using the same good old boys. You know? Is it racism uh, there, Ricardo? Um, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough question to answer. Um, I think, like I said in our last interview, everyone has their own experience on contracting with the city of Boston mm -hmm. and getting contracts in the private sector here in Boston. Um, when, you, when you ask me that question, I kind of really uh, think about it. And what I would say is I think there is discomfort when it comes to working with black businesses here in Boston. Mm -hmm. we, there is not a long history or a pattern on what that looks like or a model to follow. And so when we're trying to open doors and come into these certain industries, it's very difficult. You know, I, I, if people are used to doing and conducting business a certain way yeah. and a new person or, or a new company like myself comes to the picture, it's how do I work with you? How do we make it work, right? Because it has to make sense. At the end of the day, we're all in business to provide a good service and to make money. But how do you do that when you're bringing in or working with a local black business. Well, it's also, uh, it's all about networking. You mentioned the old boys club. I mean, the hope, I guess, is there become a new boys and girls club. Right. Come, I mean, that is what the game plan is. Is, is it not, Rose? Oh, yeah. And I, I love that you say that because now that I'm a decision maker, I am bringing in the women and I am bringing in the people of color because at the top, it matters. And so those decisions that are being made at the top, they don't look like me. 
but now I am actually at the top, mm-hmm. and I can make make some changes. You know. Well, you know, we were just talking at Colette Phillips. Of course, it's run a communications mm-hmm. business, very successful one for years in Boston. She, it, I, I asked her about the difference in terms of the not only that Michelle Wu was a woman of color, but. Their, her administration is very young, mm-hmm. and that it's 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 a totally different um, attitude, I think, when you're 30 or 35 than when you're 60, right? Yeah. How do you see that that the the, the youth of this administration impacting business here? I mean, look where I'm at today. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm 34 years old. I'm here. I'm telling you about how we just was awarded one of the biggest contracts at the NAACP. Uh, you know, my team is all people of color from Boston. Uh, it's just, it's a new day. And this yeah. is, and this is, you know, an example of we're here and we're really doing it. And one thing I do want to stress is we just don't want to be a one-time vendor. Right. right. And I want to echo that and make sure everyone can hear me that's watching. And this is repeated to other people. We want to continue working with the convention center and other agencies out there to show that, listen, we can do this. Yes. And we're doing a pretty great job. Amen. You know, by the way, you know, I want to say now, uh, not only do we have you back two times in a week, let's make sure you come back in a couple of months and tell us after the NAACP has left town. What does flow from the experience here? You know, I wasn't going to ask you to tell the story again. It's the most beautiful story I've actually heard the whole week. But I wasn't going to mention it until Marjorie started flirting with you a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> can you tell the story about, where'd you go? Some diner or Mike something? Mike City Diner. After, in was it oh Shirley the Young Mike story? Mike City Diner. Yeah. It's a great yeah, place. City. Okay, by the way, we should give credit to Shirley the Young from the Globe. Yeah. She wrote the story yeah. that got us in touch with Ricardo and Rose. But uh, tell the story, Ricardo, if you can. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, there's, there's a diner that I, I tend to eat at um, three to four times a week. There's a woman there. Uh, she's in her 80s, uh, died, you know, born and raised in, in Roxbury. And we talk quite often, and she knows about how I'm trying to grow my business. And it's funny because we're always having conversations, uh-huh. and she's always talking about, well, you know, in the South End, we used to have trains above ground. And I was like, well, that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> uh, that's way before my time. So, um, But we joke. And... Uh, Last week, I mean this week, I, Tuesday, I walk into the diner, and I know exactly what time she gets there because we usually go to, uh, get in at the same time. And I walk in, and she just looks at me with this dumbfound look. And I'm looking back at her. I'm like, "Hey, you, you okay? Something's going on? Like, what happened?" And she starts clapping. And I'm like, "Why are you clapping? Stop! Like, why are you clapping? You know what's going on?" And she goes, "I saw you on the front page of the Boston Globe." Oh God! And she goes, "Not only you on the front page of the Boston Globe, you are above the fold." Now, my generation, we don't really read newspapers. We don't know what above the fold means or below the fold. I'm like, uh, is that like, you know, what does that mean? And she's like, that means you are top story. <laughs> and she goes, it really makes me proud to see that Boston oh. is on the verge of change. And this yeah. is proof right here. And I'm so proud of you, Ricardo. Awesome. And I was just like, thank you. You know, I didn't really realize how much of an impact that it had, not with just my generation, but with the older generation, yeah. right? And so I think it's just an exciting time. It's, it's, it's time for new faces, young talent, um, you know, young black talent to really show what we're capable of doing. And we're showing that right here, right now at this convention. That is a great story. Isn't great? I By the way, that's story, the voice yeah. of Ricardo Pierre Lewis. He's the founder and CEO of Privé Parking, and he's joined by Rose Theram, who's the owner and founder of Rosemark Productions. So, so in that, uh, uh, Shirley Lynn column that you, that you mentioned, uh, she pointed out that 90% of the businesses that are working at this convention are uh, black-owned businesses. So how do we judge going forward? If this has been the success that Michael Curry has talked about, Tanisha Sullivan's uh, uh, talking about, Jim mentioned having you back on in a few weeks and talking about this, but what does what success look like to you? I appreciate that question, and I had this conversation with Michael Curry this morning. This is great that the NAACP um, that is about advancing people of color has hired 90% of people of color, but what, what happens tomorrow? Yeah. You know, is it just when the NAACP comes in or the Urban Leagues comes in that we get opportunities, or does the convention center call us back does uh the world the trade center people that come in uh you know eastern bank and citizens bank do they give us contracts so i think it cannot only be black events coming in and hiring black people yeah that's where there's the wealth gap that's where all of the, all of the problems start so the success is going to be when we start getting contracts that we typically don't get and that's going to be the key. Like, 
next week what happens. So I appreciate you guys inviting us back so that we can hold people accountable, you know? It's great until everybody's gone and then it's kind of like, okay, we're back to square one, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, we're inviting you back because we want to attract this. We're inviting you back because we mm. figure we get a free ride and a free meal. <laughs> <laughs> so, you don't have to, but do what you think is right, you two. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we hope okay. it works out great in the next couple of days. You've been terrific to give us so much time. Lots of luck, and we'll okay. see you in a couple of months. Thank, thank you. you, Jim. Thank yeah, you both. Thank you very, very much yeah. for coming in, and congratulations on at least what's happening right now. We hope it continues. Thank We've been you. speaking with Rose Sterham, owner and founder of Rose Mark Production in Dorchester. That's Rose Mark Production in Dorchester. And Ricardo, P uh, Ricardo Pierre Lewis. No, actually, it's Ricardo Above the Fold, Pierre. Lewis, okay. I believe is the Ricardo name. Ricardo above the fair. I think it was a peach colored suit. What was it? What color that suit? It was like it was very nice. Founder and CEO of Privé Parking. Both are vendors at this week's NAACP convention. Thank you again Thanks for coming you. in. Coming up. Abba Blankson, Chief Marketing and Communications Officer for the NAACP. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. We've been broadcasting live from the NAACP convention down here at the National Convention, at the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center, and we're streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. On the International Roundup this week, a military coup in Niger, a wildfire emergency engulfs large parts of Greece, and the rise and fall of China's best-known wolf warrior diplomat. We wrap up the biggest stories from overseas next time on 1A. This afternoon at 2, here on GBH News 89.7. Support for GBH comes from you and the Peabody Essex Museum presenting As We Rise, photography from the Black Atlantic. This compelling exhibition celebrates black identity, community and power now on view. For tickets and more information, you can visit PEM.org. And the Massachusetts Supplier Diversity Office, helping small and diverse businesses grow by providing SDO certification and tools, including the Supplier Diversity Hub. Learn more at mass.gov SDO. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan. We're broadcasting live, as I figure you probably know by now, from the 114th NAACP National Convention of the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center. We're inside the hub. We're streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. In seven or eight minutes, we'll be joined by the current mayor of Boston. We talked to Marty Walsh before, Mayor Wu. Before that, uh, we've been criticized on text for not engaging you all in the conversation about the meaning of this convention, whether you are optimistic about whether or not this will bring some change, maybe in areas like vendors for in uh, uh, businesses owned by blacks in this community, maybe in other larger ways as well. Give us a buzz, 877-301-8970, or text us, if you will, at that same number, 877-301-8970. Would you say it's fair to say, it's not a scientific sample, the consensus of the guests we've been lucky enough to have today, Marjorie, is there's been a lot of progress, but anybody who suggests that racism and some level of segregation does not exist in the city is being naive, And but we should celebrate where we've come from, particularly since 1982, the last time the convention was here, acknowledging at the same time there's a hell of a lot of work ahead. Is that not what we've learned, or at I, least I think, what we've heard? I think that is, that is what we've learned. And, you know, um, we talk about the... Uh, of waterfront here being a largely uh, white home ownership kind of place. I guess our condos down here. But you know, um, we've been lucky enough to go to the Quinn a couple of times in the back bay of Boston. Yeah. And 
I think at the Quinn, which is a social club, it's a wonderfully important uh, point. which is uh, where the owners have made a, a big deal about trying to be more diverse in their in the people that that join that place. Um, I've seen more African Americans at the Quinn than I think I've seen in, in the Back Bay in most of my life, and I've been around here a long time. So there's whole sections of Boston um, that African Americans don't really go. To, and it's different. I think we've talked about this a lot in the show. It's different from your hometown of Philadelphia or Chicago or other big cities around around the country. So I'm hoping that's that's um, uh, going to change. And I, I don't know. I I, I want to be optimistic that that the this convention is going to be part of a change. But I think it's also... Can I just say, before you leave the Quinn, and by the way, we should give credit, Sandy Edgerly and her husband are the yes. owners of that. And, and and that didn't happen just by chance. They did it intentionally. In all seri- it was very intentional. Yeah. And by the way, we, in an impolite, uninformed way, almost ridiculed it we on did. the air we when did. we first read about it because based on the history of the city, we thought it wasn't going to happen. And we were wrong. And it's good you brought it up because it's an opportunity to apologize and say we're wrong. If you do it with intentionality and you're really committed to it, they have achieved it. They, I assume they'd acknowledge they have more to go to, but it is a, it really reflects to a far greater degree than most of the downtown what the city is really, uh, really all about. We've got uh, Siddiqui from Roxbury's on the phone. Hi, Siddiqui. Is this hey, Siddiqui. Siddiqui? I've talked to him so many times over the years. Is this the same one? Yes, ma'am. How yeah. you doing? Hey, wow. good to talk to you. It's been a while, Siddiqui. What's up? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, when I first bo- met the both of you, I was just an infant. That's so. right. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm bummed. Thank we were you. very precocious infants, so they were already tackling the uh, issues of the day. It's we good were to still hear from diapers. you, Siddiqui. What's up? Yeah, just very quickly, look. Uh, I've been listening in, and uh, first of all, you know, I'm the director of the Black Community Information Center. And, yep. mm-hmm. You know, we led the effort for the name change, the Nubian Square, and what have yep. you. And so uh, a component of the Information Center is the, uh, the Nubian Square Coalition. And so essentially, let, let me just say that uh, I've heard all the pleasantries in terms of, uh, quote-unquote, progress being made racially in the city of Boston. Look, it's, it's all a matter of measurement. Uh, in 82, the bottom line is that, you know, folks were told you can't go into certain neighborhoods or you could suffer physical harm. To say that the city has improved racially because of the fact that they can come now and not get assaulted is, is, is an improvement, but not within the context of the overall situation here in this city. This, you know, I talk to people all across the country. There's an organization I head up all across the country. There's still that perception. You know, you've got athletes that won't come here yeah. because of the reputation that Boston has. And it's well-earned. And let me just say this, that in many respects, well, let's, first of all, let's start off with the mayor. Uh, the, the, the relationship that our community has the black is very contentious with the mayor because she's been very disrespectful, whether it be about land disposition, giving away land in our community without... Hey, Siddiqui, can I tell you, yeah. this is a random sample. I haven't done a poll. I would say that in the last year, uh, of the black leaders who we've been lucky enough to have on the show, there has been practically unanimity, not without criticism, unanimity, that Mayor Wu has brought dramatic change to the city. So I would respectfully say, I think you're an out leader, liar amongst black leaders in this community. A right, but you'll know, have that designation. But I think if you talk to like the office of uh, City Council uh, Tanya Anderson and mm-hmm. her advisory uh, yeah. commission, uh, if you talk to folks in the community, and like I said, this issue around the John D. O'Brien School, yeah. how do you come in there as the mayor and say this is what we plan to do, and not even consulted uh, the community? Uh, in terms of the uh, what's saying the redistricting map that favored um, elected officials in the black community, and you had the white counselors who filed a lawsuit against it, the feds ruled against it, who do you think worked with them? Mayor Wall, uh, not Wall, Mayor, uh, Mayor Wu. Well, I, 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 mean, Mr. Dinky, I have to say, I, I hear you, and we appreciate your call. I just have, I think I'm working with a different set of facts. I respect your opinion, but I have to say that is sure as hell not what we've heard from most other black leaders in this community. Having said that, we're glad to hear from you. It's been a yes, long Siddiqui, time. Yes, thank you for Appreciate calling. It. Thanks so much. Speaking of the mayor of Boston, who was terrific last night at the welcoming party that Michael Curry and the head of DEI at the Encore Boston held, joining us on the phone is the mayor of the city of Boston, Michelle Wu. Welcome, Mayor. 
Hello. Nice to uh, talk with you. Hello, Pleasure. Mayor. Well, thank you for calling. Well, you, you may have heard a little bit of Siddiqui. He was complaining about the John O'Brien School, but I must say one of the themes that we've heard today, as Jim said, contrary to what Siddiqui was talking about, is that your administration is, uh, you're a woman of color, a lot of your uh, people are people of color in your administration, you're also a younger administration. So there's been some praise for your administration looking at things differently in this city. So. How do you see uh, this convention fitting into what you're trying to do in Boston? So, and first of all, I will say I am a big fan of Brother Siddiqui Kamban. Uh, he's, <laughs> he's been a, a long, long time activist yes. for the city, for the black community, for Roxbury. Um, and so I always hear his words very seriously and, and take them to heart. And we're always striving to do better. Um, many of the things that Sometimes seem, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to put big ideas out there, and they are not at all baked when they go out. But it is important <laughs> to um, send them out into the world so that we can receive feedback and, and we continue to try to do that in community. Uh, but this is this next week, uh, already kicking off last night, as you, as you mentioned, Jim. Thank you for being there. Yep. Um, is just a huge, huge opportunity for the city of Boston. It's been several decades since uh, we had the honor of hosting the national convention, and now it's been five years in the in the planning for uh, this very special event. And you know, from the local walks out into Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan that are happening um, later today, to the opening reception and lots of incredible events featuring young people through the AXO competition yeah. or every generation of the city. Uh, we're, we're really excited to uh, take full advantage of the impact that this brings to our local economy and then keep that impact going long after the convention is over. Can you address that? I, I think the most common question that Marjorie and I have asked today or guests are brought up is what is the impact on the perception um, America has of uh, particularly black America has of our city going forward. We've cited ad nauseum this, this poll from 2017 where black Americans saw Boston as the least welcoming of eight major American cities. And the second thing we've talked about is what you just touched upon, how, if at all, Boston itself is different come a week from now when the delegates leave town. You seem to think it will be different in some way. How and why? Yeah, I mean, we are known nationally um, under several different, sometimes conflicting um, pathways, right? We're often talked about as the birthplace of democracy, where the movement for abolition and civil rights and marriage equality and the beginning of free public education and free public libraries and parks, you know, so much of that is in our spirit of really trying to move forward in a future that includes everyone at the same time as our moments of intense racial division, tension, hate crime, um, being known nationally, whether it was everyone w watching the visuals of school, forced school desegregation in Boston mm -hmm. because our own school committee refused to do it. Um, or various um, accounts that have come out of uh, athletes or professional um, sports teams' experiences here. And so we, we, have, we carry a lot of that complex history as a city that, that has so much resonance uh, nationally and, and internationally. And I think our responsibility today um, in every community, but especially with the... the trust and weight of this convention with the black community is to highlight where we are today and also what we are striving towards. It's, it's, there's no question that we're in a very difficult time as a country. People's rights are being rolled back. There's a new assault that we're reading about every other day from the federal level or, or people saying nonsense about how enslavement actually was uh, potentially benefits. I mean, just crazy stuff happening around yeah. the country, and Boston really has the responsibility of stepping out and from the city level on up, showing specific action steps that we can take to move forward, even in this very difficult time. And so this convention is changing Boston, not only through the process of really coming together to assess where we're headed and how we put our best foot forward in this time and then keep it moving forward, but the impact of 
black vendors, um, businesses that are receiving the vast majority of the, the business and the contracts associated with this convention, who are some of them now expanding into new areas and, and all the work that's happening from various anchor institutions around the city trying to also do our part to accelerate this. Um, it's a commitment that has to last long beyond uh, the, these next two weeks. You know, kind of, uh, on that one note, we just had uh, two uh, vendors with us, uh, Rose Therum and Ricardo Pierre Lewis. And I, I think both of their stories are important. Rose, who's done work around the world and had virtually no contracts here. And Ricardo, when he was reached out to around transportation by Shagoon, your economic development person, who didn't have the capacity to do what Shagoon was asking him to do, and historically that meant he wouldn't get the contract, showed creativity in concert with your secretary, and they found the partner, essentially, and now he's transporting seven to 10,000 people around the city for the next week, which seems to me to break down all the crap we've heard about how people of color-led businesses don't have the ability, skills, or experience to provide the needs of the city and its conventions, don't you think? Yeah, we're really proud and um, determined that our team is, is here to usher in a new approach about how the inertia of systemic forces that, you know, yeah. for, for various reasons had, you know, through connections that were built up, um, mm -hmm. kind of self-sustained, that we have to find ways to take those same systems and open them up to everyone and really direct them to creating opportunity for communities who have been left behind and have through policy and uh, specific actions been mm -hmm. historically marginalized. And so, you know, even if you look at the seaport where you all are and where this convention is, the, the bulk of the convention is taking place, even just a couple of years ago, had this convention occurred when it was originally supposed to be scheduled in person during in 2020, the seaport would have looked completely different. Even in the last couple of months and, and year, we have seen black-owned businesses, businesses owned by people of color and women starting to move into the vacant spaces and just a greater commitment across not only the public sector, but the private sector, uh, philanthropic and nonprofit partners, that this is a, a responsibility we all share, but an opportunity that everyone benefits from when the various parts of our city reflect all of, all of our communities. And just a couple of days ago, we were making an announcement uh, about a program that Chagrin is also, uh, Chief Idawu is also leading um, called our Safe Grants, where federal recovery dollars are going to um, supporting small businesses, but not just getting by. Uh, small businesses owned by women, people of color, um, many of them black-owned businesses, who are looking to expand into those downtown and yeah, high-foot traffic about that. areas. It's great. So we continue to broaden um, who's reflected in every part of our city. You know, before you go in 30 seconds, I mentioned the event last night. In addition to being an important meeting to start this whole thing, for me at least, it was a huge amount of fun. Do you, do you allow yourself to have fun at these things, or do you just have to be mayor? I think I didn't stay out as long as you did, probably. I had to go, to go to bed. Um, but I heard it was, it was, it was, it was it's always amazing to see everyone. Uh, the setting there was beautiful. Was uh, I, I didn't stay out long enough to go dancing and everything, but <laughs> there, will be, there will be time. We have our opening reception tonight. I know that. We have a public meeting on Saturday, and so the city's hosting lots of events, our culture nights, gospel fest. So we hope to see everyone there and we'll Great. have lots of fun in addition to all the hard work. Michelle Wu, thanks yeah, well, for making thank time. Thank you very we much really for joining it. us. Yeah, we, yes, we thank really do. So we much. appreciate it. That was the voice thanks. of Michelle, uh, Boston Mayor Michelle Wu. We thank you very much. Uh, we thank her very much for joining us. And we're going to close this out. We're going to talk with our colleague, Paris Alston, for the last couple of minutes before we... And that uh, other guy. Oh, they're both coming back. Both are colleagues. Okay. <laughs> Philip and Paris are both here. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live from the... Uh, NAACP Convention, the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center, and we are streaming on youtube.com slash GBH News.
Public Radio. I am Jim Browdy. She is Marguerite Egan. We're closing up three really important hours for us, and I hope for you. We were lucky enough to broadcast live from the 114th convention of the NAACP. Joining us for the final few minutes are our colleagues who are going to be working around here throughout the convention, too. Paris Olson and, what's, and the other guy. What's his... And the other guy. The other guy. Yeah. Was, yeah. Oh, Philip Martin. 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 That's right. The other guy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And Paris, you and Jim are going to big uh, get tomorrow. You're gonna whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. We don't talk about that yet. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank I you. I didn't know that. Okay, Almost. forget about that. But let me tell you. Marjorie, you what big, you talking about? I, <laughs> I, I'm not supposed to talk. I didn't know that was supposed to be a secret, but okay, we're very sorry. impressed, so I won't ask you about that. So, anything else you'd like to tell us, Paris? <laughs> well, <laughs> well I will say something Philip and I were talking about offhand there. I mean, we know that this is a big moment, obviously, uh, for Boston, right? And I was telling Philip how I, I live in Dorchester in Grove Hall, uh, which is a predominantly black and brown neighborhood here in Boston. And and when we think about, you know, you've asked this question a number of times today, Marjorie, is, is this change? Is this change that we keep talking about really happening? And I, I will say, it, it, in places like Grove Hall, it's happening, but it's very slowly. Yeah. And um, the change that is happening there, right, is gentrification. And that's happening very, very quickly. And so I think it's just an interesting perspective to keep here um, about how even just not even that far away from this convention center, there's still so much more to be done. Yeah, and gentrification is not necessarily a great thing. Correct. Uh, yes. So, <laughs> Philip. So, what do you look forward to? Uh, uh, what indicates to us, let's say, in a month or two months or four months, that this convention had more of an impact than a big financial one for seven days and an opportunity for some serious conversation and fun? Fast forward a half a year, let's say. How do we know this mattered? It has to be. It has to be the substance of change rather than the rhetoric of change. And the reason I say that, if we get back, if you go back to uh, uh, 2020, when you had 24 million people on the streets of the United States and around the world protesting after the death of George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd, uh, in a in a COVID year, a lot of people were skeptical that the changes that were being implemented at that at that time would last, particularly around uh, corporate pledges to increase their staffing and to mm -hmm. uh, hire and to any number of pledges that were made. That skepticism apparently was warranted because we're seeing, for example, a major retreat in DEI, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, not just as policy, but as, as actual efforts uh, in corporates, corporations, mm -hmm. universities, schools around the around and, the country. And on the ground level, yeah. a diminution in public support, particularly among white Americans, That's right. for those policies. Precisely. And so what you don't want to see uh, uh, two months from now is that type of diminishment, that type of, um, uh, that type of dis that disappearing act, which occurred in 2020. Mm -hmm. Over the course of a year for 2020, 2021, and then to 22 and 23, you saw uh, a diminishing commitment to those things that people were firmly committed to or seemed to in the, after the death of George Floyd. And we know our distractions have come back, right? I mean, the thing about George Floyd, it happened during a pandemic. The world was at a standstill and you couldn't right. ignore it. And now we see all of this pressure to get back to normal, whatever that is. Um, and, and people are... are allowing themselves to forget a bit. You know, we only have a minute left. Uh, Philip is not a fun kind of guy. That's pretty obvious, isn't <laughs> it? He's very dumb. And I listen, very very dumb. I listen he to your show. He's on the weekend. He is? <laughs> I listen to your show every morning. It's pretty clear you're a fun kind of gal. Oh, yes. So well, do you think this next it. week is going to be fun in terms of, oh, in addition to everything else? Oh, 100%. Have yeah, you heard about the parties? I have heard about <laughs> yeah, the parties. I have gotten like six different invites. I'm like, I can't make it to all these parties, y'all. So. I haven't gotten a single invite. What's with that? <laughs> You can all, we will all go together. By the way, check the agenda. It is true. There's a lot of important business and there's a lot of important fun with this really important gathering that's history making after 41 years. And you also Quickly. have jazz. You have jazz here in the, yep. in the Seaport. Right. Well, let's, yep. let's, let's remember that. Just within a block of this place. Okay. You have Great to see you both. Thank you so much, Good luck here. Good time. We thank you very much to Paris Austin for coming in and for Philip Martin for coming in well as well. Keep up with us 24-7 way of our podcast. We're going to be taking some conversations over the weekend to air on Monday that you are not going to want to miss. I almost blew it previously, but you Paris did. stopped me. Thank you very much, Paris. Thank you, Paris. Linda Dorsina Forey is going to be with us. The Reverend Zion Monroe and Emma G. Price III, NPR's TV critic Eric Deggins, and food policy analyst Corby Cummer. We want to thank our crew 
Zoe Matthews, Aidan Conley, Nicole Garcia, Hannah Loss, additional support from Shay Sullivan, our engineer John the Claw Parker, our executive producer Jenny Bologna, and enormous staff to the entire GBH news team, marketing, engineering, including Glenn Heath, Cy Patel, Chris Kelly, Matthew Glover, Jackie Kelleher, Sandra Lopez Burke, a Terry Quinn, Eddie Hickey, Chris Hanks, Gary Mott, a bunch of other people, Steve Baracci, Colin Cockrell. Thank you to everybody. Stay tuned to youtube.com slash GBH News for more GBH content. Basic Black and a conversation on reparations. You're listening to Boston Public Radio. Thanks for tuning in. from you and Comcast committing one billion dollars to help provide people with the skills resources and opportunities they need to succeed in a digital world Comcast project up building a future of unlimited possibilities comcast.com slash project up for some people cooking is a refuge for others it's a nightmare join three immersive storytellers as they share their kitchen confessions and watch stories from the stage tonight at eight on GBH2 some credit cards expire, others end up lost, whether it's at the store, the airport, or even between the couch cushions. So, you may have received a new card. If that's the case, and you're a GBH sustainer, your information may not be up to date. Luckily, it's easy to make your information current through our website. A few minutes is all it takes, and you'll be back to supporting the local news on GBH. Get up to date at gbh.org update. I'm Morning Edition co-host Paris Halston. And I'm Morning Edition co-host Jeremy Siegel. You and I are listening to 89.7 WGBH, HD1 Boston, online at gbhnews.org. GBH News with NPR. What matters to you? This week's coup in Niger has put the region on edge, and the 1,000-plus U.S. troops based there are on alert. From WAMU and NPR in Washington, this is 1A. I'm David Gura, and it's the international edition of the Friday News Roundup. Niger is considered to be the West's last true ally in the Sahel. It's a part of the world plagued by jihadists linked to al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. What will this week's coup mean for the country and security in the region? Also, the rise and fall of China's once powerful foreign minister. Israel's prime minister gets his way. The U.S. women's soccer team got their way, too. We hear how they gave the Dutch a lesson in how not to get mad, but to get even. That's after these headlines. Okay, so I will, okay, okay. Our news in Washington, I'm Lakshmi Singh. Oh, the question Tens is very of millions big. of people are spending yet another day so under excessive so heat advisories. The Air Force oh, One so White House Press Secretary for Regional Pierre did not respond to a question on whether uh -huh. President Biden would consider awesome. declaring a climate October emergency in the United seven, States, but okay. she right, says climate good. action that's remains a top priority that's for fine. the yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dominique. The president has been very clear about what climate change is doing, that we're in a climate crisis. The Inflation Reduction Act was incredibly important uh, as we look at investment. Uh, All right. To, to I think we're coming up here. In New York City, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., and many other major cities, a heat index. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us here at our GBH setup here at the National NAACP Convention. We just wrapped up with Boston Public Radio with our colleagues Jim and Marjorie, and we're getting ready to head into Basic Black, a special edition hosted by Tanisha Sullivan, the president of the Boston NAACP branch. Right now, I'm with Jada Turner, who is the founder and owner of Black Owned Boss, um, a collective, I don't know if you would describe it as a collective, but an organization that supports local black owned businesses. Uh, Jada, how big is this moment for those businesses? Um, I think it's a really great moment. I think there's a nice collection of businesses that are physically here um, and that are representing their business or their brands. But I think just in general, bringing so many people and so much attention to the community in Boston, there's going to be tourism, all of those different things. It's got a great opportunity. What is the economic impact that our black owned businesses have here? 
It's tremendous. Um, they're in all different facets of industry, clothing, retail, science, technology, so many different industries. Um, so it's, it's a great impact. I think it's vast. Now, of course, with that, we know there's still more support that is needed from the city and the state to uplift those businesses. What would you like to see happen on that front? I think the biggest thing I think is access to capital, um, understanding how to utilize that capital when you have it, and then sustain growth for opportunities such as contracts um, and supporting them along that path. We know that uh, Celtics player Jalen Brown was just talking about wanting to create a black Wall Street here. Could you see that happening? Definitely. We'd love to work with him to make that happen. All right, Jalen, they're calling you now. OK, <laughs> uh, so Jada, what are, uh, thinking about the convention in general, there's going to be a lot of exciting things happening here. What are you most looking forward to? I'm just looking forward to kind of just the convergence of people. There's so many different industries here, so many different people that are coming from all across the country, potentially the world, um, to just hear and ha hear, be here, be here, and have the conversations. Yeah. Well, that is Jada Turner from Black Owned Boss. Thanks so much and enjoy yourself. Thank you so much. So stay tuned. As I mentioned, we have a special edition of Basic Black hosted by Boston NAACP President Tanisha Sullivan coming up in just a moment. Um, but I also want to just give you a, a quick look here at the convention. As you can see, uh, the hub is open now. It's 2 o'clock. This is a free and open experience to the public. There's lots to do. There's interactive experiences. You may see some celebrities around here. Uh, so definitely a lot to check out. Fun for all ages, all uh, groups and people walk from life from whether you're from the city of Boston or just visiting for the first time so I want to welcome my next guest here mr. Wyatt Jackson hello Wyatt hello. how are you Good. so you are were telling me earlier you are a story designer yes, I tell am. me what does that mean story designer is another word for a director of a theatrical production um, musical theater immersive art bringing it all together that story design uh -huh. And you have a theater production that's coming up uh, at the Strand Theater, which is right in, in Dorchester's Upham's Corner. That's correct. It's called We Move in Color. And we just got back from the Kennedy Center in D.C. performing it there. It launched last year here, and now it's coming back to Boston. Okay. And, and that production is going to be October 6th and 7th, we yes. should know. Um, and, and tell me what it's about. It is about our experience in this country from 1618 to Afrofuturism. It's done with um, visual art, the visual art of Paul Goodnight um, and Lou Jones. The choreographers are from New York, incredible modern dance, um, tap dance, you name it, African dance, the whole nine. And then there's poetry and then there's hip hop, everything. That sounds incredible. Yes. So we know that the Strand is a, a mainstay in yes. Upham's Corner, right? Sure. It's it's had hosted a number of acts, right? The, oh, I think the OJs have been there. Oh, yeah. You name them, they probably have been That's there, right? right? Uh, what is the significance of the NAACP in Boston for a neighborhood like Upham's Corner? Oh, well, let's be clear. A lot of movements have started in Boston. Um, I have an Emmy Award. I started at the Strand Theater, and so there's something about the NAACP connecting to that history, um, we all have benefited from the NAACP, all artists, scientists, you name it, educators. So coming back to Boston after 41 years is a very big deal in terms of re-energizing the community and saying, you can do this. Remember, you can do this. Were you here in 1982 when the convention was, was here last? What was that like? I was in the AXO competition, actually. Um, oh, wow. Yes. And I remember it being a life-changing experience. Actually, I networked with a bunch of people there, and I was able to go to Los Angeles and start my acting career based on the NAACP networking. Oh, that is beautiful. Well, that is Wyatt Jackson, a local story designer here at the National NAACP Convention. Stay tuned. Basic Black is up next. I'm Tanisha Sullivan, president of the NAACP Boston branch and your host today. Well, the convention programming kicked off Wednesday with the Act So program. And yesterday with our grassroots civic engagement boot camp. Today there are several neighborhood activations around Black Boston. Well, we know this convention will touch on many issues important to our nation. And on this special edition of Basic Black, 
we're discussing the impact of the recent affirmative action and student loan debt decisions by the Supreme Court. How will these decisions affect students and their families? Joining me today, Renee Graham, Associate Editor and Columnist at the Boston Globe. Tracy Griffith, Director of the Racial Justice Program for the ACLU of Massachusetts. Dr. Lynn Perry Wooten, President of Simmons University. And Philip Martin, Senior Investigative Reporter for GBH News. Welcome to you all. Thank you. All right, so let's jump right in. And I'm going to start, uh, Renee, with you. Now, you have said that the Supreme Court plays an outsized role uh, in people's lives today. We know that Senators Warren and Markey are both calling for reform, ranging from expanding the number of justices on the Supreme Court to even discussions about limiting lifetime appointments. Can you share a little bit with us about your observations of this Supreme Court and its impact on our country today? Well, I have to say, Tanisha, this is, this is unlike any Supreme Court I've seen in my lifetime. I think most of us can say that. Um, an important thing to remember is we do have this 6-3 split, this ideological split. And the three justices who were appointed by Donald Trump when he was president are all in their 50s. So we're looking at another 30 years of this court in a lot of ways. Um, the decisions they're making are life-changing, and the Supreme Court's always made life-changing decisions. But the decisions are coming from such an ideological bent that I think it is having an impact beyond what people could have imagined. So if you go back to what happened last year with essentially the gutting of, of Roe v. Wade, and then this year with these, these decisions around the uh, affirmative action and student loans, all of these things have a disproportionate impact on communities of color. But I think that's part of the plan. You know, when you're talking about affirmative action, when you're talking about uh, student loans, you're talking about how people better themselves, their abilities to go to college and to do things that are important, not just for them, but for their communities. So if you're keeping certain people out of college because they can't afford to go there, they don't want to get into massive debt, then you're talking about a future of black doctors and lawyers and architects and journalists and all these people who aren't going to exist because they're being purposely kept out of colleges and universities. So, you know, it's, it's really devastating what's been happening. None of it is surprising, but there's still a deep impact when it actually happens and we have to live with the consequences of this. Thank you. And, you know, when we think about the consequences of these decisions, we know, Tracy, that there, you know, there are legal uh, paths that we can take uh, to address some of what we're seeing nationally. Um, but there's also some action that can be taken at the more local level, at the grassroots level, through our, or our advocacy organizations. Can you share a little bit about what you're seeing within the civil rights community um, in response to some of these uh, decisions? Well, I, th I don't think that there's anybody in the civil rights organizations that were surprised about this, right? We, we knew this was coming, we saw it coming, and so we kind of strategized. What are the ways in which we can um, affect change without depending on the Supreme Court? Because, as Renee said, we know that looking forward, we've got many years of a Supreme Court that will be not so friendly to issues of civil liberties and civil rights. And so we have to strategize and come up with ways in which we can deal with this and these issues on the ground level without having to go through the courts. And so it is really reaching out to individuals. It's, it's reaching out to communities, getting people involved, voting rights, right? Who are the people who are making decisions about, you know, your school board and the books that are we're seeing being banned in some places, right? The things that are on the ground, the things that we can deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's the way that we work together, organizations, community organizations, folks who live in these communities, to really make a difference on the day-to-day -day lives. Is there anything that you've heard over the last few weeks, over the last few months, in terms of some of the solutions, innovative solutions, um, coming from the ground up that you think have particular promise? Sure. I mean, if you're looking specifically or talking specifically about the ways in which we can get our students into colleges, right? Students of color. Now that we 
now that colleges can no longer consider race, um, we're looking at different ways. We're looking at things like um, community groups that are working at looking at funding. How can we get more funding for students of color to get through these institutions? How can we reach out to high schools and even middle schools so that we are getting them in a place where they are prepared to enter school, where the issue of race can be I want to say mitigated to some degree. We're also pushing for things like doing away with standardized testing, right? It's been shown that standardized testing is extremely problematic for people of color, right? And so if we can get schools to do away with standardized testing as an entry into higher education, that's another way in which we can address those issues. Wonderful, and it's, it is the perfect segue to uh, Dr. Wooten. Um, you know, in terms of the conversations that are happening among leaders uh, on our college campuses today, what are some of the conversations that are being had about certainly the Supreme Court decisions, um, but what are, but more specifically, what are some of the conversations yeah. that you're have you and your colleagues are having about what's next? Right, like my panelists, we knew this was coming, and so we were practicing what I call prepared leadership. And we have to think about the whole education ecosystem as said. Um, first, we have to have more investments in the K-12, especially the K-12 where we see brown and black and people from under-resourced gender backgrounds. But then higher ed, we have to rethink emissions. Um, in my previous job, I threw out traditional emissions and test optional and created portfolios where people could demonstrate their talents Beyond that, you know, if you had to work through high school, if you were a Girl Scout, if you were involved in your church, all of those type of things. So holistic emissions has to be front and center. The other thing that I want people to realize is this affirmative action decision only affects a small percentage of colleges. 90% of the colleges, it doesn't matter because they're not as selective, they're not having to think about race, and we need to support those 90% of those colleges. Community colleges, historically black colleges, women's center colleges, all of those state colleges have doors open for diversity, and we need to think about that landscape too. Um, the other thing at higher ed we're thinking about, and my panelists have touched on this, it's not only about getting people in the door, it's making sure they get a ROI on their degree. And I know we're gonna talk about student loans in a second, um, that they're learning, that they get jobs, that they can pay back those tuition, that they can have legacies and created for the next generation. So outcomes are important too. So it's opening the doors, it's creating thriving experiences and experiences of belonging, but we have to be committed to the outcomes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, okay, so the Supreme Court threw something out, but you know what, we can play their game, we can out strategize them. It's the importance of corporations need to step up, the foundations and nonprofit, and other government sectors. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, I found very interesting about um, the, the, the decision in the Harvard and UNC cases is that the Supreme Court and Justice Roberts' um, opinion was very clear that race in admissions can be considered in the, when we're talking about how race has impacted right. a student, their life or the end or their yeah. lives. Mm -hmm. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Right, and we, ha you know, I came from Michigan. So Michigan, 20 years ago, we had to learn how to live without affirmative action. Is that how has race impacted you? What have you learned from your racial experiences? What have you learned from being in a diverse community? What has been a disadvantage from you? What are the inequities and the disparities we can all look at? Also, we can look at how you um, are an equity warrior, how you advance diversity in your community. So there are creative ways. They said that the military academies can still consider That's race. Right. And so we have to be creative, but this is why coming together as a community to make creative solutions are so important. So, Philip. 2024. Oh yeah. Right around the corner. It sure is. <laughs> Do you think uh, the Supreme Court is going to be a topic of debate? Without question. Uh, with, without question, the Supreme Court, this particular Supreme Court, uh, will and is a topic of debate. Uh, as my colleague said, you have a Supreme Court that's going to be around for a long time. We expect other pillars of progress to, to be dismantled by the Supreme Court. Affirmative action is a pillar of progress. LGBTQ rights are pillars of progress. 
uh, uh, abortion and access uh, to, uh, to abortion, women's uh, reproductive rights, that's a pillar of progress. These pillars of progress are being torn down by the U.S. Supreme Court with help from a very r radical, radical uh, ex-president uh, who, of course, appointed these uh, three of them and with help from a very radical grassroots uh, that, uh, that is also abetted by a notion that democracy uh, seems to be less important, pluralistic democracy less important in this country than it's been in the past, precisely because these issues of progress have threatened or seem to have threatened a number of people. They feel by any means necessary that they could tear down the pillars of progress. And one of those instruments, sadly, is the U.S. Supreme Court, led by um, uh, Alito and uh, Clarence Thomas. Uh, so without question, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court as an institution, as a body, as an issue, will be relevant uh, and on the ballot in 2024. People will consider how will the next Supreme, what will be the next shoe to drop, if you will. We've seen of uh, student loans, of uh, programs set back, affirmative action set back. You've seen LGBTQ rights set back in a case where, the, uh, where some of the facts weren't even facts uh, within, in the Supreme mm -hmm. Court. And so you can assume that there will be uh, a major focus on this particular body. And what we're, and just to pick up there, I mean, what we're already seeing could be described as backlash in, in terms of you know, state legislators across the country trying to expand the Supreme Court's recent, de recent decisions to other areas of uh, equity, access, and opportunity. We're uh, seeing uh, corporations revisiting some of their diversity initiatives. That's We're right. seeing municipalities even pulling back on some of their diversity initiatives just because of the chilling effect of this decision. How do you see um, some of these efforts, whether it be in the private sector or from some of the other government um, agencies, how do you see these impacting our communities in the next six to 12 months? Well, it's a, it's a great question because I think what we have to look at when we look at these decisions that have occurred within the Supreme Court, it's not simply confined to affirmative action, for example, within universities. This seeps down into high schools. It seeps down to our very, the very way we think about this notion of equity, this notion of inclusion, this notion of uh, diversity. And so that's a corporate issue as well, uh, where corporations, for example, feel less commitment uh, than they may have felt in the immediate aftermath of George Floyd's murder, for example, uh, in uh, 2020 to, be, to, to make a commitment to change the corporate culture uh, and that would uh, and, and hire more people of color, more black people specifically. Uh, I think we also, um, Tanisha, have to go back even further. We're looking at a whole reversal possibility of Brown v. Board because again, this is not just a question of, of two selective universities. Uh, as uh, the affirmative action decision seemed to uh, suggest for many people, nor is it simply a question of people being uh, deprived of the ability to, uh, to take access to a student loan forgiveness program. Uh, we're seeing these things seep down into, into communities, black communities, brown communities across the country. You also see efforts to divide people uh, with this uh, affirmative action case this was a, a clear example of the most classic of, uh, of, uh, of strategies of divide and conquer. In this case, to try to divide Asian uh, Americans uh, from black Americans exactly. Exactly. and brown uh, um, Americans. It was a classic example, uh, and it met with some success, but not completely, because you have large percentages of individuals who understood what was going on and what is going on with this type of strategy. And right there, Absolutely, Philip. Renee, you've written a lot about this in terms of 
what we're seeing what, from our institutions, whether we're talking about our judicial system, Supreme Court, or we're talking about Congress, um, and many of the policy positions that are debated, even if not advanced, and how these institutions, American institutions, um, today specifically, may be impacting how we, as individuals, are interacting on issues of race and racism. Can you just share a little bit with us about how you're seeing um, where we are today and its impact in local communities and how folks are engaging? I think there's a few things. I mean, something that I always found fascinating was the way that the people who were against Roe never gave up. 50 years, mm -hmm. generation to generation to generation. And I think what happened on the other side is people thought, well, it's settled law, so we're going to be fine. I think one of the things we have to understand in communities is there's no such thing as settled law anymore. There's no such thing as a protected class of, for people with rights. We've seen that with that case uh, out of Colorado, 303 Creative, the, the hypothetical case that allowed a woman to decide that, well, I don't need to make websites for gay couples, even though there was no gay couple and she doesn't make wedding sites, it doesn't have it, it was all nonsense. But that's where we are now. So I think the strategy has to be changed in how communities go about this and not take the idea that it's all gonna work out. It's not working out. This is happening time and time again. And if people didn't understand that with Roe, which they certainly should have, they have to understand where we are this year because the sky's the limit right now with the Supreme Court. Nothing is off the table. And as Philip was saying, it's gonna be same, it's gonna be uh, same sex marriage. It's gonna be contraception. It's going to be any sort of DEI program, and those are already falling apart because everyone's gotten over their performative antics after George Floyd's murder, and now they're sort of going back into, well, we don't really want that. And so all those people, when they're laying off, DEI, the first people who are going. So I think communities have to rethink how they approach this and be as ardent as the other side is because they never gave up. All, you know what? The people on the right did was they kept plugging away until they got a court that would work for them. And so I hope going into 2024, people have a different understanding of, it's not, you're not just voting for president, you're voting for the Supreme Court mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what difference that's going to make. I don't think people really appreciated that in 2016. Certainly no one expected Donald Trump to get, you know, three nominees, but he did. And that's where we are mm -hmm. now. And so people have to behave accordingly and sort of bring the same ammunition that the other side is. Well, you know, Tracy, there may be some people who think that we're just, you know, we're, we have this house is on fire mentality and it's really not that bad. The system will do what the system needs to do. What do you say to that? Well, you know, if you think about it in terms of the way things were 50 years ago and where we've come to, we're going right back to where we were 50 years ago. And if that does not worry you, you're not paying attention. Right? This is a strategy that has been long in the making, right? And we recognize that the enemies of civil rights and civil liberties are busy, right? They are busy strategizing, they are busy preparing, and we have to do the same. Civil liberties and civil fights, civil liberties fights don't stay won. We have to keep fighting for them every single day. This is not something that we can rest and say, oh, okay, so Roe v. Wade, okay, that's good, all done, we're good. We know that that's going forward. Well, look, right, we're right back where we started, right? We have to keep the fight going. And if, if the Supreme Court is not the place where we launch that fight, then we've got to look at other areas. We've got to look within communities. We've got to look to, you know, to higher ed. We've got to look to corporations. We've got to look to organizations to help with that fight on a day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day basis. You know, the, there are many places where we need to remain vigilant, absolutely. And one of the other areas, and we haven't touched on it just yet, is student loan debt. You know, someone said to me last week, they said, you know, it's very interesting that, um, you know, we can bail out corporate America, yeah. but when it comes to working people, right. uh, all of a sudden, uh, student loan debt cancellation is off the table. And yes. so Dr. Wooten, want to talk about student loan debt cancellation. The Biden administration announced or re-announced, reintroduced an alternative plan to student loan debt uh, management. Could right. you talk about that? Yeah, what it speaks to is we don't care about education or higher education. We think that it's something for the rich, 
who can afford to pay for it, and everybody else, you're on your own. And so the cancellation of the student loan debt forgiveness says that, like I said, we don't care about higher ed. We don't understand generational wealth. So if I cancel the loan and then I have to pay it back, I can never own a house. I can't afford to send my kids to college. I can't get out of poverty. So we're creating these cycles of poverty. And it goes back to what my panelists have said. We need systems that invest in higher education and help students pay for this. We're one of the few developing countries where people have to pay anywhere from fifty dollars to $100,000 a year for undergraduate education. And then we don't want to help them with their loans. This makes no sense. And every time Biden comes up with a program, they try to slap them down. And so therefore, like you said, the fight is every day. And everyone has to be at the table. And there are multiple forms of government. Our states need to think about affordability. Our cities need to think about affordability. We need multiple pathways. The corporations who employ our graduates, they need to step up and help pay for it. Because like you said, we give corporate bailouts, but no one wants to fund higher education. So what's our workforce of the future going to be? Yes. Also think about who fights those programs for student yes. loans. That's important. You know, it's not, you know, every AG, it's always red states that are fighting these things. Right. Why are they fighting them? Because this is an intentionality in keeping certain groups in debt that you will never get out of. So and and I, I want to pick up, so I, I want to pick up on, on that point, Renee, because so much of this framing is about black people and brown people. Right. And, and it's framed in such a way of, and, and Philip and others have touched on this, it's kind of separating us. Dividing. But when we start to really dig deep into whether we're talking about student loan debt cancellation or any of the other um, so-called progressive policies that we're seeing that really get to economics across our country, we're talking about all of America. That's we're talking right. about we working are. class folks, yeah. working people. And so in our final time, what mm -hmm. I'd love to hear from, from you all is, Philip, I'm going to start with you. Mm -hmm. um, how do we start to shift this conversation from just being about a pro programs for black people, for BIPOC people, to get folks to understand that this is about all of America? Well, I think I, 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 you've already done it by introducing the question. I think that people have to understand that this is, these things are pluralistic. Uh, and, and if we call ourselves a pluralistic democracy, we have to, we're talking about everyone, correct? And I think in our, our very conversations, the very things we write about, our columns, those things can, cannot be demarcated issue by issue, but they have to be seen as an aggregate of, uh, attack, again, on the pillars of progress. I think we need to talk about this as an attack on democracy, right. because that's what we're talking about. We're not just talking about uh, uh, an issue here and an issue there. These things are not episodic. Uh, these things represent a strategy. As the NAACP uh, meets here in Boston, another group is holding a national meeting called ALEC. And this is a group, uh, I, forgive me for not remembering the acronyms, but this is a group that, uh, that is a conservative business and legislative group that's meeting in Florida. Its speaker, main speaker is Ron DeSantis, who's talking about polishing the chains of enslavement, historically, uh, as part of the, uh, his, uh, his attempt to ban books and to revise curriculums. But what ALEC does is it proposes things like stand your, law, stand your ground laws. The reason you have stand your, uh, your ground laws in so many states right now is because of ALEC. The reason you have uh, a lot of bills that are basically trying to dismantle programs attacking climate change, which disproportionately affects people of color, is because of ALEC. Uh, and ALEC is working with other groups around the country, state legislatures, around the country uh, to basically, again, tear down the pillars of democracy. So we have to talk about these things, our, our very conversations, our very, the very things we write. Renee has been doing this for a long time in her columns. We have to talk about how these things are connected. Uh, uh, and folks in my neighborhood in Detroit have to understand that what's happening in Florida is connected to what's happening in Detroit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Folks in Boston have to understand what is happening in Texas whether it's at the border, uh, where we're, we're thousands of miles from that border, is connected to what's happening in Boston. So Dr. Wooten, what do you, 
how would you suggest that we start to reframe these conversations so that we get to the point where we're not just talking about yeah. some parts of our community, but really understanding, yes, the interconnectedness yeah. and how this is about all of us. We have to frame it as we are our brother and sister's keepers. Mm -hmm. And going back to my sector, you know, when you invest in my child, you invest in everybody. And we often want to be so divided, so myopic, so me. But if we want to have a better society and advance everyone, we need this investment. We need level playing fields. We need student loan forgiveness. We need doors open. And so it's shifting from the me to the we as a society and caring for one. There's universal design. Affirmative action has benefited lots of people beyond black people. But we want to ignore that. The loan forgiveness things. And so if we want to advance our society and be a sophisticated developed country, we have to go from the me to the we. Well Tracy. How do we, I mean, you are, you're in the thick of this, and so when we talk leading the Racial Justice Project, you are talking about race every day. Every day. You are leading on issues that connected to racism every day. Yes. How do we start to change this narrative that these conversations, these programs, these policies are really just about BIPOC folks, and, and so that people understand that this is about all of us? Well, I think my two panelists are absolutely correct. This is not, the attack is not simply against BIPOC folks. It is against people who are under-resourced, who have long been forgotten or ignored, and that includes a lot of members of our society, not just BIPOC people, right? In order to pay for college, you've got to be making a whole lot of money to be able to get your kids through college. That is not a black issue or a Puerto Rican issue or, you know, an age. it is a we issue, <laughs> right? And so we've got to come together to recognize that these issues are not just affecting one segment of our society, although they do tend to affect a particular segment of our society disproportionately, but it is, th these issues are things that affect all of us. In order to have a functioning democracy, we have to have an educated populace. If we cannot educate our population, our democracy suffers. It's just that simple. It means that all of us have to have access to that education to be able to foster a democracy that works for everyone. Renee, race, racism, how do we, or how have you seen um, us start to shift this narrative to one that's not just solely focused on black people, BIPOC folks, but really helping us to understand that this is about our whole society? And I, we have to change the way we've had this conversation for the last 400 years, is what we're talking about. You know, equity is not an entitlement. Equity for all is not an entitlement for some. And I think that's what people tend to think. When they think of something like affirmative action, it's like, oh, that's helping those people. As if there isn't a benefit to everyone. So we have to constantly figure out a way to broaden the idea of that. That if it's helping me, guess what? It's going to help you as well. It's going to help your community. You know, if we look at what's been happening the last few weeks with climate change, we're all high. Doesn't really matter where you live, right? You know? Waters in Florida are 100 degrees. That's everyone's problem. Right. Yes, it's going to affect communities go disproportionately because everything always does, but it affects everyone. And if we don't have clean water, and we don't have clean air, and we can't get ourselves cool enough or warm enough, that's everybody's problem. And we can look at that way with climate change, but essentially every other major issue facing this country. It's not just happening to these people, it's happening to everyone. And that's the thing to me, it's like equity is not an entitlement, it helps everyone. Equity is not an entitlement, it helps everyone. Mm -hmm. Tracy, Philip brought Alec into the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, I would like to spend a little bit of time focused on public policy because the strategy of ALEC and organizations like ALEC which re has been about shifting our culture through public policy. The NAACP is fundamentally today uh, 
a public policy advocacy organization. We know the ACLU, our sister in the movement, also public, a public policy advocacy organization. When we think about our strategy going forward, does Alec have it right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Well, they've got the strategy right. They've got the strategy right. They've got a plan. And, you know, Renee talked about how w the red states are very loud. We're hearing, we're hearing about all of these policies mm -hmm. that are coming out of the red states and all of the things that are happening there. What is happening in the blue states? Right. Where, are the, where are the voices that are coming out? We need to out? be yelling. We need to be yelling, right? The house is on fire, we need to be yelling. And it doesn't seem as if the urgency is quite there, mm -hmm. right? For so many of the other places where, where we're hearing those red state voices, we're hearing those you know, conservative voices so with so much power and so much authority. And so it's shaping the way that those who might be in the middle are viewing the scenario. The purple states. The purple states, the exactly. States. We need to be screaming. We need to be talking about the issues as they are, not how we're imagining them to be, about how they are, the reality of the situation. And then the narrative can start to shift. But until we speak up, we have no chance. And we, and we so need to learn how to fight. Speaking up. It's not as though people aren't speaking up, just briefly. You have the Tennessee Three, for example. That was a great example mm -hmm. of pushing back. Right. You have upstanders in Newton who are pushing back. You have people who are pushing back against Moms Against Liberty, which the Southern Poverty Law uh, Center describes as a hate group. So it's not as though people aren't pushing back. We just have to push back. Folks have to push back a lot harder. Well, I want to, Renee. Mm -hmm. We need to fight intersectionally because that is what people in red states do. They're not just saying, we're going to concentrate on this. They're doing everything at the same time. We have to do the same thing. Mm. We don't have the luxury of just concentrating on one area at a time. We need to look at everything because it's all interconnected and that's the way we need to approach it. Well, Tracy called out red states and where the, the focus in ALEC has been mm -hmm. um, focused primarily in so-called red states. So are we complacent here, Dr. Wooten, when oh, yeah. living in, in, in so-called blue states? I think living in our blue states, we're complacent. And what we've heard today is it's a fight every day. It is a strategic fight, it's policy, it's the Supreme Court, it's the legislative body, we have to fight. And sometimes the blue states rest on their laurels. Oh, we're good, you know, we're liberal, things are fine, their policies aren't gonna impact us. Well, climate change goes everywhere, their policies go everywhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when we start to think about this, again, I'm going back to the narrative mm -hmm. of, you know, when we're talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, affirmative action programs, student loan debt cancellation, that this is just about them and it's not about the collective us. When we talk about the, but what we're seeing is the work of organizations like ALEC mm -hmm. and others that have been very focused, deliberate and intentional and really working to not only shift public policy but also working very hard to shift that Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. um, as though, for those of us who are in this work, of the civil rights work. Tracy, I'm coming back to you. Okay. Um, how do we, we're on fire, but how do we really help to reach our communities so that we've got more of a groundswell of mm. people who understand where we are right now and the crisis that we are in? I, I think, it, I think it, it has to come from the ground up. Right? I think it's within the communities I think it's about, you know, who's getting elected to the school board and, you know, shaping policy for our K through 12 and who's getting elected mayor in small towns and who, I mean, I think it is about the day to day kind of action that folks are taking on the ground. And I think organizations like ours need to be in those communities to hear what those issues are, right? Is it, is it an issue of housing? You know, are, is, is housing adequate? Is it an issue of food insecurity? Is it, and it may be all of those things, but those things affect multiple organizations and multiple people in multiple places. This, this really isn't a political issue. It is, it is a human issue, right? That there are people who are hungry. There are people who are, you know, who are suffering within our communities. We need to reach them on the day-to-day -day basis. 
right? And so if it's shoring up our educational system, and if that means we need certain people that will work towards making sure books aren't banned in this particular school, or if it's working towards you know, a food security issue and it's gardens in particular neighborhoods, it is really on the ground work. It is day to day on the ground work. And I think then it, it moves its way up. Again, I, you know, if we're looking to the Supreme Court to solve these issues, that's not going to happen. Not anytime soon. And higher education has a role. When we yes. think about democracy and protests and all the things we've talked about in the 60s, the, we need to really re-energize higher education. Part of my job is to educate people to be good citizens, to be democratic citizens. Yes. Are you seeing are you seeing that energy on I your am. campus and I'm others? I'm seeing it on other campuses. They're mm -hmm. protesting for affirmative action. They're concerned about Roe v. Wade. They're concerned about LGBT rights. But we have to bring that in the classroom. They're concerned about books being banned. Mm -hmm. So this is why higher education is important in the society and in the red states, they don't like it. Because we are educating a democracy mm -hmm. to challenge the status quo. And so with your students on, uh, on Simmons, of, of course, we know Simmons <laughs> attracts a, a special, dynamic right. type of students. Are you? How has the activism shifted yeah. over the last few months, especially with these recent? Yeah. So what we've seen a lot of camp campuses is that the pandemic tempered students, and now they're getting re-energized again because they weren't there in person. They didn't get to learn that skill set and pass for generation to generation. Mm -hmm. But now they are activating and they are starting, they are challenging faculty, they're thinking about policy, they're thinking about the careers. They want to be careers that they can change the world and really fight against these things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Philip, coming back to you mm -hmm. again for just an, a, an overview of your observations when we're talking about the activism on our college campuses. The reason I want to stay there is because we know generation after generation, movement after movement, it really has been both community and our young people who have been able to hold our feet collectively as a country to the fire and that has allowed us to move forward. I, I, was, well, I was just thinking about what Dr. Wooden was just saying because I was thinking about all of us were probably, I'm guessing, activists on our campuses. <laughs> We were uh, anti-apartheid, you know, exactly. racism. I was an activist, so certainly. Um, and I think about, I think a lot of, I mean, these things have to be, I think, perceived existential. And I think when you see it that way, you are, in fact, more active. One reason you're seeing so many young people, for example, involved in climate change, is they think, I'm going to be here 10 years from now. Right. I'm right. going to be experiencing yeah. these fires, these floods, uh, this uh, awful uh, weather and it's unpredictable. People are thinking about democracy. When you see someone who has authoritarian, not just traits, but a, a spelling out an authoritarian policy, if he is re-elected, that is no longer theoretical. That gets people up and about and worried and concerned. And you see that on a lot of campuses. You see that with Simmons students. You see that with Harvard students. You see that with uh, Northeastern students, but not enough. Uh, I think it becomes enough, uh, that is to say, I think you have lit a fire when people actually believe, oh my God, this is impacting me. Right. Uh, and, and that is starting to happen. You, I think I'm glad Renee brought up the example of climate change because you've had people up until a year ago who poo-pooed the notion of climate change until all of a sudden the crops are burning down and the temperatures are so hot that it's driving you from, your, from where you live and so on and so forth. That is happening on college campuses to the degree where individuals see the, this, these red, this, this red lights, these, uh, this fire alarm about democracy and realize it's no longer a silent alarm. It is ringing loudly. Democracy is threatened. We have reintroduced words that we thought would never be pertinent to the, to, uh, to the United States. Fascism. Uh, people are concerned about fascism. You had Madeleine Albright write about this, about creeping fascism, uh, and, and concerns that groups like the Proud Boys and the Patriot Front and other groups that are, are, are joining common cause with uh, elected officials in places like Florida, the uh, Tampa Public Schools, Sarasota, 
you have actually, you have the uh, actually Proud Boys who have been basically uh, in the, uh, allied with the Moms for Liberty in these places. And these things are connected because they're, they're, um, they're making common cause with what we used to call mainstream organizations. But the mainstream has become extreme, uh, at least on one side of the political equation. We're taught to, uh, to think about Republicans and Democrats uh, in, uh, as a sort of a balance. But it becomes difficult when you're starting to see one party actually gravitating toward things that are classified academically as authoritarian and fascist. It, and so we have to be on the lookout for that, and I think young people are. Absolutely, and in our final minutes, we started this conversation wrapping around the Supreme Court um, and have really anchored it with the affirmative action decision, um, student loan debt cancellation. We've talked about the recent LGBTQ uh, case. We've talked about Dobbs. Mm. The last 18 to 24 months, the last two se sessions of our Supreme Court have really um, presented to us decisions that have, as we've said today, taken us back several decades. Mm -hmm. As we look forward to the next session, in closing, what do you have your eyes on that this court may have before it next year? I'm going to start, yes, that was a deep breath. <laughs> deep breath. <laughs> um, I'm gonna start, Tracy, I'm coming to you. Sure. I think, I think coming out of the affirmative action decision, we need to look at the other kinds of um, affirmative action that may be falling next, mm -hmm. right? Um, we need to look at, and to some degree it has already, but LGBTQ rights, right? Um, you know, are, are, is the next step going after, you know, gay marriage? Is it going to be, yeah. I mean, we don't want to think that that's the direction necessarily, but you know, and the other things that come out of those affirmative action decisions, you know, are we able to have, you know, race-based affinity groups? Are we able to have race-based scholarships? Are we able to have, you know, are we able to look at race even as a holistic notion? How are the, how is this decision going to affect those things? Wonderful, Dr. Wooten, I've got 30 seconds. I lead a woman's college, and so I'm worried about reproductive rights a woman's ability to make decisions about her own body. It's setting us back. And I don't know what this support's gonna do. And Renee, 30 seconds. Same sex marriage, period. We know that they're gonna go after it, and that's where I'm really focused at this moment. Philip? Same sex marriage, uh, the press, uh, the ability to basically uh, uh, revisit the New York Times decision, and I think uh, a modification of, of a, a further, uh, I should say, a further problem with, um, with affirmative action, making it, looking at affirmative action in corporations uh, and other institutions. Well, that is the end of this special edition of Basic Black at the 114th National NAACP Convention in Boston. I want to say thank you to our guests for joining us this evening. I am Tanisha Sullivan, president of the NAACP Boston Bridge, and I hope to see you all at this year's convention. Up next, we'll present a conversation on civil rights and reparations, but first, we'll hear from Paris Alston with her guests on the NAACP convention floor. Hello, thank you so much, Tanisha. So you just finished hearing a special edition of Basic Black hosted by Boston, the NAACP branch president, Tanisha Sullivan. And right now I'm here with James Jimmy Hills of the one and only Java with Jimmy, a daily uh, yes. program on Facebook Live that chronicles the issues that are affecting Boston's black communities. Jimmy, what does this moment mean for Boston? This moment means an amazing point for Boston. Um, I'm going to mimic the words of our local president, Tanisha Sullivan, that this is an example. This is a snippet and a spotlight for what Boston can look like. She was on the show this week, and one of the audience members said, we need a hub. We need this for Black Boston every weekend. And so it's amazing. It, it is uh, another word that comes to mind is hopeful. Um, and another word that comes to mind is sustainable. This can be sustained. We have all these corporations and folks that have sponsored the convention, but we need you to sponsor and step up weekly. 
We need you to step in and sponsor Basic Black, Java with Jimmy, and other community-based entities that are not um, typical of some of the quality of life improvement work that goes on. And what does that quality of life improvement look like in the city of Boston? The quality of life improved in the city of Boston is one, a quick example, there are spaces like this where our municipal leaders are working with community leaders um, and Department of Public Works and Parks and Rec that there are open spaces where folks are safe. It looks like equitable education. Um, it looks like a focus on black men in all of these areas. It looks like um, focusing on making the most marginalized communities in Boston, LGBTQ, black women, um, feel not just feel welcome, but walk away with examples of how they were welcomed, either by economic improvement or by uh, access to education. Well, Jimmy, thanks so much. It's always a pleasure always to a see pleasure you, my see brother. You. And stay tuned. Jimmy appears on GVH regularly, so please stay Our tuned for the. Next is August 30th at 12 p.m. Java with Jimmy at GVH. All right, we it's will be looking forward you. to it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So stay tuned. I am, coming up next, I have a, a very sweet uh, duo here for you. Come on over here, you two. A husband and wife duo out of Wayland, Massachusetts, Pamela and David Griffin, who run Chocolate Therapy. Talk about it. Now, now are these the chocolate kisses that Stevie Wonder was talking about no, in Do I Do? No, 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 no. These are not your mother's chocolate kisses. <laughs> well, well, what are they? Tell me about them. They are amazing handcrafted truffles. We've been in business 10, 12 10 years, 10-ish years, yeah. and they're delicious. They're made with love. We make a, a lot of unique ingredients. products, yeah. all natural ingredients. Mm -hmm. And how did you get started? We decided to leave corporate America and do something for ourselves. Okay, and, now. Uh, chocolate seemed like a good thing to, to land in. Chocolate on chocolate, okay. So lastly, I mean, we know that part of this, the footprint of this convention is boosting our, our region's black-owned businesses. What does this mean for you? What, for me, I, I think it's important because Boston is being inclusive. Because we're in Framing, well, we were in Framingham, now we're in Wayland. So being a part of something for Boston is, is great, you know, more exposure, more connections and networking instead of being kind of like the suburbs, I call it. So it's important. I think this is great for the community. It's amazing. Good networking. I mean, I've met several contacts already, and I'd like to shout out to GBH because you guys did support us two years ago, made a yeah. very nice order of about 900 boxes of chocolate. Yeah. Okay, we, so. We're going to need a second order coming okay. up real soon. And, uh, there are a couple of people around here that will uh, remember the, yes, the samples remember that they those. got. Yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, so. That is wonderful. Well, yeah. We're so glad to be reunited with you, especially here for this momentous occasion. Yes. Pam and David Griffin of Chocolate Therapy out of Wayland, Massachusetts, thank you so much. Thank you. Take thank care. You. Have fun. Have fun. So I believe we have one more special guest who is available to join me, our one and only CEO here at GBH, Susan Goldberg. Susan, hello, how are you? Hi, Paris, thank you so much for having me. Of course, thanks for joining us. What does it mean uh, for you to see what we have done here at this convention today? Well, I'm so excited that GBH is the presenting, is the public media, exclusive public media sponsor of this convention, and we are excited to be in the middle of the action. And we, this is not the first time we did this, right? We, we did this at the Embrace unveiling back in January, the monument to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King. Talk a little bit about what GBH's priorities are from a coverage angle uh, and from, from really tapping into this moment that Boston and the region is, are, is experiencing. Well, local coverage is one of the most important things that we can do in our community. You know, we're known all over the country for some of our programming, but some of the most pro important programming that we do happens right here. And we want to make sure that we're telling the kinds of stories that people in Boston can't get anywhere else, that we're talking to people who sometimes aren't talked to as much. And so we want to be part of the full community, and that is why we're here today. Beautiful. And lastly, Susan, what are you most looking forward to about this convention? Ooh, I'm excited that all of these amazing people are coming to town. I was listening to you on the radio this morning talking about some of the politicians and some big known names and some uh, kind of famous uh, stars too. So I'm gonna be on the lookout as well. 
Absolutely. And we know that there are a lot of issues that are on the table um, right now in terms of affirmative action. I know I said lastly, I got, I got a signal to stretch it out here. I'm just going to let you know. So we've got more, plenty more time to talk about this. Uh, so I know there are issues on the table in terms of affirmative action, uh, voter suppression, right? We know that there is a, a war on education and equitable education uh, in places like Florida. So how does GBH continue to be a trusted news source in a moment like this? I think being, you know, we're in the business of fact-based journalism. And so what we're going to try to do is tell people the stories that really matter, that really make a difference. And you know, when it comes to covering these really difficult political issues, I think what we can do is just get in there and tell people what's really going on and, and help people and shine the spotlight on, on all of these difficult issues. You mentioned some of them that are incredibly important in our community, and I know a lot of our local colleges and universities were in the middle of that affirmative action case, and that's a story that resonates all over the country and means so much to so many people in a very personal way. So what we can do is make sure we're not just telling the story that everybody else can tell, but getting behind there and telling people things they don't know. Well, I got to tell you, Susan, I am so proud and grateful to be part of that effort and to be working alongside you. Thank you, Paris. Thank you for all you do. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is Susan Goldberg, CEO of GBH. Thank you. Thank you. I, and so I, I believe we may have a couple, a little bit more time here. Uh, there was a young lady that was over here earlier from the AXO competition. She, I think she may have left, but I do want to give a shout out to all of the AXO participants. Um, the young people here at the, the NAACP National Convention are really the future and, and really an important part of all this. So I'm going to turn it over now to my wonderful, illustrious colleague, Soraya Wintersmith, for her conversation about reparations and the future of civil rights. Hello and welcome to the GBH News Booth from the 114th NAACP Convention in the City of Boston. I'm Soraya Wintersmith with GBH News, the exclusive public media partner for the convention. Here in Boston, city government has established a task force to study reparations for black residents, one of many similar groups across the U.S. grappling with the lasting impacts of slavery in this country. To discuss those efforts and the many complicated questions that surround the future of civil rights and reparations, I'm joined by two local scholars of African American history working to advance the conversation. Michael Curry is president and CEO of the Mass League of Community Health Centers. He's also a member of the National Board of the NAACP's directors. And Dr. Anthony Vandermeer, senior lecturer of Africana Studies at UMass Boston. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here. Glad to be here. I was very inspired by my colleague Callie Crossley, who earlier in the year, in a recent episode of Basic Black, lifted up the fact that we are nearly 60 years removed from the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Justice. And I think it gets lost on people sometimes that that was a demonstration to bring economic equity to black people and civil rights to black people. Given that those were the urgent concerns of the day then, and by many measures they still are the urgent concerns today, would you say that black people have come a long way from that point? Have we progressed? I'm going to the elder <laughs> statesman first. Elder statesman first. Well, it depends on how you look at it. Um, you know, if you live in some of the poor communities, um, that answer wouldn't be a good one. Uh, where people aren't having the proper access to health care, where they're worried about public safety, they're worried about the way the police treat them, they're worried about the educational systems, they're worried about jobs that pay them a decent wage. And if you live in the urban cities, you, you got to make a certain amount of money to even rent an apartment. Um, so on one, one, one step that uh, you would say we have a problem, on another step you can see where there are some people who have access, you know, and have a certain level of visibility. But that's not, you know, all of us, and so, or, or at least enough of us. So we're in a really peculiar situation right now. Michael Curry. Yeah, you know, I, it's funny. I, I find myself, especially since the convention's here and the lead up to the convention, people asking, aren't we a different city than we were in 1982? Are we a different city in since 1950 when the convention was here? Of course we are, right? Of course we've made some progress. We need to celebrate that progress. But the reality is, as, as Professor Vandermeer said, if you look at all the, in, the key indicators, we have the same problems today as we had in 1950, in 1967, and in 1982 when the convention was here. Mortality, morbidity rates incarceration rates, uh, lack of wealth. I mean, all the issues that Tony lifted up are as prevalent today as they were then. So 
are we dealing with each other better in a may, maybe an inter, interpersonal way? Probably in Boston, even though I have stories here in Boston of people uh, being overtly called the N-word and other things, we still have that here as well. So I think socially things have progressed, but let's get past all the social conversation. Let's talk about whether people are living as long as other neighborhoods, mm -hmm. whether zip codes define the, the, the length of your life, um, whether you have access to uh, C-suites and to medical schools and law schools. We still have that problem today. Sir, sir if I can add, because that, that, that question is a, is a question that you have to also go deeper back into history. And at this moment, particularly with the Supreme Court decision you know, around the front of action, um, is that we're going back to the 1800s and the 1857 in terms of the Dred Scott decision, where they said that black people have no rights and white people are bound to respect. And so when you look at the struggles that we've had, you know, in the, in the, 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 the progress that we thought we were making, you have to say, well, wait a minute, you know, how much progress have we made when people are taking us back to 1857 when they're treating us if we have no rights that white people are bound to respect? They're not treating us with a sense of, uh, of, of, of equity or, you know, inclusion in, within this so-called democracy. Somebody said two steps forward, one step back. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> one of the biggest ways I think things have shifted over time is the realm of public perception of equity and thinking about what is fair and what it's just when it comes to making living conditions equitable for black people, the way you two have mentioned. It's been evident to me in the way we've seen people protest racism and police brutality, the ways that health inequities were lifted up when we were in the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. It is most evident to me though in the rise of local government work around reparations. Michael Curry, I wonder what factors would you say have contributed to this shift? Well, you know, I often say it takes time for truth to catch up to history. Mm. So the reality is truth is starting to catch up to history. To Tony's point, uh, we now understand in this reparations conversation, I always lift up uh, Rebecca Lee Crumpler, first African-American physician, 1864, uh, on the heels of uh, the end of slavery, um, first African-American female physician, she said they seem to forget there's a cause for every ailment and it may be in their power to remove it. Mm. Um, they seem to forget there's a cause for every community that's impacted by violence, that there's a, um, a cause for communities that are desperately poor and undereducated that go to level four schools instead of level one schools. There's a reason behind all this history. So now the truth is catching up that the Homestead Act, the Southern Homestead Act, the GI Bill, the housing discrimination, um, um, uh, denying us access into labor unions. There's, there's a wide range of history that the last three years forced us to stay at home because we had to stay at home over most of that time, some of that time. We had to pay attention to things that we often don't want to pay attention to. And, it, and history was part of that. So the reparations conversation is a conversation that's long overdue about how we can walk in almost any city in this country and you can tell what people are living shorter lives, what communities are, dis are going to be poor, who's going to be more likely to be shot by the police. Once we start letting that, that consciousness kick in, I think the reparations conversation picks up steam. Dr. Vandermeer, historically, what would you say has been the biggest impediment to the reparations conversation advancing? Um, well, actually, lack of organization in our community. Mm. Um, because reparations is a political question. It's a question that really deals with the question of self-determination for black people to say this is what we want and if we don't get it there will be consequences. And so we have to be organized, the NAACP with other organizations and other networks standing in unity, putting that demand on the table. And when we do that with unity, we're going to get what we want because people will know that there will be a political consequences. And so far, we, so far we haven't made those consequences for people to realize that you have to deal with us. It's about power. And the power is going to come through unity. And so that's been the real issue. But not only just our lack of unity, it's been the fact that this system has been creating a, a divide and conquer you know, within us so that we don't have that unity. So we're dealing with those kind of obstacles in order to, uh, to uh, uh, better unite ourselves and to put reparations on the table. And if I could add, so sure. one thing that Tony said that I think is critical, before we ever get to that unity, it goes back to the consciousness. Because even as I sit around black folks across this country, I travel a lot with my role on the national board, even black folks don't understand our history, so therefore they don't understand the conversation of reparations. Mm -hmm. It's not asking for a free check, right? When you understand that um, there was a, a, a divide in this country 
that meant that your ancestors could not get the same opportunities and therefore you don't own a home, but you could have owned a home or that you could have been on your third or fourth business instead of thinking about doing a business. We understand that history has relegated populations to poverty and denied opportunity. Then the conversation of reparations changed. So for us to get unity, we need to be on the same page about that history and not feel as if we're asking for a handout. Reparations is a model that's been used across this globe. Mm -hmm. When there's been injustice, we should be using it here. So, you know, this is critical consciousness but it's a question of national consciousness. What, what shapes our consciousness, you know, in terms of the, 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 the media uh, that begins to take us to the other places that we need to be? So I think you're absolutely right, is that how do we build consciousness about what's going on? Th this is part of the educational institution. If, if we're dealing with educational institutions that are basically uh, come from the colonial out outposts in terms of uh, perpetuating those values, then we're not going to be able to raise the conscience of people because they're being miseducated in some of these institutions. <clears throat> Going off of what you're saying about educating people, I want to give us a, an opportunity to define what we mean when we're talking about reparations. It means different things for different people. Sandy Darity at Duke University says it's acknowledgement and redress and closure and COBRA, the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, says it's a process of repairing, healing, and restoring people injured because of their group identity and in violation of their fundamental human rights by governments or corporations. And the UN's Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights has a similar definition, but they add it needs to be adequate, effective, prompt, and proportional to the gravity of the violations and the harm suffered. Gentlemen, how are you two defining reparations? Well, it's interesting. So one is, um, I want to go to, to something in what you just shared, of the, those uh, perspectives. I often say we're a family. So all of us who come from families, and many of us come from some families with dysfunctional issues, that we come from families where there's been abuse, neglect, um, where uh, children didn't get the access to the services they needed. And we know how that plays out because pe people aren't talking to each other anymore. Because... Um, it, it explodes at the kitchen table during Thanksgiving or Christmas. That's how I look at the family in this country across all races, is that we've never had that conversation about why people are broken, why people are struggling, why people have been feeling um, as if they need to have an apology. So that is this conversation about reparations. It's all of the above. I always say jokingly, it's D, right? It's all of the above. It's money, it's opportunity, it's an apology. We've never really received that from this country in the way we, that we should. And I think that is the conversation. Now, when we talk about dollars, whether it was uh, Bob Johnson's trillion, trillion plus dollars, we need to get beyond studying it because that's what, I always say that's what folks do when they don't really want to do anything is they study it to death. Mm -hmm. We need to now start talking about policy like Evanston, Illinois did. to say, no, we're going to tie this to a, a revenue source and then we're going to invest in families and individuals. Now, you may say, well, I don't want to just give out individual checks. I want to invest in healthcare institutions for access, quality, affordability. Or I want to give people startup money for an entrepreneurship. We should have that as a community about what we think reparations could look like that would move us in all those indicators that we're talking about. But we haven't even gotten there yet. I want to pause right here and say we're joined now by Dr. Joyce Hope Scott, clinical professor of African American and Black Diaspora Studies at Boston University. Welcome, Dr. Scott, good to Thank see you. you. And going to Dr. Vandermeer, when we're talking about crafting a policy, the way Michael Curry just mentioned, beyond a definition to remedy harm, there's a reality that folks need to decide what harm or harms need to be addressed, and then how we're typically talking about payment, which many scholars and economists over the years have said is crucial, but we know there can be so much more to a reparations policy. In California, I think the state task force has like 12 harm areas that need to be addressed. One of the earliest promises to bolster black people involved land. Many advocates today also talk about a need for truth telling and institutional change. Are there any other factors you would add if you had a magic wand and you could move the partisan gridlock well, Congress well, well, to craft it, it, a policy, it, it, what would be in there? Well, I appreciate the wand. Right? <laughs> um, no, I think that basically, and I'll go back to it, it's a question of self-determination. 
but it's, it has to be democratic. It has to be rooted in the people. The people have to be involved in those kind of discussions because we have to hear from them the damage and the harm. And, it, and it's not about a discussion, it's about the, the, the structural change in this society to make it a more democratic society. The fact that we're having this conversation proves that this is an equitable society because reparation is about you know, the dist equitable distribution of those resources. So when we look at the role that African people have played in building this society, you know, what's the benefits? We can't even get a, a, a universal health care policy. You know, we worried about safety, education. We can't even get a job to pay us a, a decent wage to, to rent an apartment. So I would say that uh, it's a question of us uh, organizing, in a sense, independently and in raising. It's, not, it's wonderful what the city and the state and the nation can say, those who have power. What are about the people who don't have power? So we need mass assemblies in various communities to engage in those discussions so we can hear from the people in terms of the pain and the suffering that they're going through and how do we repair that, how do we change that? How do we take the resources and make sure that they have adequate hospitals, that they have adequate schools, they have adequate housing? All of these are human rights. So that's part of what we have to understand when we talk about reparations, a broader conversation. Dr. Scott. We're talking about policy areas that we think are crucial when it comes to reparations legislation. What would you have in, if you had a magic wand and you could move the gridlock Congress? <laughs> well, I have to say, first of all, that reparations are a process and not a product. Uh, because what was done uh, was holistic. Uh, it was both a, a vis visible and invisible kind of harm that took place. Uh, and uh, the affected community would need to be involved in whatever decisions are made. This, this is what's crucial. Um, there are uh, lots of ideas about what needs to happen, and I'm so pleased when I see cities and towns and states even, and countries, uh, because I often work on the international level, uh, that are, some people are speaking up about it. But there has to be policies at the government level, because government was involved in setting in motion uh, structures that um, dispossessed uh, African descended people uh, at the state level, um, city level. People uh, want to, I would hope, weigh in on writing a, a, a highly more a, a wrong that's not only moral but also material and epistemological, all sorts of wrongs that took place. How can we all be involved in uh, making sure that that happens? I'm uh, encouraged by what might happen with the HR 40 uh, discussions because that's, that uh, calls for the setting up of a commission. I'm in favor of setting up a commission to study uh, nationally what uh, should happen and I believe that's the best way to do it because it allows for many people to be involved as opposed to just a few folks. Uh, also what's happening at cities and town levels, like recently in Boston there a committee that came before the city council. The city council voted to set up a committee. Uh, that kind of movement uh, is, I believe, very encouraging, and I think that whatever we do relative to reparations, which um, if people would want to buy in on it if they are indeed shown how they are all um, implicated in making something right that affects the entire country. Reparations concerns the, the moral fiber of this country, not just a group of people. So, yeah, and I think from government levels, uh, cities and towns, all the way down to community activists, particularly grassroots um, activist groups uh, who are involved on a day-to-day -day basis with what, what people need. So, yes, at all those levels, I think. Let's stay with the topic of government culpability. I mean, the city of Boston, like you said, put together a task force to sort of examine what was Boston's role in the transatlantic slave trade and what is the city's role in sort of perpetuating discrimination and oppression of black people. Uh, I've heard multiple folks suggest that Boston doesn't have much culpability because the state of Massachusetts was one of the first to get rid of slavery. And I want to mention here, if nowhere else, there was so much black agency involved in doing that. The state of Massachusetts didn't just say, oh, it's, it's time to end it. Uh, but given that, what sorts of things do you think the city of Boston would examine if Massachusetts was the first state to end slavery, so, what would you say to somebody who says we don't we don't have anything to answer? So, for? so one is um, even if, even if we went to the Quaker Walker cases and the elimination of slavery in Massachusetts, 
even up to that point, we deserve reparations. But let's let's get beyond that, understanding the institution of slavery. You're referencing one of the two cases. One that of the two ended. cases that ended slavery in Massachusetts. So the the other part of that is this. There's a book I love called Slavery's Capitalism. Have you? I don't know if you read that, Tony, but it talks about the fact that northern states who sort of celebrate that they ended slavery sooner right. benefited from the economy of slavery and in their cotton mills and the clothing lines and all this stuff that was really made these northern cities strong cities were built off of the slavery that was happening in the southern uh, parts of this country. So uh, it's a, a crock of whatever you want to call it <laughs> to think that Massachusetts doesn't have a role to play or Boston doesn't have a role to play. Um, again, I go back to where are black people now? And I always say to people, if you walk into a C-suite of all of our companies and you walk in, they're mostly white men. You go to our medical schools, only 5% of the doctors in this country, to my NEMA folks that are here and around the room, 5% of the doctors in this country are black. And it's been that way for a long time. You got to say why. The why is because we've always been denied the access, the opportunity, the wealth. If you understand that, then it could be slavery. It could be the broken promises of, of reconstruction. I said the Homestead Act, the Southern Homestead Act. It could be the, the redlining, the debt peonage of slavery. I mean, you go through all that history in the case. I'm a lawyer. I always tell people, if you let me come into a court and argue the case for reparations, I will win that hands down every time. We're not re really ready as a country to have that conversation, which is why we want to keep studying it, keep talking about it. We should actually already be calculating, not trying to figure out whether we had a role to play in it. Dr. Vanderman. Yeah, we have to talk about racism and white supremacy. Mm. You know, because if we just talk about, well, this, you know, slavery and, you know, after the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment and all that kind of stuff, right? The reality is that uh, black people, even after that point, was not treated equitably, right? You know, you, you talk about busing. Let's talk about busing. You know, like, why, why aren't they treated, you know, fairly with that? Let's talk about housing. Let's talk about employment. Let's talk about how they paid black, uh, our, some of our grandparents, you know, less than they paid other people. Let's calculate all of that, you know, in terms of the loss of those wages and the loss of their, their life in terms of a, a good life and so forth, so that we have to look at reparations in a broader sense, even though we're looking at it in terms of slavery, but it's looking at how we've been treated in this city. So Boston is, was a finance capital, you know, of, of the world. And as, as uh, Mike said, they were benefiting, you know, from what was happening uh, in, within the slave states, even though the people were more liberal around that. But we're talking about e equity. We're talking about a fair distribution of resources, you know, that we can have a decent life. So, you know, the question around, you know, Boston, you know, in this slavery early or whatever, uh, that doesn't deal with the kind of racism because I know folks who try to go to South Boston High School mm -hmm. and politicians that were paying students mm -hmm. to go in things to throw rocks at them you know, we need to account for that. And I want to just give a dollar figure. So at the end of the Civil War, the value of those 4 million slaves was 3.1 to 3.6 billion dollars. We're talking 19th century dollars, right? We're not talking build back better, right? Present day. <laughs> Present day dollars. Think about the value of their, their service, their, their work, their slavery at 3.1 3 to 3.6 billion dollars. We made this country wealthy. I think it's somewhere 70% of what they produced in the South went overseas. So we, we can't have this conversation. I, I would be remiss if I didn't say this about our, our being comfortable with where we are and celebrating sort of the progress. Um, there's a term Dr. Geronimus um, coined called weathering. Weathering, she used the term of fertility. In the 1990s, they thought that black women were having babies and having adverse, adverse outcomes because they were teens. So that's why if we remember the 1990s, there were a lot of ads about teen pregnancy. She did a study and found out that those teen women were actually having well, healthier babies and that as they entered their 20s and 30s and 40s, they were having adverse outcomes for their pregnancies because of racism, because of poverty, because of trauma. Now, the reason I raised that is she coined a phrase in 1990 called weathering, which means that the impacts of all those things have a weathering effect on our bodies. Now, bring it forward. I ask people all the time, what are you weathered to? High rates of poverty in Roxbury, which is where I grew up, Lenny Street Housing Project. Um, not being allowed access to these prestigious institutions, and we're about to even have less access after the Supreme Court case. Violence in your neighborhoods. I always say there's a, there's a social determinant of violence. There's a reason why we kill each other. There's a reason why we pick up guns. And by the way, Irish did it, Italian did it, Russians did it, Bosnians did it. It's not just black people. It's, Social determinants, poverty, 
is, is being denied access, is being taught to hate yourself. All of this we need to unpack, and then we need to move that conversation of reparations forward. Dr. Scott, thinking about Boston and what it could possibly be culpable for. Boston was the first city to declare African uh, slavery as legal. Let's not forget that. We're talking about 1640 here. Uh, there's no way that it can be uh, exempl exempl you know, ex exemplary from, from any of this. There is a port marker now uh, at uh, Long Wharf to indicate that Boston was one of the port cities. There are 54 port cities in this country extending from Boston all the way to Texas across the, the southern belt of, of um, points of entry where captive people were brought in. Uh, it's, it's, it's implicated. It was one, one of the places that sent out the first uh, slave ship when w once the British and the North American colonies got involved in the transatlantic trafficking. Boston was the place that the, the ships came out of. It was the, it was the, the, the last uh, stop on that triangle that left from Liverpool and went to, uh, to West Africa, then into uh, Barbados and the Caribbean, and then to Boston. In fact, this is how we get Phyllis Wheatley, because of the ships that, that came around and left off people in all of these different islands. Once they finished dropping off people at Barbados and other places, they had what they call refuse left on the ship. Mm -hmm. That ship came back to Boston. On that ship was Phyllis Wheatley. Mm -hmm. So Boston is implicated. The, the Puritan fathers were, were investors, uh, in first in the Barbados uh, trade and then in Jamaica and other places. They were involved in, uh, and I'm just gonna say it here, uh, in the, um, the, the wars uh, against the indigenous people those people were trafficked into the Caribbean and exchanged for African captives. Boston was implicated in that. Boston is a great city. Listen, uh, I'm happy. In fact, we have uh, Belinda Sutton who brought her case before the, uh, the Massachusetts General Court and got reparations from uh, Isaac Royale That's right. for being enslaved and a number of other cases that came forward. It is a first, it is a seminal site of, uh, of activism and, and, and abolition, but let us not forget and uh, start patting ourselves on the back. You know, I tell my students, everybody is, is, is implicit. You know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Everybody's guilty, nobody's innocent. You know, and, and the thing to do is for us, you know, to come together and loud and praise those things that have been done well, in which Boston and other cities have done well. But we have to, we cannot forget the, uh, the federal, um, uh, uh, the Boston Federal Reserve's uh, study where you have the um, assets of $8 for, for black families and $247,500 for, for white families. This is Boston. Gaping wealth gap. It is, not, it is not a good sign. If you're just joining us, we're broadcasting from GBH News booth at the 114th NAACP convention in the city of Boston. I'm Soraya Wintersmith for GBH News, the exclusive public media partner for the convention. And we're talking about the future of civil rights and reparations with Michael Curry, president and CEO of the Mass League of Community Health Centers. He's also a member of the National NAACP's Board of Directors. Dr. Anthony Vandermeer, senior lecturer of Africana Studies at UMass Boston, and Dr. Joyce Hope Scott, clinical professor of African American and Black Diaspora Studies at Boston University. Uh, over the last decade, as institutions have started to interrogate their relationship to the slave trade and the oppression of black people, we've seen monuments to Confederate soldiers come down, we've seen school and street sign names change, we've seen other symbols undergo reevaluation. On the topic of cultural change, how important is that work? I mean, it's so important, right? So I, I always say, if you went to Robert E. Lee High School and you're a brother walking around with a jacket on, or you were serving in the military and you went to a, you served on a Robert E. Lee base. Um, or a, as I, I like to point out, the, the ice cream song, the tune that we ran out to mm. um, all the time as kids was nigga want a watermelon, ha ha ha. Right. Nigga want a watermelon, ha ha ha. Right, we're now having this awakening that we've been gaslighted, lied to. And the reality is we need that. You know, one other I was lift up is um, um, J. Marion Sims, the father of gynecology. If you went to any medical school in this country, they would have celebrated J. Marion Sims. But we now know he experimented on Annika, Lucy, and Betsy, three black women without anesthesia. So how do you gain fame and wealth and, and opportunity in this country off the backs of and lives of black people and then not tell the truth? So this tearing down of, of statues and taking down the names was so critical to this country because, again, it's truth catching up to history. So I celebrate that. and I'm. As much as I love gener the generations I come from, 
that were bold and are stepping up. I love the younger people because they will tear down a flag. <laughs> we would have had a meeting to do it. They'll tear it down. Um, they'll walk out of, the, of, a, of a meeting at work because they don't like what you said. I love some of this boldness that's coming out of this generation because that's the only thing, the only way things will change. Some rare praise for younger folks. Dr. Vandermeer, Dr. Scott, how important is that cultural change to the well, reparations it's, it's conversation? It's critical. You know, uh, symbolism is important. Image is important. Mm. Uh, you know, I think that uh, we need more images of people who have resisted oppression so people can see these are the values that we need to perpetuate. You know, I've traveled to Cuba very frequently mm -hmm. and I think many people should. Um, one of the things that I found out was they had a black general, you know, General Antonio Maceo, who fought the independent wars. You go to Santiago de Cuba, they have a huge statue of him in the middle of the land. You visit the cemetery, they have an image of Mary Hannigan Hollis, who is his mother, who is considered the mother of the nation, in the cemetery by a black artist. We need to begin to put up images and statues to reflect the people locally and nationally who stood up for our human rights. It's, it's critical. Dr. Scott, I want to ask you a particular question because I know you are a true black diaspora scholar working across continents. You're very connected with this idea of rematriation, this concept of reclaiming ancestral remains and spirituality and culture. I think one thing that people don't often realize about the lingering impacts of slavery is that the splitting up of people from points of no return on the continent led to us having almost black cultural factions, black West Africans, black Caribbeans, black Americans, black Latinos. The rift, I think, most often spikes when we're talking about reparations eligibility and who should get benefits, but I wonder, do you think that the government has any role to play in sort of healing the divide among ethnic groups within the African diaspora? I'm being funny, because in my heart, I'm Pan-African, I'm rooting for everybody black, but ethnic groups within the diaspora. Yes. Um, well, good question. <laughs> it is a good question. Yes, I'm, I'm very uh, pleased that you brought up the issue of rematriation because it is decidedly different from repatriation. We're not talking about the same thing. Um, and as a result of the sort of willy-nilly um, capturing and, um, comp and, and um, enslavement of people across the African continent for, in terms of the transatlantic branch, 500 years, uh, all sorts of people were thrown together from different groups who, in fact, um, were made might have had some issues with each other from the beginning, but we we went through a, a a kind of what I would call leveling experience with the brutality of the transatlantic uh, trafficking uh, and the Middle Passage, and the uh, the experiences on the various uh, plantations that people lived on. There was no better um, uh, experience in Jamaica than there was in, in Georgia or anything of that nature. I think that what what we have been taught to uh, believe is that there was a big difference between those experiences and somehow some people had some kind of advantage over others. Uh, when I talk, when we talk about rematriation, we're, we're talking about something that happened that violated a fundamental um, connection that all Africans had among themselves regardless of their, their group. For example, I've been reading recently uh, something that had not occurred to me but should have, that people who were trapped in the hole of the ships were certainly suffering and they were concerned about their own physical, uh, bru the physical brutality against them and those around them. But what they also suffered and what pained them was not being able to bury the ones that were thrown overboard, the ones that died and were summarily just dispatched Dumped. as though they didn't mean anything. This kind of thing, fundamentally in Africa, even if it were an enemy, you had to give proper ritual and proper um, ceremony for the, the burial of those people. What we have in common, those of us who think we have so much difference, is the Atlantic. We have 50 million ancestors, bones in the Atlantic. We all have that in common. Whether we're in Jamaica, whether we're in Suriname, whether we're in Boston, or whatever, no matter if what kind of mixing we've all gone through, it doesn't matter. What about those ancestors? Shall we not, in fact, do some rematriative kinds of activities where we recognize, revalor we get into the business of revalorizing, you know, culture, revalorizing 
the epistemological framework that they came from, which allowed them to see the importance of their ancestors and the importance of, of, of being humane to each other, even in, in captivity, where they were with each other. They were, they, there was a way that they had to behave toward each other. So I think um, some of the, uh, the, the quarrel is, uh, a lot of the quarrel is, is, is orchestrated. That's right. You know, I, I would say that essentially. There is no, uh, there's no uh, hatred among, there's no historical reason for there to be hatred among us. I mean, people uh, in, the, the, in the North American diaspora have always supported uh, the, the struggles in Jamaica and the struggles in Haiti, the struggles in Grenada, and every other place where there, where there were people. So I think that um, what, what happens is, especially after the, the civil rights movement, and people were able to move more freely back and forth across the Atlantic, uh, there's some kind of, of, of ethos of, of, um, of disrespect or uh, of a confusion about uh, how we're in conflict or in, in some sort of a hatred among each other. It's all orchestrated. Uh, young people need to get over it because that's essentially where it is. And their parents need to stop perpetuating these falsehoods of how they're, they're worse or better or whatever. All of us are walking wounded orphans. We're all wounded orphans. Mm -hmm. We've all lost our mother. A very good colleague of mine in Benin said to me one time, listen my sister, let me ask you a question. Suppose I tell you that there was a woman who was on her way to market uh, and she left three children at home while she's going to sell her tomatoes or sell her or her uh, pineapples or whatever. And she was captured on the way there and taken to um, Mississippi, whatever, ultimately, where she was forced to have five other children. Whose mother is she? Whose mother is she? Hmm. And are we gonna fight over whose mother she is or understand that we both lost our mothers? So uh, we are in a process of healing. Rematriation means healing. It means spiritual um, recognition of the spiritual harm, the cultural, the historical harm, the business of losing names, of, of having people renamed. They were Fon, they were uh, Tuareg, they were Ashanti, they were whatever they were. And they never were allowed to be that again. That's important. What does it mean that I'm never allowed to be uh, Bamileke again? Mm. You know? Dr. Vandermeer, Michael Curry, does the government have a role to play in fixing the rift among us? Well, I would say they do have a, a, a role to play uh, in terms of the type of policies uh, they are making. Um, in fact, you know, the roles they play in creating divisions, you know, I mean, we talk about, you know, uh, COINTELPRO, you know, when you had activists who are going around trying to change society and what they're doing, spying on them, assassinating them, locking them up, and so forth. But uh, Dr. About the uh, FBI's counterintelligence intelligence program. program, yes, yes. You know, but Dr. Scott's point um, is that we have to really look at the spiritual damage, the psychic damage that's done to black people when you aren't able to connect to, you know, uh, a certain generations of your family. You know, some of us just go back to, to my grandmother. Well, who exists after that? I don't know. Right, you know, so that type of harm, that type of, uh, of damage. So, but I think that uh, we have to be internationalists, uh, truly, in terms of how black people all around the world are being treated. And so, uh, for me, I don't care, you know, if you're here, uh, you know, the question is, how did you get here? You know, and, and, and wherever you were, what role did colonialism play in, in that demise, in terms of your destruction? So we have to address that because we say, well, why are people coming here? Well, how are they treated treat uh, where they are? You know, my father, you know, was from Suriname. He came over here on a ship. My father was deported when I was five years old, mm. right? And so the question is that when you talk about how do you separate, you know, a father who is responsible with that family back to Suriname, they, they had Operation Wetback to get my father out of a restaurant he was working with to send him back to Suriname, mm. right? So the question is, is that that process I'm still healing from in terms of that damage. There are many other examples. You know, we look at the immigration policies, you know, that exist. And it's just not in South America. These are African people, Asian people, people in Cuba. These are African people, mm -hmm. right? So we have to not just, you know, worry about ourselves. We have to worry about the, the whole humanity. Because when we talk about humanity, where do we go? Where do we start? 
we go right back to Africa. What do they look like? And if we don't deal with that fact, we're not dealing with reality. Michael Curry. Yeah, so I want to start, I'm going to give a shout out to the Providence NAACP that's here. Uh, uh, Providence came pretty deep to this convention, so I want to shout them out. You know, I, it's interesting. We talk about the division of our people and, and how intentional that is and was. Um, I always think about a story. Um, la around the last time the convention was here in Boston, we were dealing with a housing suit that the NAACP was bringing against the city of Boston for steering black folks away from white housing developments, Old Colony, Charlestown, name it. Um, they were dividing the city. Now, what I love about this story is that, uh, and as a former senator who tells the story that when they came in to meet with the mayor, um, Doris Bunty was the head of Boston Housing Authority at the time, so she's a black woman, first woman uh, elected to the state legislature. They came in to meet with her and the mayor, so she probably had to drag the mayor into the meeting. And um, former Louis Elisa, the senator, sit there and they present the arguments to them about how this was discrimination and why they're bringing a legal case. The story goes that the mayor listened to the story, turned his chair, he didn't pay attention to them, until, he, until it was over, and he turned his chair and he said, you get your black people, I'll get my black people, and we'll see who wins. Oh. This has always been the strategy, right, is to divide us so that we don't keep our eyes on the prize, so that we're not aligned and together on um, what the objective is. It's a strategy that will always be there, but you know, I almost say government's role in that, I'd like them to stop doing that, but we gotta stop letting them do that. Mm -hmm. So that means we gotta be in conversation. I don't have to like you, but I can still work with you and figure out what's in your best interest and mine. I, I just think Boston is a great microcosm of black diaspora. The Caribbean community here is strong. Very. We have a large Cape Verdean population mm -hmm. here. Um, my mother came here for the warmth of other sons, right? Isabel Wilkerson's book. Mm -hmm. She came here from Alabama. How do we now bring all that family together and say, you know what? You're dealing with the stop, stops and frisk too, right? <laughs> Let me bring you together that um, your children aren't able to get that C-suite role either. How do we now make that case so that we all can come together? I don't think that's about government. I think that's about us. I'm glad you're mentioning the Rhode Island chapter of the NAACP or branch, not chapter. Uh, I want to start this question with you. What role should legacy civil rights organizations be playing now that we have so much momentum around reparations? Well, one is we've had a series of reparations uh, resolutions. I chair the board's advocate policy committee. That means that a lot of the policy that comes to this organization comes to my committee. Uh, I have phenomenal leaders around that table who lead housing, education, health care, environmental justice, and so many other areas. We take up these policy issues. So we've had a, a long history of reparations bills. So I think our goal is to still raise the consciousness of our communities. Our branches are supposed to go back with those resolutions, those whereas clauses, those therefore be it resolved clauses, <laughs> and then operationalize them in the ground and in cities and towns. We should be modeling what Evanston did. We should be looking at what other cities have done to take reparations seriously. And then I think the role of legacy civil rights organizations is we should be putting pressure. Now, we're nonpartisan, but I say this, when black folks show up, we'll, they'll vote the way we need them to vote. Mm -hmm. So we gotta turn them out so that they can vote for these policies. Sheila Jackson Lee's uh, bill that she inherited um, is one that we should be talking about more, making the case for more. You're talking about HR 40. HR 40, and then we should be looking at local versions of that. So I think the NAACP is in that mix. Uh, Urban League, I'm sure, is in that mix. NAN is in that mix. There's a lot of us. We need to now start to do that together. Dr. Scott, Dr. Vandermeer, don't indict the NAACP, but <laughs> what, what should our legacy organizations be doing? Well, I, I uh, applaud what the NAACP has done over the years. Uh, their focus uh, has been spot on because they've gone at it from the legal perspective. Uh, it was laws and the orchestration of laws, um, positivist laws that put uh, people into certain categories and, and, and racialized uh, opportunities, et cetera, and the NACP rightly went right after that uh, and, and exploded those, uh, those unfair um, blocks against black advancement, and they should continue to do that. The, the NACP, uh, CORE, and all of these legacy organizations uh, have been responsible for a lot of changes that have taken place and they should continue that. Uh, I think uh, also that, and I, I, this is from my perspective, that, sure. as I've said earlier already, uh, uh, reparations, restorative justice, restitution, this is, an, this is a global issue. 
It is not something that only Boston is dealing with. It's not something that just the United States is dealing with. There is a mass movement around the globe around restorative justice, around civil and human rights and so on. And we in this country are not apart from it. So organizations, our legacy organizations, have always worked in a pan-Africanist perspective. They can lead us in this because they already have the, the, the groundwork. They know how to do that. They know how to build the bridges. Uh, they built the bridges. And, and we, that, this current movements and other kinds of issues should be able to move across uh, the national lines in terms of what we want resolved, as well as international, based on the good work that they've done. So they should continue with what they're doing. Uh, just do it more, and do it more effectively. And most importantly, reach out to the young. The Dr. Vandermeer, if you're a regular person not affiliated with any legacy institution, what should you be doing to kind of seize this momentum around reparations? Well, we have to build a broader united front. Um, you know, I think that we have to work with uh, other local organizations on the ground, create those relationships, uh, because we, you know, it's, this is not one entity that can really create the conditions that we need in order to move forward so that we have to go a lot deeper, and particularly those who are most disenfranchised, to help build organization and networks. So we have to go a lot deeper than we've been going, um, because when you look at the fact that the Supreme Court decision, you know, around affirmative action, you know, it shows some you know, weaknesses on our part in terms of us leaning and, and pushing, you know, going back to Barack Obama, you know, and looking at, uh, you know, how is it that we lost the ability to, to uh, uh, get uh, a Supreme Court justice is elected. So we got to go deeper, uh, you know, and You're so we got to- the stalling of Merrick Garland as a nominee to the Supreme Court. Right, right. So we have to, you know, we have to go much, much uh, deeper. I think we got to push the envelope a little further and press the button a little deeper. And now this last question for all of you, intergenerational, collabora intergenerational collaboration, I think is crucial to moving any work forward. I always like to know what seasoned folks think younger folks should be doing to help advance the work. What advice are you giving to younger people? So I want to lift up while we're here in Boston for the National NAACP Convention. Um, 2017, I went to the National NAACP with the DC president, Akoshua Ali, who's here, the, the uh, Dallas president at that time, Aubrey Hooper, who's here. And we said, we need to, to train the next generation of civil rights leaders. Um, at that time, Cornell Brooks, who was the CEO, the board agreed. We now have trained 400 21 to 45 year olds, some of what they would get in Tony's or, or the professor's class, where they basically had a year to learn about our history, about the issues around reparations, around how to mobilize people, um, all these technical, how to deal with the media, and they've graduated from this course. So I think that the movement, I mean, I'd love to have us trip into the next John Lewis or the next Dr. King or Diane Nash or name the other civil rights activists. We can't afford to do that. We got to train them to do that. We got to prepare them to do that. NAACP deserves credit. You'll see them walking around with next gen on their shirt throughout the weekend. These are some bad brothers and sisters. They're running for elected office. They're going back and taking over branches and becoming branch presidents and secretaries and treasurers. That's the real work of the NAACP, that intergenerational work. Um, I am proud of the fact that these people will be the next CEOs of our, of our organization, the next board members who take my place as well. Dr. Vandermeer, 30 seconds. What should young people be doing? Well, they should be studying and they should be engaged in activism. You know, they're the ones, I mean, in fact, when you look at Black Lives Matter, you know, the uprising of young people, you know, is, they have to continue that, but they have to develop deep organizations, develop relationship with other organizations, older organizations, some of the elders, so they don't won't, won't make the same mistakes that we made, but they have to press the envelope and they have to keep their values before them because what this system does is it will co-op you. And so we got to be able to create a basis for us to stay on the one. Dr. Scott, lady's last yes, word. I'd like to sort of ditto what my brother just said. Uh, we have to, in fact, uh, work with young people, teach them about the strategies of activism that have worked in the past and, and to put that in perspective with what they're trying to do today. They, I work with young people every day. I have a great deal of faith in them and their ability. They are, they are charged, ready to go somewhere, but they, need, they still need the guidance. I, I think that we, uh, this generation, maybe we've stepped back too, too far, too fast. We need to step up again. Uh, invite them in and give them some um, 
some scripts, in other words, some possibilities. Here is what worked, where are you, here is what we did that worked, and maybe you see some other things that might work better. But um, there is no divide, there should be no divide, uh, no complete break between those former activists and young people. It should be a continual link. This is what allowed us to progress to where we are today. Uh, there was never a separation between um, the, the, the young and the, old, and the older people when we were in captivity, and it shouldn't be now, especially because young people have so much to offer. They're so uh, well-versed in the technology and the other ideas. They have such brilliant ideas, uh, and they would look forward, in many instances, I believe, to organizations like the NAACP, like professors and others, uh, media people who can show them this is the way you might want to think about uh, programming your life. So we have some, some sort of unified uh, work to do with them because they are, they are absolutely the future. We'll have to leave it there with an intergenerational call for work. Michael Curry, Dr. Vandermeer, Dr. Scott, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Saraya Wintersmith for GBH News. Thank you. Thank you. Are we good?